Can you hear me? Wow, <laughs> very well. Uh, so uh, thank you again for everyone being here today. Uh, maybe before continuing, just to say once again that uh, this workshop is being recorded. So if somebody is not happy with that, they should tell us and then you will be removed uh, after the recording from the recording. So you're not online somewhere. <laughs> Uh, okay, so this is uh, the arduous workshop, the now eighth international workshop on annotation of user data for ubiquity systems. And this year we are at Informatic, a German conference in difference to the past years. And um, see, the organizers are me, Christina Jordanova from the University of Greifswald. Emma Tonkin from the University of Bristol, with whom we have organized the workshop many years now. Then we have uh, Greg from the University of Oxford. Theo is here, Theo Dostoev. He's uh, one of the organizers also for some years now. And we have Dipendra at the back, who is also from the University of Greifswald. And we also have Fernando Moya, from Motion Miners and Niva Nair from the Technical University of Dortmund, who are today not here, but they have been supporting us with the uh, preparation of the workshop. Yeah, so as I said, this is uh, the eighth edition of the Arduous workshop. Uh, we are dealing with the problems associated with data annotation. And uh, as we all know, we need data annotation, annotations and annotated data so that we can do uh, machine learning stuff or validate our system. So it's actually a very important topic, although it's not exactly some say very technical or artificial intelligence topic. So we have organized uh, so that's wrong, it's not eight arduous workshops, seven arduous workshops we have organized at PERCOM. Uh, this is the uh, Pervasive Computing and Communications uh, Conference. And last year we decided, I mean, we have been thinking about this for several years now, that um, our topic is more broader than the topics of the PERCOM conference, so we need a new venue. So this year we tried as a, intermediate solution, so to say, to go to the informatic and see uh, where we go from here. So this is somehow end of one era and uh, trying to see where we are going uh, in the future, if it is going to stay a workshop in the form that it is now, or if it's going to be a working group in some form. And we can discuss this uh, today at the end of the workshop. So usually um, during the years, we had always like between six and eight papers and between 15 to 25 participants. I hope we get more people today here in the room. And this year we have seven accepted papers. Uh, we have some spin-offs. We have uh, technical reports. One is online and the other one should be coming this year. And we have uh, organized two special issues, sorry. Alex is getting heavy. Um, we have organized two special issues and we also have quite a lot of papers on the topic. So um, as I said, it's not only a workshop series, but it's also an event with different spin-offs. And uh, how does the program look today? So we were supposed to start at nine. So we are starting 20 minutes later. Uh, but I think it's fine. At uh, 9.30, we will have uh, the first keynote, that's Zosia uh, Beckles, and she will tell us about sharing sensitive data for machine learning. Uh, Zosia comes from the university library at the University of Bristol, so she has quite a lot of experience with publishing of data, and we are looking forward to her experience. Uh, then we have the first paper session where we have uh, five papers with very short presentations. Alex, and then at 11, we have the coffee break for half an hour. 
And after that, at 11.30, comes the first panel session. It's about data management and preservation in applied machine learning systems. And the panelists are Zosia, Greg, and Emma, and Dagmar Walteman, who is a professor of uh, medical informatics from the University of Medicine of Greifswald. She will join us online. Uh, from 12.30 to 14, we have the lunch break. And after that, we have a short paper session with only two papers. And after that comes the second panel discussion, and it's about research data management from the AI perspective. Um, in this one, I will be one of the panelists, uh, Christopher Reining from the uh, Technical University of Dortmund, Max Schroeder from the Library of the University of Rostock, and uh, Frank Kruger, uh, who is a professor at the uh, University of Applied Sciences in Wismar. And we have then another coffee break at 15.30. Uh, um, and the next keynote start at uh, 4 p.m. I think the um, coffee break is planned for until 16.30, but we will start a bit earlier. So we have only half an hour coffee break uh, because our keynote speaker needs to start a bit earlier. So our second keynote is uh, Patrick Brunner, and he will be talking about navigating the EO AI Act. And after that, we have a, a small summary and closing words. And basically, that will be the workshop for the day. This is also the end of my introduction. And I would like to uh, welcome Zosia. Thank you. That sound OK? Fantastic. Right. Okay, then uh, I will get started. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I'm really excited about being here because, uh, as, as I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about my background, but you know, we I support a small uh, data repository. Uh, but what, and I think we've been really struggling with this idea of how to make our data more available for for AI and machine learning purposes. So finding out from people who are actually working with the data what would be most useful for them is going to be really, really uh, crucial to, to making sure that our repository is really meeting the needs of our users. So yes, very excited to be here. Thank you. Um, okay, so... Um, that's that. There we go. Uh, yeah, so a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, first of all, I'll kind of give an overview of uh, the sensitive data management model that we have at Bristol. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about a recent project that we did to try and map AI uh, research across the university um, and sort of see where our researchers were working, where they think they'll be working in the future and what's, um, uh, what use is being made of our data sets um, for that purpose. Um, then I'll talk about some of the barriers um, that I see as being kind of the the critical issues in uh, sharing of sensitive data for these purposes, and then some potential solutions that we're exploring. Okay. Uh, so first of all, a little bit of background about me and the research data service. Um, so uh, I'm a research information analyst at the University of Bristol, um, based in the research data service, which is part of um, library research support. Um, uh, and before that, I worked in uh, health informatics um, uh, support uh, for clinical guideline development for, for NICE. Um, that's the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. I know the acronym doesn't work. It's the NHS. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I've had quite a bit of experience in dealing with sensitive data in various contexts, um, usually around kind of health related research. Um, and the work that I do now, um, sorry, bear with me one minute. There we go. Um, covers. Yeah, so the work that I do now covers um, uh, sort of sensitive data across all parts of the research data lifecycle, um, but kind of most uh, the areas where I get most involved are firstly in the kind of planning, uh, the kind of grant application stage, um, so development of data management plans, um, uh, developing consent forms and information sheets that will support data sharing later on down the line. 
um, uh, and you know, ensuring that our researchers are in compliance with the uh, legal and regulatory and university policy kind of requirements around that. And then the other place where I get most involved is at the end of the, the project when it comes to the data publication stage. So providing support uh, and guidance around um, data preparation, curation, anonymization, um, and publishing through the data.bris um, research data repository. Um, uh, and then also helping to support subsequent releases of data sets that have been published. So uh, a little bit of information about the kind of service and the, and the data repository. We launched um, as a kind of general support service for researchers in 2014. Yeah, that was before I was there, but, uh, but that, that was when, it, when, we, when we launched. And in 2015, um, we uh, uh, launched the research data repository itself, so data.bris, initially just to share open data sets. But then in 2017, um, we provided an option for publication of sensitive data. Um, and that was set up following the um, expert advisory group on data access guidance. Um, that's a welcome report, which I've, um, I've linked to at the end, if you're interested. Um, but it kind of basically sets out sort of principles for how to, uh, how to set up sensitive data sharing processes. Um, and then in 2019, we expanded on that again um, by the launch of a dataset disclosure assessment service, uh, risk assessment service. And this is really my baby. Um, uh, and the idea here is that rather than putting all of the responsibility on the academics to make sure that the data is uh, is suitable for, for sharing at whatever access level they request, um, I provide some additional support to help risk assess that data set, think about the data environment, how it's going to be used, who's going to use it, what they're going to use it for, and you know work with the academics to, to create, to set their access level and um, if necessary, make changes to the data set itself um, uh, so that it's it's suitable for sharing. Um, so what I'll do now is give you a bit of an overview of how that kind of data publication and data sharing process works. Um, and I'm going to look at it from the perspective of the five safes framework. Um, you may be aware of this already. Um, it's usually used um, to think about data sharing via trusted research environments, um, so secure labs, data enclaves, that kind of thing. But I think it's a really useful framework to think about um, sensitive data management in any context. Um, so the idea here is that um, there are kind of five domains that you uh, can think about risk in and five and these five domains uh, give you ways to mitigate that risk. So uh, first of all, safe data. So the idea here is making uh, sure that the risk inherent in the data itself is uh, as low as possible. So uh, issues here, you might think about data minimization, anonymization, that kind of thing. Uh, safe projects. Um, so the idea here is that the uh, benefit of the project um, outweighs the risk of working with that data to the, the research data participants. So there's, you know, the, the value of the project and its kind of um, impact on society is greater than the, the, than the risk. Um, safe people. So this is about making sure that the researchers who are working with that sensitive data um, are properly trained and accredited if necessary, but, you know, they have the experience and the knowledge to deal with that data safely and securely. Uh, safe settings. So in the context of a TRE, that would be, you know, making sure that the data is being used in that kind of um, secure environment. But more generally, it would just be making sure that wherever the data is released to um, uh, has appropriate, you know, information security standards and so on, so that we can be sure that people are going to use that data in a in a way that's uh, uh, store it, store it, use it, analyze it in a way that's, that's appropriate to the level of the the sensitivity of the data. And then lastly, safe outputs. So the idea here being that not just the uh, process, the raw data and the process of analysing it, but also the outputs are checked to ensure that they're not disclosive and aren't revealing information about the, the data subjects. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is uh, give you a quick overview of the processes that we use to try and meet those, um, those, those five, sort, uh, five areas. So first of all, our uh, data publication workflow. So this is kind of a really kind of top level uh, view of exactly what happens when a uh, researcher comes to us with a data set they want to, to deposit. And the idea here is that it's, a, it's an iterative process um, where we work with the researcher to bring the data set up to our um, admittedly quite light touch uh, standards um, in terms of kind of metadata and things like that. Um, but if they have, uh, if the data set has uh, information on identifiable human beings, um, then it comes to me for these sorts of additional, more in-depth checks. And more about that in a minute. Uh, yeah, so 
if the uh, so as I said, if the data set has information on identifiable uh, human beings, then as well as these sort of generic quality assurance checks, I also do uh, these more in-depth checks looking for things like uh, looking at the consent form, looking at the information sheet, seeing if what the participants agreed to matches with the uh, uh, access level that the um, uh, researcher has selected, um, match and making sure that the terms of the consent match the data set and match the access level. Um, uh, for some data sets, I will then also look at the actual data itself. So uh, look at key variables, look at the data environment to see if that affects the risk level. So this would be things like looking uh, to see if, for example, a protocol has been published um, and if there's additional information in the protocol that when added to the information in the data set provides more information on the, uh, on the, on the participants and the context that um, that data was collected in. Um, looking for, you know, if there's other linked data sets or data sets that could be linked, um, that kind of thing. Um, I may also do checks for direct identifiers. So, you know, scanning through the transcripts or um, looking at uh, free text fields of if it's survey data to check for disclosive information there. And for quantitative data sets, um, I also do some uh, an assessment of disclosure risk, uh, looking at Look at via various statistical measures, so looking at the K anonymity, um, looking at pseudo scores, and seeing how they change depending on uh, what anonymization techniques are applied to the data set, and how that um, changes both the utility of the data set and its 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 privacy. But again, all of this is done in collaboration with the researcher in conversation, um, so that the we can come to an agreement about the level of information that is appropriate to be in the data set and the level of access um, so that it's both a useful data set for, for research purposes, but also isn't disclosing more information than it needs to. So that was uh, the process of preparing a data set for publication. When it comes to uh, releasing a, a data set that's been published, we have, apart from open data sets, we have uh, two levels of access for restricted data sets. So this is uh, restricted or controlled. Um, restricted data sets are those that are, they can't be open, but they're otherwise, otherwise quite low risk. Um, uh, controlled data sets are ones that are considered high risk. So anything with special category data would probably go in there. Um, any sort of older legacy data sets where the consent was maybe a bit ambiguous, but we feel that the value of the data set to um, future research is such that it's worth making it available under certain conditions. Um, or data sets with very specific restrictions on reuse that um, where applications need to be reviewed by a, by a committee uh, would go into this category as well. Um, and all requests, um, all requesters have to provide certain uh, evidence uh, to kind of validate who they are and why they want the why they want the data. Um, so this we require them to show evidence of institutional affiliation. So we don't re release data to private individuals. Um, they have to uh, provide a suitable institutional signatory. So that's somebody who can uh, sign on behalf of their institution, their university. Um, they uh, will need, kind of most crucially, to provide appropriate um, uh, institutional information security policies so that we can be sure that when we release the data to them, they've got the infrastructure to keep it sa um, safely and securely. And if required, we may also ask for evidence of ethical approval and funding or sponsorship. The last point is, again, about kind of uh, checking whether or not the, the proposed research has undergone any kind of uh, external scrutiny. Um, and again, that kind of goes to that safe projects element. Um, we also get the data steward. So that's the uh, researcher that originally collected the data set to um, carry out uh, an assessment of the proposed research use. Um, so the proposed data use. So kind of give a really answer the question is, is this question that the, re that the request is posing, can it be answered by the data set? Um, and again, that kind of goes towards that, that safe project element. Um, and then finally, um, for controlled uh, uh, data sets, all of that information is then reviewed by our university's data access committee. So this is a uh, group of, uh, which includes senior academics, um, people from IT services, research governance, uh, information governance, data protection, uh, research contracts, um, and the obviously repository staff as well. And the idea here is that the committee has kind of wide range of experience um, and can take 
both is intended to take into account the data subjects rights and wishes and also the kind of institutional risk that the university is bearing by releasing this data although certainly when it comes to the data subject rights I'm not sure that we've got it quite right um, and so I think there is definitely some work to be done on that front um, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on so uh, the last thing in this section that I want to talk about is um, our data access agreement so this is the bit that kind of goes towards the safe outputs um, and I think is uh, in a way it might be you could consider it like the, the weakest element of, um, uh, of the process because we we are trying to put guardrails on what people can do with the data downstream um, via a contract but obviously that kind of in a way depends on goodwill you know if somebody really wanted to disregard um, what they'd signed they could um, and we might not know about it um, but you know this is our kind of best faith attempt to 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 put controls on that and this contract, this data access agreement, includes restrictions on things like re-identification of participants, um, uh, restrictions on commercial use. Uh, it uh, has uh, conditions on ownership of IP and any derived data. Um, and it also requires that if uh, if we ask for it, the data uh, requesters provide evidence that they've deleted um, the data set at the end of the project. Uh, although full disclosure, we haven't actually ever asked for that yet. <laughs> But maybe one day. Uh, right, so just to kind of wrap that up and again situate it within the five safes framework, um, we've got the, the the risk assessment service at the point of, of publication, which kind of goes towards that data. Um, uh, and then the validation checks, the data access committee, the getting input from the data stewards and the data access agreement uh, all go uh, towards trying to kind of meet those other four criteria around safe projects, safe people, safe settings and, and uh, safe outputs. So kind of why bother with all of this? Well, the idea here is that we're trying to maximize the benefits of data sharing whilst minimizing the risks to uh, try and ensure that the rights of data subjects follow their data, wherever that may be. Um, so hopefully that's given you some insight into the model that we use here at Bristol. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is talk about a small piece of work that we did uh, looking at where AI research is located across the university and how people are discovering it and discovering the data sets associated with it. Cool. So. Um, this was a joint project between researchers in health sciences, um, the Gene Golding Institute for Data Intensive Research, and uh, our team, the Research Data Service. Um, we got some uh, funding from Research England, that's the Enhancing Research Cult Culture funding pot, um, to do some work uh, to map AI research, um, to find out where people were currently working, where they thought they might work in future, and what they needed, to, what they thought was needed to support that work. Um, uh, what we hoped to get out of this was an AI registry to um, kind of capture AI projects and data sets um, to help kind of publicize the work and encourage collaboration. Um, it was, this was kind of the real, <clears throat> sorry, this was the real uh, selling point for the project from our perspective, because we had hoped that it would be a way to enrich the data sets in data.bris. Unfortunately, we couldn't get funding for that part, so <laughs> we just had a survey and some uh, uh, and some other in, uh, exploratory work. Um, but yeah, maybe next year. <laughs> uh, so I'll just give you a kind of quick overview of of, of what we found. Um, we got most most of our responses were from staff in academic roles, but we did get a um, a fair number of um, technical and professional services staff as well, um, and it was across all faculties. Um, uh, we did see more interest in uh, uh, more work in AI reported in health sciences, which I think is actually more a reflection of the fact that the lead project lead is based in health sciences and was therefore able to prod uh, <laughs> colleagues into responding uh, more than the fact that that's actually where the majority of AI work uh, is occurring. Uh, and the reason we think this is because uh, we compared it with uh, some publications data. So yeah, I don't think that's quite accurate, but um, uh, it did give us some uh, information on what people saw as the kind of the key topics um, now and and in the future. Um, and yeah, so you can see that the uh, there's a lot of work currently going on in engineering and health sciences, uh, but there, there is evidence that 
uh, people across all six faculties in Bristol. So that's uh, arts, engineering, health sciences, life sciences, uh, science uh, and social sciences and law. So all faculties have some work going on in that area. And health sciences thought that uh, it looked like health sciences would be doing a lot more in that in the future. Uh, and yeah, and in terms of what people saw as the kind of growth areas, um, the use of machine learning methods um, uh, in other research contexts uh, was kind of like the biggest growth area. So all of our academics basically thought that they were going to be increasingly using AI and machine learning methods um, in the future as part of their research methodology, even if they weren't using it now. Um, which yeah, make, uh, really drives home the point we, as the repository, need to do something about how we make data available for that purpose, because I, as you'll see, I don't think we're, we're getting it right at the moment. So, um, as I said, the other thing that we looked at was how the projects, the research outputs, the research data um, is exposed to both an internal and an external audience. So, for this, we looked at um, the data that we could find in our CRIS, so current research information system, which is pure, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, and we also looked at publications in, uh, in SciVal, which uses data from Scopus. And then finally looked at uh, data requests coming into uh, data.bris, the, the data repository. Um, the outcome of this was kind of disappointing. <laughs> um, we found 146 uh, AI-related projects in, in the CRIS and only seven related publications, which is not to say there's only seven related pu seven publications on AI in our Chris, but only seven of them um, people have bothered to go in and connect to projects. Um, I'm sure that if we looked at a different reporting system, so research, research fish or something like that, we would find something different um, because I think from the funder's perspective, they definitely need to know that something's been published um, that is linked to this this funding pot whereas for our internal systems I don't think that's that's uh, that's less critical but it does mean that if a researcher is trying to find out about AI projects they're not going to get a good and accurate picture of that by using our supposedly all-encompassing uh, research information system um, and to contrast with that um, I looked at publications in SciVal um, and found like about 900 publications from University of Bristol researchers related to AI. Uh, I could only directly match about 300 to publications in our CRIS. Um, part, I think partly that is because of the way that SciVal identifies uh, UOB publications. So uh, in some cases, uh, where there are kind of cross-institutional entities like the Bristol Robot Robotics Laboratory, that may be assigned as a University of Bristol publication, but in actual fact, the author is from the University of the, West of, the West of England, for example. So I think there is, the SciVal data is inaccurate, but also I think it's may mainly be an issue that we were matching on DOI and a lot of publication in this area are from conference pr proceedings, which don't have DOIs, so that, that could be it as well. But it does show that there is a lot more out there than our Chris is currently capturing. So yeah, what this tells us is, number one, we've got a serious relational data issue in our Chris system, um, uh, which could definitely do with, with some work. But number two, there is a much wider spread of uh, researchers across disciplines who say they're working in AI than is actually reflected in our Chris or in the publications data. Um, that could just be a publication lag, so people who are currently working in it haven't got around to publishing yet. Um, but it could also be a kind of indexing um, reporting issue. So the methodology part of papers is often not well indexed in, in bibliographic databases. So if we're looking for things that are relating to AI, it may miss papers where AI is the methodology, but you know, not the kind of otherwise not the focus, if you like. Um, Okay, so that was looking at uh, the publications as outputs. The next thing we wanted to do was look at how people are using our data sets. So we've got a, about 100, uh, sorry, about 1,200 published data sets, the vast majority of which are open. Uh, and unfortunately, we can't re reliably track uses of those. We do um, look for data citations relating to all of our data sets, but obviously that lags well, well behind use. Um, we, and we also look at kind of downloads, but it's quite difficult to distinguish bots from actual research uses. And also sometimes the bots are the research use. So yeah. Uh, 
so instead, what, what we decided to do was look at um, requests for our restricted and controlled data sets. So from 2017, when we started publishing uh, restricted access data, we have had 124 requests in total for 32 unique data sets. Um, as you might expect, there's kind of a couple of frequent flyer data sets and then all the rest of like, I think about 15 of those have only been requested once. Um, but that is just requests, not kind of completed uh, releases. If we're looking just at requests that have gone through the whole process to a decision to release or to reject, um, that brings the number down to 72 requests for 20 unique data sets, of which 48 are released or about to be, um, and 24 have been rejected. And I did a piece of uh, hugely scientific work uh, where I eyeballed the reasons that, that people put for you know, what they plan to do with the data in their request and made a kind of on the spot decision as to whether or not that was AI related or not. Um, uh, looking for, you know, wording like they were going to use it to train models or that kind of thing. Um, and uh, on that basis, uh, I found that we had we'd had about 13 requests for data for AI purposes. And we rejected 54% of those, so uh, uh, seven rejections out of 13. Whereas uh, of requests not for AI purposes, um, we released 42 and rejected three, so a rejection rate of about 7%. Uh, where the request was purpose was unclear, all, they all got rejected, um, and that is because if there's not enough information for us to work out what you want to do with the data set, it's going to get rejected. And if there's not enough information to work out that, then it probably means that the request is missing other details as well. So it might not just be because of that that it was rejected. But yeah, which yeah suggests that there is something going on with requests for AI purposes that we're not. They're not. Yeah, there's something going on there. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, talk a bit more about exactly what that might be and what we could do to kind of fix that and, and improve that, that rejection rate a bit later on. So uh, kind of putting it all together, uh, basically there's, it looks like there's a much wider spread of people working in AI and machine learning um, than uh, is suggested by our CRIS system and by the literature. Um, it's definitely increasingly going to be used as a research methodology in the future, so presumably by people who are not kind of grounded in it as a discipline. Um, uh, some other areas that people thought would be kind of key areas for the future are the kind of social and pedagogic impact of AI and ethics of AI. Um, uh, but yeah, as I said, it's not well reflected in our CRIS system, so it's really going to be quite hard for researchers to find out who else is working in the area. Um, and you know, if they don't have that kind of direct peer contact, how are they going to know what's going on, basically? And the other key takeaway was that it's really hard to access sensitive data for machine learning purposes. Thus, this workshop. <laughs> um, right. So, um, actually, I've completely lost track of timing. Hopefully, I'm not overrun. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, so, the uh, sort of third section of what I'm going to talk about is what I see as the kind of main barriers to sharing data, making use of data for AI and machine learning. And I've kind of broken that down into sort of four key areas. So, issues around consent. Um, issues around disclosure risk and managing disclosure risk, inequities of access to data, and then just the kind of fundamental challenge of identifying data sets and knowing what's out there. Um, so, first of all, consent. Um, there is a fair amount of research that suggests that participants don't really understand privacy risks of data reuse, of secondary data use. Um, so there's a nice piece of work by um, Felix Gilles, I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing that right, incorrectly, apologies, um, uh, from 2021, uh, looking at the kind of understanding of anonymity in the context of health research. Um, and his conclusion is that really there's this kind of uh, inaccurate or false understanding of anonymity, which means that a trust between the researcher and the research participant is built on a false premise. Um, and so, you know, can you really consider the participants to have been informed um, if they are not if they don't have an accurate idea of what the actual downstream risks are of, of taking part in this study. Um, 
there's also some evidence to show that participants may think differently about abstract versus specific risks. Um, so how those risks are communicated to participants, again, is going to have quite a big impact on whether or not you can really consider them to be uh, informed. And uh, it's also like the kind of the lifetime of the data set to consider. Um, it's one thing to kind of explain what the immediate risks are. But certainly for University of Bristol data sets, we make them available, uh, let's say, in perpetuity, or at least don't have any data sets with a defined closure date. It's basically as long as we have funding and, you know, breath in our bodies, the data will be there, um, which means that it can be really difficult to forecast what the future risk will be as technology changes, as data becomes, you know, more related data becomes available, uh, processing becomes faster, easier, cheaper. You know, it's, it's, it's really difficult to kind of forecast what the risk will be of this particular data set in 10, 20, 30 years time. So that kind of raises a pretty fundamental question, like how do we, I mean, can we even ethically share data for purposes that were completely unanticipated by the original data subjects or by data stewards, by data collectors? At the University of Bristol, we've got our data access committee, um, uh, but it has its problems. Um, there's no direct data subject representation. You know, we don't have a lay rep um, as you might have in an ethics uh, committee. Um, and whilst we do have a way for data stewards to feed into that process um, as time goes on as you know researchers uh, move on to other projects other institutions change careers um, you know shuffle off this mortal coil um, they we're going to get uh, less and less uh, input from people who are directly involved in the data capture um, and are therefore kind of aware of all the nuances of the data set um, and the data collection and you know how the participants were informed and so on um, so uh, you know, and it is a problem not just for AI-related research. Um, it occurs in kind of any use of, of, of sensitive data, but it's I think it's particularly keen in this area because it's a kind of fast-moving, technically complex field which is quite difficult to explain to a lay audience, and it therefore kind of exacerbates all of those issues um, that I was just talking about. Okay, so the next thing uh, that I see as a kind of major issue is disclosure risk, so managing the risk in, in the data itself. So, and again, some of these are not uh, not issues just for AI, but um, are kind of exacerbated by the very large and very complex data sets that are used for, for machine learning. So, anonymization of complex data requires significant resources and technical expertise. So, as an example, the, uh, the Remap open data set that um, Emma worked on along with Catherine Morgan, it contains skeleton pose camera data, which, is, which was coarsened to enable open data sharing. Um, and there's, there's a sister data set with more refined data, but that required considerable effort from the research team to, to prepare that for publication, um, uh, you know, and, you know, expertise and kind of investigation of what the appropriate techniques were to, to anonymize it. So, yeah, it's kind of extra work over and above just the collection and, and analysis that you'd planned for in the project. Um, another example is our one in a million data set. So this is a database of uh, GP consultation videos. Um, so it's you know, hugely sensitive data, but very, very rich. Um, and because it's so kind of complex and, and rich, um, each data release requires bespoke anonymization. So it's not possible to anonymize the whole thing and make it available as a, you know, as a, as a one big controlled data set. What happens is every time somebody wants to access it, they go to the research team and request specific variables or you know, specific consultations on specific topics. And then the research team has to pull those out and apply anonymization techniques to that subset of data. So things like um, you know, manipulating the video, audio, you know, masking bits, that kind of thing, which again, hugely time consuming. They um, have a, a, a request model where basically they prepare data for a fee, which is how they support that. But yeah, that's not going to be an option for a lot of projects um, uh, because you know, the, that works because the demand for this data set is so high. Um, so yeah, the, there's a, a lot of resource that is required to, to make this sort of data available. Uh, the next thing, and this is something that is a real thorn in our sides at the moment, is kind of unanticipated use cases, and in particular, use, use of sensitive data to generate synthetic data. So the idea here is that uh, if you create a synthetic data set, you can kind of do all the research that you might want, but on a 
uh, data set privacy isn't an issue. Unfortunately, privacy is an issue um, because it's not uh, synthetic data is not inherently uh, private. And as the fidelity of the synthetic data to the real data increases, the privacy necessarily decreases. Um, and of course, there's been, uh, you know, kind of anecdotally, there's been examples of how training data can be extracted from large language models, um, and you know, use of gener generative AI tools like Midjourney, uh, you can uh, expose copyrighted images. So, which again is the training data and suggests that it's been trained on things that it probably shouldn't have been. But anyway, um, so it's kind of reasonable to assume that. Uh, Synthetic data sets generated using related techniques would probably have the same, you know, similar sorts of risks in that respect as well. Um, Actually, we've had one data set that um, uh, uh, we that was requested for uh, to produce a synthetic data set. The request was abandoned before it got to completion. Um, the researchers found a equivalent um, open access data set that they could use, so they they dropped the request before it kind of got to our data access committee. I'm not really sure what our data access committee would have made of it. Um, I think they would probably have rejected it. Um, yeah, uh, not clear, but it does seem like we're going to get more and more requests for this sort of purpose uh, as time goes on. And then finally in this section, the kind of the lack of standards around privacy parameters and uh, ways for assessing privacy risks. So it's kind of tricky at the best of times, um, particularly when you've got a very small team like ours. Um, but the kind of uncertainty around use cases and the kind of downstream risks and uh, plans, tensions for data exposure, uh, make it even more difficult to assess those kind of uh, reuse scenarios. Our current data model, data release model, relies on a single data use scenario, so that um, one purpose analysis in a, in a closed secure system. And it's, we don't really have a way to extend that to other different uh, scenarios. So, yeah, for example, use of um, our data sets in, uh, as a seed or as a training set for uh, synthetic data, for example. So, uh, the third issue that I see as a, as a barrier for um, accessing sensitive data for machine learning is inequities of access. So this goes back to that uh, review of data access requests for AI purposes that I was talking about earlier. What is going on there? Why are so many of them being rejected? And when I took a closer look, basically, it's not necessarily the purpose of the request. It's who's making the request. Most of those requests were from researchers who were sort of non-traditional non academics, so either from very small research organisations or from uh, commercial research organisations, um, which just couldn't meet the requirements that we place upon our data release. Um, so they couldn't uh, provide um, the, you know, they couldn't provide suitable information security policies, they couldn't meet the requirements for ethical approval, um, sometimes they couldn't even find an institutional signatory if the research organisation was really, really small. Um, uh, which, and it, to be honest, it's not actually an issue just for very small research organisations. Um, we ran into problems with a, uh, a couple of requests from a Dutch university um, where their ethics framework didn't require them to get ethical approval for secondary data reuse projects. So they just had no route to get the paperwork that we required of them. Um, so yeah, we kind of went round the houses a bit there. We did sort it out in the end, but yeah, it, it was another blocker. Um, one of the other issues in this uh, respect is kind of the uh, commercial use and licensing of uh, sensitive data for downstream use. So our data access agreement has no provisions for use by commercial organisations and the ownership of any in intellectual property and derived data as it stands in the data access agreement is a pretty blunt tool. So I think if um, it hasn't really been tested, but I suspect the nuances of any shared IP and anything that was generated from uh, uh, from one of our data sets, particularly if it was revenue generating, would have to be worked out separately. And then finally, kind of an issue across the board, but language barriers. We require submissions in English, um, which is obviously a barrier to huge swathes of potential researchers. Um, and additionally, the kind of processes uh, that we have set up, as I mentioned before, are set up with that UK research environment in mind, which means that it can be really difficult for non-UK researchers to, to meet those requirements. So yeah, there's a so there's a lot of kind of sticking points around just the kind of mechanics of getting the data. 
uh, and then kind of related to that, just finding out the data exists in the first place. Um, so we, as a repository, data.bris, are um, discipline agnostic. We're a light touch repository. We kind of position ourselves as a repository of last resort, if you like, um, where if, if our academics can't find a suitable disciplinary repository, they can use us. But that means that the only kind of universal requirements we have for data sets are really, really high level, really light touch. So, you know, you have to have a readme file, that kind of thing. Um, and it's kind of certain minimum amount of like descriptive metadata. But I'm talking like really minimum, like title, abstract. We don't even ask for keywords necessarily. Um, and particularly for sensitive data sets, that means that a lot of the detail that would help someone, another researcher work out if it was useful to them uh, and, and could be used in another context, all of that detail is not publicly accessible and it's not machine readable. So the data dictionaries, the consent information, the licensing information, so our global repository license is machine readable, but the that license is superseded by the data access agreement and the data access agreement is not. Um, and of course, there's a kind of wealth of different data and metadata standards. Uh, but you know, which ones do we recommend? Should we recommend any, given that we're a, a you know multidisciplinary repository? Um, and also, what about data that's not collected with AI uh, research in mind? Like, should we be trying to suggest that researchers kind of structure their data in some way to make it more usable? I mean, I suspect that would just result in a lot less data being published. So, yeah. Um, and then finally, our the survey that we did, so 94% of respondents said that they would find an AI project registry useful, alas, for our vanished funding. Um, and 40% said that they would use that to find data sets for, for use. So it certainly suggests that there's definitely uh, an audience for some kind of better and more effective way of collecting data that could be used for this purpose and, and surfacing it and making it available. So in kind of in summary, there are some significant barriers to using uh, sensitive data in a machine learning context throughout the research life cycle from you know, all different points of it, from the approve, approval and planning stages right through to that secondary reuse. Some of these are generic and common to any use of sensitive data, um, but some of them are quite specific to AI and machine learning research. So you know, the atypical nature of a lot of the research organizations working in this area and the difficulty of kind of assessing the risk in novel and unanticipated use cases. So the next thing I'm gonna do is briefly talk about some of the ways that we are trying to address some of these issues. Some of the solutions are things we're actively working on. Um, some of them are uh, kind of sector level efforts and some of these are kind of merely aspirational, but, but I think would be useful if we could get it off the ground. But the kind of uh, thread running through all of these is that we're trying to improve the, the fairness of data sets. So that's the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. So first of all, for our existing data sets, um, metadata enrichment. So improving that relational data between our CRIS system and data.bris to, to make sure that researchers can kind of easily see where uh, where projects have outputs, uh, including data sets, and make the link between uh, uh, work that's ongoing and published. Um, unfortunately, this is probably pretty low down the list of priorities, at least for our, our, our Chris team. Um, but it would be really useful to help, kind of, as I said, to kind of better surface those data sets. So you know, maybe from the data.bris side, we can, uh, I think there's some work we could do even without improving the data in Pure. Um, and then better cit data citation practices. So there's, for example, there's a UKRN, UK Reproducibility Network project, uh, God, what's it called? OR4, Open Researcher Reward and Recognition Programme. I don't think that's enough R's. It's something along those lines anyway. But it's got a number of um, strands, one of which is looking at uh, improving metrics for uh, of all different aspects of uh, measurement of open research, but one of them is looking at data access statements um, and better data access statements and better, uh, you know, especially if we had machine readable data access statements, um, that would go a long way to helping improve data set um, visibility. And in fact, might have a knock on effect on improving data citation rates as well. Um, and then 
the kind of bottom of that list is the more kind of aspirational things. Um, we don't really have any current capacity to put these in place, but um, there's definite interest um, in in these areas in, and in other parts of the university as well. So in terms of um, PETS, uh, privacy enhancing technologies, so use of TREs, um, trusted research environments, trusted execution environments, um, this is... I think it would be great if we could get our sensitive data um, and, and make it available in, in a TRE. Um, there was talk of um, having one of these linked to our um, uh, uh, research data storage facility. Uh, unfortunately, I think all the people have been stolen by the Isambard AI project, um, but you know, <laughs> maybe one day they'll come back and finish that off. Um, but yeah, if, if we could make our data available uh, in a TRE, uh, yeah, it would, be a step change in the kind of ease in which uh, other people get access to it. Um, there's also potentially uh, integration with the UK's SafePod network. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this, but it's kind of a network of safe settings for accessing sensitive data from the uh, Office for National Statistics, uh, NHS data, that kind of thing. So if we could integrate our data sets into that, again, it would mean that uh, it, you, there'd be a standardized process for getting access to it and, you know, researchers wouldn't have to if they wanted to use multiple different data sets you know one from us one from another university they could just do it one access process as opposed to having to apply multiple times to multiple different uh, data sources and then in terms of kind of ways that we could improve the way that we integrate data subjects into that whole decision making process about what to do with data and how to uh, how to release it and whether to release it I think we need to explore new models for data governance. Uh, so the data trust model was uh, is something that's been developed for co-produced research um, as a way to kind of ensure that um, all the uh, parties involved are remain involved in that data governance process throughout the life cycle of the data. What, if we can adapt that in some way to um, to the data brisk cont context and yeah, get more input from if not necessarily from the specific people that um, uh, that the data was collected from, but you know representatives of, um, uh, of of data subject groups, I think that would be really useful. Um, so as I said, this one again, it's quite aspirational because it's quite difficult to convince, uh, for example, our data access committee that they're not perfect just as they are. But I'm working on it. Um, right, and then uh, for new data sets. Uh, there's a piece of ongoing work uh, looking to standardize our consent forms and information sheets and kind of the ethics process in general um, with the idea that we can standardize the, the wording in these forms um, and hopefully include better explanations of kind of the potential future uses of data, including for, for AI purposes. Um, there is also uh, one thing we're considering is whether or not we need to look at the global license that's currently applied to all our data sets um, and whether that should include some kind of explicit reference to AI use. The current uh, license doesn't really mention it either way. Um, but, you know, greater clarity might be helpful uh, and whether that's kind of opt in or opt out is uh, still to be decided. Um, and then, as I kind of mentioned before, AI standards, there are lots out there whether or not we should be promoting them, requiring them, or just kind of, you know, gently shuffling them in front of our researchers and saying, have you considered this? Um, uh, but yeah, but and again, if we do that, which ones should we be using? Um, so yeah, it would be really helpful to get your take on what you see as the kind of the, the, the big ones, the emerging ones, the things that would make your life easier as users of that secondary data. And that is me done. So really, as I said, it's kind of a question to you. What what would make your life easier in terms of accessing and using sensitive data? Thank you. Thank you, Shia. That was a really, really interesting presentation and uh, really a, a very, very relevant topic, I guess, for all of us. And uh, are there questions? Start. Sorry, um, I, you know, <laughs> I ask you a lot of questions, so this is just going to be the latest in a long chain of questions. But uh, <laughs> um, I thought the five states framework was really interesting. Mm -hmm. 
Um, now, I've been looking into different frameworks for a while because I'm teaching a little thing on responsible innovation this year. Mm -hmm. And so I've been through sort of Solos framework and I've been through like Linden and I've been through a bunch of these. Mm -hmm. And they all seem to have different focuses. And, you know, privacy by design, for example, you know, and a lot of them are very, either very, very specific because they're based in the law or very interpretive. And I thought the five six was quite interpretive. And also that it was interesting that you brought up um the you know the sort of impact on the institution later which is something you sort of see in linden but which didn't mm. seem directly present in the five states and i wonder if you felt like you know you've ever met the right privacy framework if you know what I mean, or if, uh, if it's one of those it helps direct the thinking but you have to have some yeah how do you feel about that <laughs> yeah no i think you're you're right it, it doesn't really uh it's very focused on the specific data use rather than that kind of broader context of uh yeah the institution that's holding the data and kind of how it generally makes decisions on whether we should still hold it how who should have access to it and so on um so yeah i think i don't think or at least at the moment i don't think there's one uh privacy framework to rule them all uh so yeah i think it's kind of a case of picking and choosing the frameworks and the parts of the frameworks that are most useful in the specific context and certainly for us in thinking about the um, setting up of our data release process that five safe framework was quite useful to make sure that we were uh, kind of hitting the right measures um, in you know checking for the, the right things uh, in, in making decisions about how to release. Uh, do you think it would be helpful from the point because over time we sort of started evolving a kind of checklist mm -hmm. if you like of our own based on the things that we've ended up asking ourselves <laughs> um and i sort of wonder whether that's another thing that could kind of usefully be presented as a resource for researchers mm -hmm. so like you know here's a bunch of things that people in similar domains to you had problems with you know, here's a yeah. I know checklist exercises get a bad name. <laughs> yes, I think, and I think specifically for uh, new data is that is new types of data is the wrong word, but uh, I guess basically data that isn't in a spreadsheet um, because there's a large amount of work that's been that's gone on to kind of think about ways to uh, assess risk and anonymize uh, tabular data but in uh when you're thinking about you know video audio uh, depth skeleton those kinds of those kinds of data it's often very difficult to even remember that that is privacy is going to be an issue um and so yeah having those sorts of resources to hand to researchers to say okay but what about you know abcd just just as a kind of reminder prompt to help uh, spark those those uh, thinking about that and spark those conversations would yes be really useful I think yeah I'll add it to our list <laughs> uh, other questions so you've got a list of requirements for people to access the data um, how much work do you have a list of things that the researchers have to put in to describe the data and yeah yeah this is the issue with having uh, this uh, discipline agnostic uh, light touch repository is that we do have some requirements um, but it's very much if you don't like these requirements we have others <laughs> so yeah we basically uh, require uh, you know, uh, title, uh, brief, brief abstract, although some of the abstracts we've seen are just the title of the data set again, um, uh, and a readme file, which uh, I think at minimum needs to include like a file inventory and some details of uh, any software that is required to make use of that. But we don't have any requirements about documentation, uh, including data dictionaries, using data standards or anything like that, um, because of the wide range of different data types that we get um it would be really difficult i think to have something that would be useful and also applicable to all of our all of our users um what we do try and do is um, when we get involved with the data planning at the um uh, uh 
data management planning stage is to kind of highlight okay what you know have you are you going to be using any standards what are you going to do to make sure that your data can be reused at least by other researchers in your field if not more broadly um but again what people say in a dmp is often not necessarily what actually happens at the end of the day so yeah <laughs> i i do wish that we had firmer standards but at the same time given the use case for our um and the user base for our repository i'm not sure that we could um actually make those stick and still be useful to the research community we serve unfortunately it's, it's not it was not so much for the it, it's just helping the researchers try to actually sort of highlight what they're actually playing with and being aware of what of what they actually are using it be aware of what their data is basically rather than mm. sort of I'll talk a bit later about that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so we, we do try and flag that up when, if we happen to be involved at the planning stage. Um, uh, but yeah, there's only, we're kind of just advisory at that stage. This, the stick only happens at the data publication stage and obviously sure by that, that stage. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I also have one question uh, that basically follows what uh, Greg uh, asked at the end. So, who are usually your users? The people who already have collected the data and just want to publish it, or the people who are about to collect data? How it usually works? Uh, both. So, um, we, for certainly for um, researchers that are applying for funding. Um, we usually get looped in on that grant application process and can therefore provide advice on data management plans at that stage. Um, but the kind of the majority of our work, I think, usually happens at the point of publication. And quite often we might have seen the data management plans sort of two, three years ago. But when it comes to the point of publication, many things have happened and changed. And yeah, it won't necessarily, the data set that is ready for publication doesn't necessarily resemble the one that was kind of the ideal, the platonic ideal data set <laughs> that was envisaged at the beginning of the process. So, yeah, And because we are also facing uh, this problem of we want to publish a data set, and uh, somehow there are some aspects of the data set that we can't publish, but of course it's already post-mortem and you can't uh, mm. go back and fix the problems that weren't collected or were collected that shouldn't have been collected. Um, so we also don't have a solution to this problem, but I was wondering how to uh, deal with such data sets. Do you just say, no, you can't publish it? Or do you try to, try to find some works around? Or... <laughs> Yeah, so we, I mean, worst case scenario, we will just say reject it and say, no, we can't publish that. But before it gets to that stage, there are a couple of different options. Um, so one, um, we can work with the researcher and suggest changes to the data set in terms of, you know, removing um, some information, maybe publishing a subset of data. Um, uh, we I think well, we, one of the things we often suggest is going back to the participants to reconsent them for whatever data sharing you actually want to do. That's off, often not an option. Um, so I'm not sure that anyone's actually ever bothered to do that. But it is, you know, that that would kind of be the ideal solution. Um, uh, the other option is um, kind of this moving the assumption of risk to the institution. Uh, so getting, say, approval from the research sponsor, from the ethics board to uh, to share data in a way that's not explicitly aligned with the consent form. Um, and that's uh, another place where our data access committee can, can come in handy. So um, if there is a kind of very clear benefit to making this data available to the research community, um, then the institution, the data access committee, the, the research sponsor may decide that it's worth them taking on this additional risk um, of making that data available um, because of this this clear benefit. Um, but that does require quite a lot of kind of administrative and kind of prep work from both the researcher in terms of kind of like writing the argument as to why the terms of the consent should be not strictly followed and obviously requires input from all these different bodies to support that, that decision. Um, but we have done that uh, a couple of times. Um, and that, again, is where our kind of controlled data release process comes in. Um, because uh, I th 
almost exclusively anything where the decision to publish has been made and it doesn't align with the consent, it would also have to be published as a controlled data set so that every single request for that can be assessed and make sure that that it you know it meets that that criteria of being a benefit despite this this additional risk. Thank you. And the last question for myself. I have a lot of questions, but maybe we can <laughs> I can ask afterwards. Um, but I was wondering because I saw uh, about fifty percent of the requests for uh, AI usage of the data sets is actually uh, rejected, and uh, most of the requests for non AI usage is actually granted. So how do you decide if uh, the usage of the data set for AI purposes is, so to say, inappropriate, dangerous, or whatever. Ah, so this was um, uh, this was my kind of post hoc analysis of the reasons. So uh, it's not necessarily the case that the, those rejects those requests were rejected because of the purpose of the research. Okay. Um, in most cases, it was actually because the requester couldn't meet the requirements. So they were from a commercial organization um, or they were uh, yeah, from a small research organization that didn't have uh, the correct institutional um, uh, information security policies, that kind of thing. So it, it was the, it's not the nature of the request, it's the nature of the request or that okay. was the problem. I understand. I understand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, are there other questions? Yes, there is one more. Yeah, thank you very much for your talk. I struggle a little bit when it comes to the unanticipated use cases or uses of data. So they can happen in the data collection phase and the analysis phase, but also after publication. Um, do we have some kind of means to address especially this phase after publication? So when somebody takes your data set and does something completely different than you had in mind uh, with it, is there some kind of uh, data licensing as an approach or something like this? So, yeah, in terms of the the licensing, uh, certainly the models that we use in our repository don't uh, don't really specify um, potential uses. Uh, don't kind of go down. Don't really specify whether or, some, or not something is okay. Apart from at the very general level of you can't use it for commercial purposes. Um, so if there are concerns about what the data might be used for, that is when we would go down the controlled publication route and have that committee um, assess the proposed use case against you know, the reasons why the data was collected in the first place and, and what, how the potential uses were explained to the, to the data subjects and kind of make, make that decision. Uh, if the data, you know, if you wanted to publish a data set openly, I mean, again, I think this is where we need to do better in terms of explaining to participants what those potential risks might be and, you know, making a better effort to talk about the fact that there are, you know, there's currently this landscape of uh, using uh, data for, for, for machine learning and, you know, this is what it currently looks like, but who knows what it might look like in the future and kind of being more explicit about those unknowns um, because, yeah, at the moment, uh, most of the consent forms that we see are just, you know, your data may be used for research purposes. Well, <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, is, it is a big problem. Thank you very much. So if there are no urgent questions, we can also bring the discussion afterwards during the coffee uh, break. Um, for those who have joined us later, we are recording the workshop. So if you don't want to be recorded, let us know and you will be removed from the recording afterwards. Um, okay, so thank you once again. It was really, really <laughs> interesting talk. And now we will continue with the first paper session. And uh, yeah, I will give the moderation to uh, Dale. Okay, so uh, we now continue with the um, first paper session, which consists of uh, five papers. The first paper, which you already see um, um, on, your, on the screen, 
is, is called a comparative analysis on ML techniques for uh, research metadata, the RDS use case, and it will be presented by Dipendra Yadav, University of Greifswald. The second paper well, will be a methodology for um, and, and system for a big tick data collection, which will be presented by um, Ivan Kayongo, University of Trento. And um, then we have addressing privacy in passive data collection for nursing documentation, presented, which will be presented by Farnot Bahoroloni. Bahoroloni, sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, University of Applied, of Applied Scientists, Rhein Main. And uh, after that, we continue with challenges in data preservation of AI and ML, ML systems, which will be presented by uh, Gregory Turte, University of Oxford. And um, the, last, the last paper of this session will be understanding and addressing user needs for annotation of simple sensor data, which will be presented by um, Albrecht Kotze, uh, Technical University of Chemnitz. Um, now I can um, pass the microphone to Mr. Dipendro Yadav will share his res uh, results. Thank you so much, Theo. Um, yeah, it seems I'm sweating like hell. OK, so the title of my paper is Comparative Analysis on Machine Learning Techniques on Research Metadata and Audio's Case Study. Uh, so my name is Dipendra. I'm from University of Greifswald, Institute of Data Science. I, OK, that was. Okay. So these are the contents which I will be talking up. It's a lot of them. Uh, I would rush you through them. So first of all, I've given a small introduction what Audios is. As we already had in Keynote, but small. And then what data we have, what keyword extraction techniques are applied, pre-processing, embedding models are used, dimension reduction techniques I tried, clustering techniques, and what results we have, and what could we look towards in future. Um, OK. A small okay. Um, so Audios, it's a workshop basically on so the main focus for Audios, what I understood is that you want to highlight the crucial role of data labeling, the value of high quality annotations, what novel approaches are there to data annotation, and mostly the cross um, disciplinary dialogue. And so it's relevant here. Um, we had in past seven works of, as Krishna said, and we had like in total 53 accepted papers. And these were like 41 or, uh, participating organizations in total and from 14 countries. Now coming to the motivation. Why this study? What, why need it? What's the need? The important thing was the audience organizers, they sat down and they were like, huh, we look back and we have seven workshops. What, what uh, topics the participants felt interesting and they hold, held on to towards the uh, year on year. I don't know what's the right English word. Okay. And what topics lost their sign and they were irrelevant. So we just wanted to look research trend. And that was the main reason why this study was done. And okay. So this is an approach what we applied to get us closer to that answer. And so um, first of all, I'll talk about this like data. First of all, I'll go. And OK, so what data we had? Um, so data, what we had was the metadata. And in metadata, we had like relevant key fields like keywords, which is like actually keywords, inspection controlled indexing keywords, which is basically like approved, approved terms and inspecting inspect non-controlled indexing which are like free language terms which you could you just choose and then abstract and title so when you see these keywords that's really good because they give us an idea on what direction this paper is what's the research um yeah domain but when abstract and title this is where we needed keyword extraction and i tried these four keyword extraction methods um, okay, so 
TF-IDF, it's basically you have like term frequency, inverse document frequency, like you see how frequent a particular term is in an abstract, and then you look how rare a particular term is across abstract, and the product will like basically let you know how important a particular keyword is in that um, paper. And text frank, like you, you represent it as no uh, graph, and where you, you have words on S's, uh, sorry, nodes, and then S's are basically connected to other words, and then you use the text frank algorithm basically to find out how important a particular word is in that, um, yeah, in that paper abstract. And keyword, so keyword basically uses BERT. So you use BERT to first get an embedding for the whole abstract, and then you get embedding for the word or multi-word, and then you see like, okay, is that, uh, how, how close are they? How, how similar are they? And according to that, we try to find out the, yeah, uh, the, the uh, keyword. Cyword was basically similar to keyword. Apart, apart from that, we used science a cyber, which is trained on like scientific text. So the uh, thing was like, we felt like, ah, okay, it's trained on scientific text and we had papers, so maybe it's closer. It will help us to get better keywords. And then after getting all those keywords, we processed those keywords, basically tokenize those info text, remove stop words, filter out words that were not nouns, verbs, and adjectives. So we, we left out, we chose this, um, these three, and then we removed the duplicates. And this is one example where we had like title and abstract, and this is what the keyword uh, looked like in, in so the whole uh, yeah, combination of all these keyword extraction techniques. And like, this is how a word cloud looks like, like all keywords, and then the existing keywords, which are already there. And so we had like 2,754 keys. And yeah, in existing, we had like 919 keys. Okay, embedding models. I will just, uh, yeah, I'll give a small in introduction, not so deep on it. So basically, we had BERT, which was basic, um, which uses like, uh, yeah, mask language modeling, and then next sense of prediction, cyber trained on uh, scientific text, BIWAT was trained on mobile medical literature. Distilled BERT, it like has half, uh, you know, half size compared to BERT, but it ends like 97% of its performance. Roberta was like, um, yeah, it's, it's trained on dynamic masking. So this is what the models which we used. And dimension detection technique, I tried like PCA, DSNE, UMAP, and ICA. And um, yeah, I, I wouldn't go in deep here. Um, clustering techniques, I, which we tried like K-means, K-method, hierarchical, and ZMM. And I, I chose, oh, okay. Oh. So I, I chose a silhouette score, a matrix to compare uh, the performance, uh, which range is like minus one to one, where one basically means uh, how good a cluster is, and uh, one is the best, and zero is like well, this overlap, and minus one is like it's basically misclassified. And here is interesting part. Um, so what I did is like we had, a lot of combinations, so I cannot saw everything. What I did is like, I tried from three number cluster to 18 cluster, and then for all those combinations where we have at least once the highest score, I chose those and I plotted them. And here we could see that, like ICA distilled but K-mirrors combinations, for example, PCA distilled but K-mirrors combinations, they were doing really good around all across um, different keywords, and this is, for example, one of them, like, oh, sorry, uh, this, this one more thing I wanted to say, like, and we could see, like, the, the best performing clusters were, like, three, four, five, or maximum six, so they, they were the best, they had the best scores. And here, it's also significant from here, like, if you look, it's, like, four cluster, it looks like that. Um, yeah, so from results, if you look at results, uh, the best clusters for all kinds of keywords were like three, four, five, and the steel bird uh, seemed like the best performance, like they, it provided the best uh, performance. K-means, k, -means, k -means, and ZMM were like the, also the best clustering methods. And the, if you consider three clusters or four clusters, the, uh, if you look into the themes, the most of the theme would be like 
either data annotation, machine learning, data processing, or even computer interaction. So uh, what could the future work? You could actually, like we could try more embedding models, or we could try this uh, uh, large language models like ChatGPT or, or like Llama and see like if they can give us a better performance. Um, maybe try more evolution metrics, like uh, instead of like just not just silhouette score, but David Davis Bolden index or Dunn index. And we could get the yearly topic trend analysis. What was our uh, finding goal? Yeah, and that's kind of some references which I referred to. And thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Dipendra. Do you have any questions? Or should we continue with the, with the next talk? OK, um, maybe if you don't have any questions, we can just move to the next presentation. I just need some uh, one minute to upload it. I have one question while you're uploading the next one. Um, okay, nice. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I'll give you a second here. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering in the keywords, did you notice if there were, um, because we talked earlier about how some research didn't sort of show up in, you know, research information systems as kind of AI or machine learning linked. I just wondered if you felt like there were any disciplinary differences uh, in how people describe their research from your keyword research. Yeah, like if you're in like healthcare, maybe you describe how you're doing, you know, although you've got like a machine learning focus, maybe you don't describe it in quite the same way as a technologist in machine learning, kind of theoretical machine learning or something might. I just wondered if there was anything like that. What I did, like, whatever they wrote, abstract. I, I wrote those books on that, so I, I didn't read it and then I tried on how maybe it's do you think it would be possible to use that data set and explore but I, I think it's kind of an interesting question because i certainly you know completely anecdotally i found that people who are maybe applying machine learning from different disciplines are sometimes quite i'm going to i'm going to say humble about how they describe it, like they don't want to be caught being a machine learner <laughs> by accident, like if someone's going to walk up to them and, you know, be like, oh, you're not a proper machine learner. <laughs> and so I just, I think it might be really interesting to see whether there is, uh, a, like, people from other disciplines don't toot that horn kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you for asking questions and also thank you, Dependra, for uh, your presentation and the responses. Um, now we can continue with the, with the next uh, talk, which is um, a methodology for system for, and system for big, thick data collection. Um, and the presenter is um, Ivan, Ivan Kayongo. Hello, good morning. <laughs> Sorry, it could be late. Um, okay, so basically, oh, basically my paper is about a, uh, oh, a methodology and system for big thick data collection. Um, oops, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so. I, I, uh, I'll just briefly talk about big thick data. I believe all of you know what it is. So basically, big thick data is we kind of in the in in the uh, description. It's made of two parts. So the big data and the thick data. So um, separating the two, the big data is more of data which is collected from sensors. But in our scope, we basically focus on sensors on smart devices, uh, the smartwatch and smartphones. And then the thick data uh, still we collect from the smart 
funds, but here we use digital ESM. So we send a small questionnaire, uh, which has very simple questions. So for instance, in case we want to get your location, we ask, where are you? Or with whom are you? So basically you just, and we have the answer, so you just keep clicking. So now the issue is that um, at times this data doesn't reach uh, the quality. It's not really of good quality. Why? Uh, participants tend to just answer for the sake or at times the questions are so many that you just keep clicking and clicking without thinking or at times you st they start answering the question and take so long to complete it. So in other words, this is wrong data. I mean, you get the questions answered, but you're not going to get the right data. Just imagine you'll, we ask you, where are you? And you start answering now, then 30 minutes later you complete. I mean, you're going to be here and then later on you'll be the other side. So this, this is the challenge. And then one other thing is another from my colleagues, they say that the completion time, the reaction time, I mean, uh, the question is sent now. And then when you start answering it matters. And then when the time you complete it. So these are some of the things we focus on. So our solution is to make a system which predicts when to send the questions, but then also uh, provide a, a, I mean, provide a means where the main researcher, the owner of the experiment can communicate with the people. Uh, one other point I forgot to put, ah, oh, no, it's the third one. I mean, the, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the participants can track that data. So in other words, we give them a view and they see how they're performing. So um, in summary, I'll just, this is the whole system and I'll take you through bit by bit. No pointer, I hope so. Ah, cool. So now we have the application which collects the sensors, sensor data and the questionnaire comes here. Um, to begin, the whole process begins with the researcher. He creates uh, the experiment. So he will put, uh, we have an interface which we call the calendar where he sets the questions when they're going to be set. And so once this is put there, uh, he collects, I mean, he avails, this is a, the, the experiment plan, which we, okay, the plan is available to the participants. Now the participants have a chance to edit this plan. The edit, but we keep a copy of the original and the edit. Uh, once the experiment starts, um, everything, okay, when they edit, everything is stored here. And whatever is stored in the short-term memory is accessed by a machine learning model. So the model can see the original plan and see the changes in the plan. But as the experiment is also going, it can see the changes or how this person is responding. So in other words, it has the machine learning model has three copies. So it plays around with this and predicts when it can edit the plan when this person can answer. Um, so these three I've talked about now, the other one is this. The researcher can see all the data that is being collected. So he will know who is not responding, right? Who is taking long? Because from the previous slide, I said the response time and the reaction time matters. So he can see all those and has a chance to talk to this person. He says, dude, what's up? You're taking so long to complete this. So all this works in sync. And in the end, we, we discover that we get better data as the system is working whole. So in short, this is the whole system uh, that we write about the data. Um, uh, in our test, which I have been <laughs> included in here, we played around with a number of uh, machine learning models and techniques. And so far, I mean, since we've been collecting data for a number of experiments, we used already collected data to predict, uh, we have students. We, we predict when they're in class and the model could tell that this person is in class and probably we shouldn't send them the question there and then. I mean, a better time would be better. So 
because when you're attending a lesson, probably you're distracted, you don't answer there and then and things of the kind. So, so far, this is the system. Um, thank you, and probably I'll get some questions from you. <laughs> So, any questions? Yeah? Um, I just thought, I mean, that was really, really interesting. Um, it made me think about some work that's been done in sort of co design about um, so co design where you sort of work with participants and with researchers and kind of try and get them together and see what their different perspectives are. Um, and I just wondered if you've sort of been there and kind of talked to participants directly about their perspective because it sounded like you had because you were saying for example you know if they're in class and they haven't got time to you know <laughs> to fill these things out um i just wondered what outreach you'd done um so basically the following being correct in that but what you say like the response in in line with the whole system you mean um we haven't yet done that because so far it's like different risk we are different PhD students and then we are putting our work together. For example, the dashboards is this week, actually today, that we are starting a data collection with these parts. The machine learning also we're putting together. So, but I, I would say that's part of the plan. Yeah. Yes. So. <clears throat> Okay, thanks for the question. Um, I also have one question, and namely, you mentioned that you experimented with different uh, machine learning models. Um, could you just let us know what kind of models these were? So, just a uh, short, maybe, over overview. Um, okay, so we we did random forest, the decision trees, neural nets, and logistic regression, and we're comparing. So we're using this to predict when since we are working with students, I mean, that is easy to go from students. <laughs> no, this calls me. So, uh, so we're trying to predict that this person is in class. And so far, random forests were <laughs> the best in, in predicting this. So they, they're, oh, I've forgotten the score, but it's in the paper. But at least they had the best prediction that uh, this student now is in class. Since we tag, we have the, where are you? And they say I'm in class and things like that. So we use the tags and the sensor data of the location to play around this to make the prediction. So so far, uh, random forests have the best. Um, I don't know if I've answered that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, so we can now continue. I think if there are not any other questions. Okay. So uh, now we can continue with the next talk which will be presented by Farnot Barolumi. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry in advance because my voice is a little bit um, hoarse. My topic today is addressing privacy in passive data collection for nursing documentation. It's important to know that nurses spend a lot of time during the patient's care afterward doing the documentation. That means that the patient, the time which is needed for the patient is lesser. Imagine if we want to help the nurses doing the documentation, we could create a, um, a speech system where we record the voices from the nurses, where we record the noise and, and the, the information from the patients, or we record the information from um, each, uh, from both of them. The big problem would be that if we do that, we need to have the permissions from the patients. And sometimes also visitors come, came into the room and interrupt the, uh, the conversations. And that's why we introduced a, a framework where we say uh, that we only want to collect the necessary documentation information from the nurses, not from the patients. There are three main GDPR requirements. The first one is that we need to minimize the recording time. The second one is that we need to avoid recording irrelevant topics. And the third one is that we need to avoid recording certain people. For the related work part, we have two main 
data collection systems. We have the active ones where we say, okay, and we need the special words uh, which will trigger Siri or Alexa manually. And we, for the passive variation, we use microphones and special word triggers and RF, or RFID sensors, where, uh, which will be activated if something special happens. The big problem on these uh, main approaches are that they overlook the relevant recording time. Imagine if you, if a nurse and a patient are talking with you with each other, and we want to detect if it's relevant to start the documentation, we could say, okay, we will start, um, we will start the documentation when we use a system like a speaker identification for the nurse, because we can fine tune it on them. And for the patient, uh, which uh, could be over 65 years old, we found out that 92% of the patients in nursing homes are over um, 65 years old, we could use an age classifier. On this example, we can see that the nurse is asking, are you still in pain? And the patient is answering, yes, I need another 800 milligram of paracetamol. On this special case, we can see that it wouldn't work. That's why we uh, suggested that we need a context classification to identify the patient um, yeah, safely. On the second example, we see that if we have the speaker for the nurse, the age for the patient and the context for the uh, patient, it would be not enough because in this example, the nurse is asking, where is your father, Albert? I'm looking for him, has he run um, away again? And a visitor, not a patient, who is, could also be over 65 years old, is answering, he's getting ready to be washed which means that in this special, we found a special case where age and context aren't enough. That's why we suggest um, pronoun classification to improve, to identify if it's a visitor or a patient and start the documentation or not. Our main um, research question was, what information can be used to determine the recording time for the documentation using speech-based activity recognition? And in our case, we define relevant recording time as if uh, when, there are care, uh, when there is a care activity or a care-relevant information provided during the speech. Our conceptual framework uh, suggests that we use the speaker identification, the context classification, and the pronoun classification to determine the, uh, the recording time. If you look at our technical architecture, we can see that a person and a nursing staff are talking with each other, the information uh, and the smartwatch is collecting the speech signals. It goes through a pre-processing where there is a denoising module and a feature extractor and it goes into the, afterward, it goes to the classification model where we have the context, speaker, and pronouns. And they will try to label, to, uh, to label the nursing staff and the second person with the labels visitor, staff, patient, or others. And we transform this four class classification problem into a binary classification problem where we say, okay, both row labels are correct or not both label, uh, row labels are correct. And afterwards, we will start the rec uh, record or not. Our key findings are that we need the speaker context and pronoun classification. Age classification would be redundant. And we need to address the GDPR requirements. The limita limitations were that we didn't consider non-native speakers in our conceptual framework, and that there wasn't a real data set available. For future work, we need to implement this conceptual framework and also evaluate it and create this German data set with unnecessary information. Thank you. If you have any questions, please. Okay, thank you for uh, the interesting talk. Do we have, um, do we have any questions? Okay, because I have one question, and namely, yes. you told that you use different classifiers. Mm -hmm. um, 
did you then use different pre-processing steps for uh, for each of the classifiers or uh, how did you build your pipeline we did not implement anything it was only a conceptual framework the whole impl implementation needs to be done for the future work we are doing the implementation now but for our paper it was only a conceptual framework no implementation was involved okay but the the, the so you consider that this pre-processing step they can yeah. be different for the different classifiers right the or, we will have uh we will have one pre-processing step with the uh, with the denoising module and the feature extractor mm -hmm. and afterward when the signals were clear because we have different background uh, background noises in in nursing homes after this noises will uh, uh, will be cleared it uh, goes into the classifiers okay okay thanks uh, we have another question so for so you say you haven't implemented anything in terms of how you want to record things who would where would be the microphones are you are they going to be sort of worn by the um, by the nurse um, mm -hmm. Sorry, I need to answer that one, and then I've got another. Yeah, another of course. That. Um, we asked for this. Uh, this is a really good question because we also asked nurses how the how the what the necessary um, where do we need to put the smartwatch? And they told us that their arms need to be free, and they need to put uh, the only way to use a smartwatch if we want to use it is to put it on. Uh, under like on their neck and or in this area because um, it's uh, because otherwise the health of uh, the health prop um, there would be a problem with the health sector they would say that that's not good if it's on the arm so my second question is yeah. um so you you were talking about identifying who's talking and that sort of thing do you do you think you could actually use sort of location from the sound as to figure out where things are um where things are located and would that be useful do you mean if we can identify if somebody is um, in the patient's room only from the background sound yeah huh. it it could be possible but some like everybody if you go to a patient's room there there in some rooms there uh, would be special medical machines and they will make a special sound in other rooms there would wouldn't be anything it would be completely silent the silent part would mean that if somebody would be on the floor it could also be silent it would be risky that's why we focus ourselves to say okay um, who is talking with whom and we try to identify if the second person, because um, if we want to identify the, the nurse, we could use the speaker and fine tune it and it would, uh, would be okay. And for the second person, we try to identify, okay, what are the topics he's, he or she is talking about? Is, is, uh, is it care relevant information? Is he or she talking about him or herself? Then we say, we know, okay, it could, uh, the, the, the it could be high that the second person would be a patient and not a visitor. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, then we um, we can now start with the next. I'm going talk. to keep the microphone. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, my name is Gregory Chort and I'm from the University of Oxford and the paper we wrote was with um, Emma Tonkin from the University of um, Bristol uh, and it's on the challenges in data preservation for AI and ML systems, um, if you know how to use that. So I'm going to go very quickly through that because we don't have that much time but um, so a quick introduction as to where I'm coming from on the subject um going through the problem that we might ex uh, that we are trying to solve um looking at the regular regular when the disease, regulatory background around um data management and preservation in um, ai and machine learning 
the intellectual property risk in uh, generative AI and what that implies um, for um, preserving that data, um, what your um, what the data, the validity of the data, the provenance, and what it can sort of uh, elucidate, and the issues with data curation and data audit with uh, machine learning. I'm going to go very through very quickly because we don't have that much time, and it's, it's more an open discussion for later. Um, so I'm very taught. I work at the University of Oxford in the as a system administrator and um, research software engineer in the advanced research computing team. I previously worked um, on uh, paleoclimate data and health data. Paleoclimate data is not really an issue in terms of um, privacy. We're talking about several million years ago, so we don't care. Um, but it's still large data, so we still have that problem in terms of quantity rather than the uh, the health data, on the other hand, is um, as large data but completely diverse and contains quite a lot of um, personal data that we need to cater for when we're actually trying to solve the, trying to store the data. Uh, my role now in Oxford is not dealing with the research itself, but dealing with the infrastructure and um, for storage and computing side of things. Um, and Emma is um, the data manager on the health related project. So she deals very, very closely with all the implication at all levels of the research projects for personal data. And um, so when we talk about data in machine learning, we have several definitions for that. You've got the data used to train the models, you've got the data generated by the models, and you've got the data used by the models when you've, after you train them, you want to actually extract something out of it to make, um, um, to get information as to what you're trying to do. Um, but you also have the models themselves, uh, which contain data within them once you've trained them. So we are gonna mostly talk about the first two um, because that's the, um, the one I'm looking at. Um, and that will inform what you can do with the third one and the model, the model themselves is not part of that talk, but it's something that is also being discussed and um, in other organizations, which I want to mention, mention anyway. So what's the problem? In terms of when you're a researcher, you've, you have a problem that you want to solve. You're going to use uh, machine learning to do that. And so you need data, and you need to understand what your data is. The um, what. And what's the value of that data after you've done your project? If you want to publish it, as we discussed, as Zosha discussed earlier, your data doesn't have a finite life, and it cannot be. Um, um, it's not just what you thought it was going to be, and it's the same thing in software. You know, your software is going to be used for something completely different that you never thought about. It's the same thing with data, and so. Um, you need to understand also the best practices with data preservation, which at first you don't think about because you do research in machine learning, the data stuff is something different, you know, it's, but you still need to do it because your work is fully involved with data. And therefore you need to understand the later legal frameworks behind what you're doing with data, especially when you deal with personal private data, which is another completely different field. Uh, thankfully, you usually have helpful people like Emma doing the sort of grindy work for you, but you need to listen to these people because they might sound annoying because you can do this, you can't do that with your data, it's against the law, and you say, but well, you still need to do it. Um, and But we're currently very far off in terms of, within institution, um, far off researchers having all that in for, um, thought process re regarding data, because usually researchers, they have a finite amount of time to do their research. What is all that seems to be outside the realm of what they need to think about because they need to do their research. And therefore, um, the data side of thing is something a bit detached and it's, yeah, it's something I need, it's something I own, it's fine. <laughs> 
and it's disposable, so they don't think about it, um, which is a bit unfortunate, but that's the way it is. So that's the um, that's the overall background behind the use of data. So when you've got your data um, and you, in research, reproducibility is very important. Um, you need, but there are issues with data used in machine learning because it's not entirely reproducible because it's something that um, evolves with time and it keeps on learning. So the, the data, the meaning of the data keeps on changing. Um, there's also very little documentation, as Osha again explained. We don't want to do the documentation. It takes too long. So you don't have all the information that you need about the data to actually sort of reproduce what you were trying to do in the first place. The methodology is not really defined, it's not clearly defined. Um, and sometimes you've got partial data sets or the data set that you used, the participant decided, no, I don't want my data to be used anymore, please delete it. So when you publish your data set, there's a, there are missing bits in it, which is part of the, um, the issue. You also have sometimes where the data is completely gone. You don't know where it's gone. It was not used in the first place. You trained your model on it but you can't point to it again for people to reproduce it because it's gone. Um, and the environment has changed, your, the, the computing environment has changed, the program has changed, you might not be able to run the models again because the software is not there, doesn't compile, doesn't do anything or whatever. Um, and there's also issues where when you picked up the data from somewhere, from a repository, the um, the people behind it were a bit of uh, optimistic about what the usefulness of their data. Yes, it worked for them, but when you try to actually do something, it didn't quite work because it doesn't. The context is different. Um, there are also ethical ethical concerns. Does the data actually contain things that really shouldn't be there, or if you actually are going to do something with it, which is um, borderline something that you shouldn't. Um, so that's all the issues that you can encounter with um, data in machine learning. I press the wrong button. There we go. So regulatory background, as I said, this is um, quite a um, can of worms because there's a lot of things that one need to know. There's the GDPR, there's a lot of, um, legal um, frameworks in a lot of different countries that are all slightly different, um, although quite similar. Um, so it's something that you need to understand. If you're dealing with, your con with data from your own country, it's fine. If, but if you're dealing with other um, data sets from other places, it's, and if you want to actually publish in other contexts, it's, very, very wide, and there's a lot of different things that you need to take into account. Um, and um, what the harm that your data can do is also something that you need to take into account. You may not think that your data can be used for harm because you made, you made your research in good faith, you, can, you got your data to do a specific task, you never thought that it could get used for anything else. And on its own, it may not actually do any, it may not be able to be used for anything um, harmful, but um, with other data sets aggregated, it can actually be um, harmful. So, um, you might have each, I'm gonna skip through that because I read it. Yes. We, Correct, yeah. Um, so what are your responsibilities as a data processor with personal data? So you, the consent form is something we talked about, um, and you need to make sure that your users, which, as Osha said, it's very hard to do, are well informed about all the capability, all the possibilities inherent in, what you, in your research. You need to be fully transparent about what you're doing. Um, and keep people informed about it. 
don't forget that people have the right to erasure. And deleting data is something which is very hard to do because in all systems they have backups and so on and so forth. So the time to, but to delete, if it is even possible, can be quite long. So always think about this when you're actually storing your data, it's sort of deleting data is one of the hardest thing to do, funny enough. Um, modifying the data and always make an, a uh, risk and impact assessment um, for data processing. Um, internet property, generative AI, the data that you generate with that may not belong to you. It may, um, it may leak data as well, sort of thing. So that's something you need to be aware of. Um, and you may not have copyright on the data that you generate. That is Naruto, I don't know if people remember that issue, is when a photographer sort of went out, put a camera in, um, in the jungle to not um, harm um, the animals. And that little monkey showed up and looked at the camera. Since it was automated um, um, taking photos as, as there was motion, it took a photo of itself. At which point, um, the photographer said, well, I've made a really nice photo. And Peter went around and said, well, no, it's not you. It's that little chap. Um, they went to court, and the court ruled that actually, no, copyright is only for human beings. So that is the case in here, but that's also the case with machines. Anything that is generated by machine, the copyright is, doesn't belong to the machine, but it belongs to whatever things may have been behind it. And that's something you be very careful when you actually generate things from um, copyright. You don't know what it's used in the background. It may, be, it may belong to somebody else. So um, again, data generated with AI uh, has issues with um, hallucinations and the, it may or may not be accurate. So when you actually store that data, you still need to actually understand all the implication behind that. And it's in terms of documentation, don't overpromise what your data is. You might think it's, it's accurate and fully accurate or whatever, it might not be. And always sort of do a, um, an, accurate, uh, an honest assessment of what your data is. Um, let's get that. Uh, that's another example, which I, um, it's quite an interesting one, but we can discuss that later. Um, so once you've reached your, you've done your data, you need to curate it. Um, and what do you save? What do you keep? From your point of view, everything is useful. Fortunately, it takes a huge amount of storage. It takes a huge amount of documentation, in theory. Um, and so you need, and you need to, for fully documentation, for fully documenting your data, you need to go back to outside, do it from somebody who is not you, um, where you need to explain to yourself what you what you were trying to do, what you did, why you did it, um, so that the data suddenly has some history behind it. And it takes a lot of effort to do, and it's very time consuming. Um, and a lot of people don't like doing it. There is, outside of AI, there is the data audit framework, which is quite helpful in terms of um, that sort of thing, which applies here as well. You can actually use it, and it's, it's very helpful to actually sort of ask yourself the right questions about what you need to keep and how you need to keep it and what you need to know about your data and what other people might need to know about your data so that it can actually be useful for everybody else. So you've got um, several initiatives, the model car describing train model, um, train machine learning models. You've got data card describing data sets. Again, there's loads of tools that can be used to actually sort of do all this and help you do it. There's no one solution fits all for that, for that sort of thing, unfortunately. Um, so I've highlighted, um, the things to consider when dealing with data and machine learning. Um, there are 
as I said, not all best practice is already there. It's still um, a moving target. The legal frameworks are not there yet. Not all of them, because it's quite new and people keep on finding new interesting things to do with their data and machine learning. So this is something to watch and always ask yourself the right questions. And outside of that, you've got everything else. The storage consideration. Who's going to take care of your data when you've moved on to another job or whatever? Everything that is time consuming. Does your institution have the, um, the willpower, the, organ the, the organization to actually do this? Um, and how to preserve it to make it useful. And as I said, there is a, so we talked about the data, but the, the model themselves contain that data in one way or another. And through the, through the machine models, data and private data can leak. And there is a, the open source initiative, OSI, is working towards a document about open sourcing models machine learning models and releasing those in the context of the models have data in them that can leak. So it's all part of the same um, big adventure behind um, data and machine learning. Right, I think I may have overrun a bit, but there was a lot to say about. <laughs> Any questions? Um, yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, we have time just for a very short question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and uh, then we will proceed with a coffee break. Um, if you still don't have any questions, then you can maybe ask Greg during the panel discussion. And uh, yeah, so um, we have one, one more paper planned for this session. Yeah, um, this is Mr. Um, Albrecht Kurze, and he will present his paper, Understanding and Addressing User Needs and Implementation of Impulse Sensor Data. Yeah, hello. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Chair of Media Informatics, and I'm a principal investigator in a project called Simplications. This is about simple sensor data implications, especially for privacy in the home. And the work was created together with one of my master's students, Christine Reuter. So, to motivate the work, we see a lot of new sensors in the home, simple sensors, either in smart devices and home appliances or even pre-installed in homes. And when we talk about simple sensors, we talk about sensors for light, humidity, temperature, for example, everything that is not directly collecting pictures or voice audio. And the simple sensors collect typically big but thin data, big because they collected in vast amounts and over a long time, and thin because every single data point does not carry a lot of information. It's not meaningful on its own. It needs contextualization. And this contextualization can be done over time. And then even machine learning can, for example, interpret uh, the sensor data like light data that's uh, in the down, um, that towards a switch light. Um, but when it comes to human sense making, we see that these interpretations of human sense making are much more rich in terms of human sense making dimensions because humans use typically situated knowledge, knowledge about the home, the context of the home. And so they can reason about routines, about exception of routines, and also about people. So lay people in the home may not be data experts, but they are experts of their own life in the end also of data representing their own domestic life. And annotations play a key role here. They help users 
the one hand to reflect about the data and the implications you might create with the collection of the data in the home and they can also be used for training machine learning models for example and this brought us to our research question how can both approaches to automatic interpretation as well as the human sense making be brought together for lay users in the home and for time series recall annotations to research we use three approaches first approach is involving our own sensor kit and the annotations we created with it uh, number two is a review of existing annotation solutions suitable for simple sensor data and number three is our new development of a new annotation solution suitable for our sensor kit and our use cases so our sensor kit is a composition of hardware and software intended for in-home data collection it comes with a lot of simple sensors runs on open source software and on top of it is Grafana. We use it to give users the ability to interact with the data and meaning of data browsing through an included iPad and also to create annotations. And this way we not only sample sensor data from the home, we also sample parts of the context where the sensor data was collected. In form of uh, tasks we give users and annotations to users create on this task. However, uh, since Grafana is a cool software, it's not really usable on a touch tablet, uh, especially when it comes to annotation functions. So we decided to go for the annotations uh, with the built-in iPad tools in form of uh, screenshotting and drawing on screenshots and taking textual notes. This works quite well because we learned from the analysis of these uh, screenshots and the textual comments that people actually use this uh, sense-making dimensions that we have uh, seen in before from the literature that uh, they also use the features that uh, are supposed to be used so peaks slopes uh, special events etc um, however we also learned that a lot of these annotations are at least incomplete sometimes misleading and sometimes even wrong and much more stressful for us as researchers a lot of these annotations are very very messy so they differ in forms of uh, amount content concepts represented in the annotations um, between users but also within users so in the end we have a solution that is very usable for the users already it's very flexible they can draw every annotation they want but in the end it's leading to low consistency annotations uh, so we can learn from the user needs there but we cannot use it for learning in the machine terming uh, machine learning approaches for example so we also reviewed existing annotation solutions and came to the conclusion that these existing solutions they are named a few and there's a big table that we created um, are very good for creating consistent um, annotations however the um in most cases the aim for professional users for data experts not for the lay users and so they are not usable in our use case um at the same time they come with an overload of functions not needed for simple annotations um and they are quite restrictive in terms of the annotation schemes so for example you have either a point marking or a range marking when it comes to placing special symbols it's already some kind of restriction so we took this uh, as some kind of inspiration for our own work and in our own work we uh, decided to go on a new annotation solution in a human-centered design approach so right from the beginning starting with user interviews asking our existing users what do you need for uh, annotation what features do you really use what is useful and we found out the workflow is okayish, but a little bit cumbersome with going out to the external annotation tool, for example. But users really valued the flexibility that we have. So we created um, a first paper prototype that combines the strengths already in the first uh, system we have, taking features, features from the reviewed existing annotation tools and combined them 
to have a streamlined workflow approach directly integrated in our Grafana solution with a reduced feature set. We evaluated it and found out that most of the concept we have implemented works out quite well. There are some kind of uh, problems still with uh, differentiation between user generated text, for example, and free text annotations, but this is solvable in the end. And we aimed from the beginning for touch support. So what we are currently working on is a new annotation plugin for Grafana that allows a streamlined annotation like you have seen it in before to just draw on the existing graphs in Grafana with a pen or with a finger, whatever you have on a touch uh, system, but uses in the background the annotation API of Grafana. So you combine the strengths of uh, both previous approaches and allow users to do the annotations the way they wanted to give them overview, to give them structure. So in the end, also to create more consistent annotation. This is still in development. It's already working up to a certain point and we hope to have it ready end of the year. So we can evaluate it in our next field study, field study that is planned for beginning of next year. So to conclude, uh, while the previous and also the existing annotation tools have some kind of drawbacks either in flexibility or usability or consistency, we hope to uh, combine the strengths of both previous approaches and our new solution for our use case to come up with a solution that offers good usability, good flexibility, and also consistency of the created annotations. In the end, we hope to use it not only to train the data into a machine learning system, but also to use machine learning systems to analyze the created annotations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, the interesting talk. Um, do we have short questions? Very short ones. <laughs> so you're using um, Graphene API. Or you sa so is the annotation saved inside the InfluxDB? Can it be replayed in some way through Grafana, or is that something you need afterwards? Um... It is. Um... This comes directly out of the annotation API, so it is possible to be replayers. Cool. Thank you. Um, just briefly, I just wondered which sorts of lay participants you had in mind. And I ask only because um, we are working with people with Parkinson's at the moment and touchscreen interfaces are obviously, you know, a difficult thing for them. And so I just wondered what sort of, you know, what, what sort of user population you have in mind at the moment. So lay people are just ordinary people. So just um, anybody, we contact them no special anything. who is interested <laughs> in sensor data from their own home. Then we oh. go there with our sensor kit, it's in a small box they get a very brief introduction. Uh, it is like three minutes how to handle the iPad, how to create annotations. Mm -hmm. They have a small booklet for reading later on if, if they want. Of course Understood. they do not. <laughs> so it's anyone who cares about data. So anybody <laughs> here. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we can now proceed with a short coffee break. Um, yeah. idea than me reaching past your coffee um yeah we have um so we're going to try not to spill any coffee <laughs> um i'm sort of going to try and simultaneously chair and participate in this session which is an interesting problem um just a tiny little matter of housekeeping for anybody remote if there are any audio problems can you email um, perhaps Christina or Tio and we will have that looked at, okay? So um, we have a slide up on there which tells you roughly what we hope to sort of discuss in this session. Um, so fundamentally, very broadly, we seem to be collecting a lot of data and a lot of models. 
Um, and in principle, a lot of these things have become very large recently because instead of building lovely little compact models um, that run on practically anything, um, we are increasingly seeing people collect data uh, in order to produce these extremely large deep learning models that are much more difficult to characterize and explain. Um, and so we have these problems of what even works on what, where should we store it, what should we do with it, does it have any long-term purpose, um, who owns them, et cetera, et cetera, right? And obviously we have those same old problems that we've heard quite a lot of today about training and validation. So how can you tell if a system works? What data do you use? What validation do you use? What annotations are present and help you do that validation? So I will introduce myself first, and there's actually four of us. So um, Dagmar is also here from the University of Greifswald, but she is attending remotely. Um, so basically, I'm going to start off. You have briefly heard who I am. I'm Emma Tonkin from the University of Bristol, and I work in digital health. And I have something of a background in data preservation, having previously worked with various people like Issa and Tate and you know, on complex digital object um, preservation. There we go. Greg. So, yeah. Um, hello again. <laughs> <laughs> so University of Oxford uh, dealing with um, large computing infrastructure and large data setting, large data infrastructure. Um, previously did paleoclimate and digital health. So looking at the uh, currently looking at the infrastructure and what is needed for researchers to carry out research and running large models or small models and dealing with their data. Um, Thank you. Uh, hello again, everyone. And yeah, apologies if you're hearing my introduction for the second time today as well. Uh, so I'm Sasha Beckles, a research information analyst at the University of Bristol. Um, uh, and my role involves uh, providing support to researchers who are dealing with sensitive data. And uh, the part that's relevant for this conversation is uh, the input that I give them around um, preparing sensitive data for sharing and then supporting the onward sharing of that data through our control data release program. Uh, I have a background in health informatics uh, support um, uh, prior to my work here at the University of Bristol. So yeah, I've been dealing with kind of sensitive data in a sort of research context and particularly health research context for far too long. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's me, thank you. Well, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Sure. Hello, I'm uh, Dagmar Waltemart, only there remotely today, sorry for that. I'm a professor of medical informatics at the University of Medicine in Greifswald in the north of Germany. I have a background in computer science, database and information systems, and I've worked for a long time in bioinformatics on standardization of uh, data and computational simulation models for biomed biomedical systems and I've um, moved on towards more clinical research data management in 2018 as part of a larger German initiative called Network University Medicine where the national um, agenda is to establish data integration centers at each German medical clinic and these data integration centers are supposed to provide data exactly for um, tasks like machine learning, AI models, or any kind of analysis really, uh, where you where you need reliable, high quality, and well-managed clinical data for research purposes. Um, mostly in, in the clinical research domain, but we're also trying to reach out more to industry partners. And I'm one of the uh, representatives of the State Integration Center Network in Germany. Thank you. So I guess the first question I would ask everybody is, um, do we feel like we're doing a good job at the moment on management and preservation of machine learning systems and data? So just to you know, introduce with my point of view, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, so I asked um, when all of this arose kind of six months ago, um, I went on to Mastodon um, and, you know, the, the sort of <laughs> the, 
the the technician's Twitter um, and uh, asked all of my sort of data preservation pals, hey, you know, does anyone know about any sort of work in machine learning kind of you know preservation of machine learning outputs? And a couple of people said, oh, I, I think someone might be looking into that a bit, but, you know, no, no real outputs yet. Um, and at the same time, I've had the experience of trying to run data audit framework um, approaches and just found that there is just zero interest from researchers in order to get researchers to describe what they had on a share. I literally had to sin bin the whole thing and say, you're not getting the data back until you characterize it and then I'll give it back. This is genuinely a thing I did. I'm really cruel. <laughs> so what do you guys reckon? <laughs> I do. I, I like that approach. <laughs> if, only, if only I had the power to do that myself. Um, yeah, no, I think I would I would agree with that. I think there is uh, definitely a problem in uh, both kind of the documentation for uh, machine learning outputs and the data that goes into and comes out of them. Um, uh, and that's kind of, I think that's an issue, kind of whatever discipline you're looking in. Although I do wonder whether perhaps there might be places that um, learning could be uh, stolen from uh, with regards to uh, disciplines which have been using um, uh, large models um, and you know, uh, large scale computation for longer. So uh, paleo climatology um, uh, uh, and um, our paleo biology team at the university um, have been publishing large scale data sets which have been used for machine learning purposes for a long time. It's not sensitive data. so. It comes with uh, much less risk, um, so uh, the, they don't have, they won't be able to necessarily provide insights into that aspect of it. But in terms of the kind of um, documentation reproducibility side, um, yeah, there may be things that that could be adopted from from those disciplines which have been working in that area longer. So yeah, from the <clears throat> climate data and paleo data, the one thing that is actually quite useful there is because there are plenty of data repository already set up for this. Now, the metadata for it is actually quite annoying because each, at least in the UK, each data repository is um, subject specific. So if you're an oceanographer, you can store your oceanography data in there. If you're an atmospheric data, you can store it there. Um, when you're dealing with something in between or different time periods, so a lot of things is targeted for future um, data or for realistic data. In some cases, what they do in paleoclimate is they actually try something because they're never quite sure exactly how the system was worked. So they are trying, they are running their climate models on several hypotheses, which um, may or may or may not be accurate. They wouldn't know. At which point, the data, um, what's it called, the um, data repositories will not host it. And all of the metadata um, schemas around climate data is targeted towards future climate and always about real data, not hypothetical data. So it's, it's not a solved problem either. Um, and the language is slightly different. So some people will describe a certain period with a certain name. Another discipline will have a different, will have the same name for a different time period. So it's a complete nightmare. <laughs> Um, Dagmar? Yeah, maybe I can add um, from my experience. So I also think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, the, the, the questions that we particularly looked at are how, how well are machine learning models in the context of, of medicine are described currently and how easy is it to reuse them and uh, where would we actually find them? And, um, and there's really not much out there, but I see quite an interest in, in providing better guidelines for machine learning models because people need to quickly evaluate whether a model is um, of the quality they need uh, um, the model to be in order to apply it in a clinical setting. And there are a few reporting guidelines for machine learning models like um, there's a consort AI or spirit AI, decide AI. So these are different initiatives that try to to define the minimum set of information that you need to provide about a machine learning model in order to reuse it or to reliably um, 
judge its quality or uh, readiness or reproducibility. And uh, we've been looking into combining these uh, reporting guidelines with the FAIR principles, which are, uh, well, you probably all, all of you know the FAIR principles. They are the uh, guiding principles for data stewardship in general, and we would like to see how well they apply on machine learning models. And um, the situation is actually not that bad. The existing reporting guidelines are already covering a lot of the FAIR principles, so there, there is good guidance in how to provide good machine learning models, and I think it's a matter of communicating them and applying them. So I guess this is one of the major challenges that we that we have to um, to make these works more visible and maybe also to enforce adherence to these guidelines. And we've done that in, in systems medicine before. I, I told you we did a lot of standardization work in, in the bioinformatics systems biology field. And um, and you have to go and, and speak to the journals and funders and try to, to convince them to enforce or at least recommend and make very visible um, how these guidelines, uh, that these guidelines exist and that it helps scientists to adhere to them um, to get more of these uh, yeah, data sharing um, potentials to, to just make, make more out of those. Um, yeah, so I would say a lot of work to do, but there's many people who really are enthusiastic about improving the situations, and it's a matter of getting them together and um, also giving them some visibility, let's say. I guess in a way we've somewhat covered then the, the what information machine learners require in these different disciplinary areas to find the data, because it sounds like there's quite a lot of work in that. It's perhaps more a question of getting like a critical mass of buy-in, is kind of what it sounds a little bit more like. Um, I think I would say that maybe, I, well, I'm not in a single discipline because digital health covers a bunch of different disciplines. Um, so I think perhaps I would say that it's quite uneven in our universe, so perhaps, you know, sort of engineering data sets are very differently described. Um, but I definitely see that buy-in is quite an important problem. I don't have any personal insight as to how to support that buy-in, though, um, other than by either arguing that it will increase visibility or perhaps the good old, probably if you do this right, you'll get more citations <laughs> argument. Um, do, does anyone else have views on how to do that? I think you've hit the uh, nail on the head by saying um, you're not on a specific discipline. And I think that's one of the things which is common to actually all of us here is it's not a single discipline. Every time you're actually dealing with machine learning, you're actually crossing disciplines. So, okay, you, you're looking at the um, modelers, uh, the people who are creating the machine learning um, algorithms and models. But the data they use come from all over the place. And that's the main, I think, the main difficulty is that you need to have some insight as a machine, as a machine learner into the other discipline you're gr grabbing your data from. Um, and that's the difficult bit because you're dealing with, um, you know, mathematical models and that sort of thing. But all the data that you're using, you're not a specialist in. Um, and so you don't understand the health implication, you don't understand the private implication, you don't understand the artistic implication of what you're going to use your model. And that's what I was saying in, in my talk is sort of the data is something separate. Um, and so the multidisciplinary issue is actually a very big one, I think. Thank you. Um... Yeah, what occurred to me in terms of uh, uh, kind of drivers, uh, potential drivers for, for change um, is uh, riffing off what um, uh, Dagmar asked earlier about the need for um, kind of that top down pressure from, say, journals, uh, funders. I mean, in a, the UK context, we have a very big stick in the form of the ref. I know, I know. For all of its many problems. But um, 
you know, the impact that uh, the REF requirements had on open access publishing rates, um, you, you know, it, it had a huge impact. Um, the uh, uh, open access publication rate in the, at the University of Bristol, I think, is about 95% or thereabout now. I mean, obviously, it, that did come with a whole host of other problems in the sense that we're now just funneling vast amount of money into uh, article processing charges instead of into subscription fees but it's still going into the same pocket. So yeah, uh, it, as I said, comes with its own problems. But um, uh, these sorts of mandates about publication have an, have an impact. They have an effect on publication patterns and practices. And so therefore, if the um, the next ref, um, there is some indication that it's going to have uh, more, there's going to be more emphasis on, uh, on standard um, research output. So data sets, models, and so on. Um, and if that's the case, and if there's kind of support to help the panels appropriately assess those outputs and, you know, put uh, uh, weight on them, uh, then again, that could have, uh, uh, could help to really increase the, uh, the amount of those sorts of outputs that are um, published. And also, yeah, if, um, if we provide that kind of judgment criteria, uh, it will help people to, you know, th they'll, they'll, be required to publish models uh, and documentation and so on to that standard, which yeah will therefore help to raise the um, uh, the general standard of the, the data that is available. Um, so yeah, that that I think could be a really interesting um, factor for change. Although yeah, the ref is as I said something of a blunt tool. It has its uses, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think that could be interesting to see in the future. Uh, yeah, so uh, Dagmar. Yeah, I um, I have another idea. I think change could also be driven by uh, the team leaders and, um, you know, professors, institutions. And um, I know that uh, most, I mean, most institutions agree to, to, to the good scientific practices, open access, ETC. But um, I also know from personal experience, um, when I have a PhD student, her contract is running out, she wants to publish a paper, so it's all a big hurry. And maybe I don't insist on her um, to first publish a model code in an open repository and fix all the licensing and, and the metadata and the documentation, but we rather quickly submit the paper. But um, I think we could really, um, foster a lot of change if we were as as leaders were more consequent starting in our own communities and work groups like always require the data to be published to a data journal um, to publish the, the protocol of the works that we do in a journal that is specifically uh, collecting protocols like for reviews or um, we could also um, yeah require all the model code to be fully documented, annotated, and tested for reproducibility within our own group before we go and publish a paper about a particular model and so on. And um, I think if all of us who are ourselves engaged in these initiatives would do so, we would already change a lot. And there's another, um, another point in the whole scientific process where we can also take a big influence. And it is whenever we are reviewing um, a publication. So I don't know how many requests for, for reviews you get, but, um, and I know it's very time consuming already to review a paper, but what if we forced ourselves to also review the, the models that are submitted or described in the paper? And what if we just rejected all the papers that don't um, provide the model code in a public repository? Um, and I know this is hard and you have to, to, to go through a lot of discussions also with with colleagues and uh, and the editors of journals but i think if we were more consequent at these steps we could also um actually make big changes happen yeah the publishing the, the model code is um it's quite a tricky one because as i said earlier it's sort of Publishing the code is, doesn't, is, doesn't solve the problem that the code might not be runnable. It might be something which is quite um, bespoke and or even actually massive, like climate models, for instance, where you don't own the code. You own some of the um, 
some of the patches that you've submitted. Um, so you can publish that. I mean, I've, I've published papers where you actually point to the code and then, but no yeah. one can actually, unless you're a climate modeler and you, you're, you're used to running that particular model, you're not going to be able to rerun it yourself. <laughs> That's true. Okay, so, sufficient. Oh, no, no, well, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying information on metadata the, about the model. There are there are issues that needs to be considered, and put, so having the data available is one thing. It's sort of, but having us once we review the um the 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 paper and the data, being able to rerun the code or do something with the code or even understand the code is I think quite a big ask. Um, but it's it's it would be good if we could. <laughs> yes, and I wonder, I mean, if we if we say this paper is worth publishing or the results are um worth publishing, how we I mean we cannot test it for last large models, as you said, for different reasons. Um but I think we can take more effort in doing so, and and not and it's not true for all models in all cases. But I think there's often enough. At least I can say that for myself. Um, there's cases where I could actually require the data set um, and do the full testing of the model and see if the results reported in the paper really um, are correct. And I and I'm I'm running a course at. Greifswald University Medicine, where we discuss about reproducibility, and we all we take one paper for one semester, and we try to reproduce the things that are reported in the paper. And we've tried different papers throughout the course, and we always found errors. And um, so I think there must be a better way to do the reviewing. And um, I don't know how to do that, but uh, I think it would be be worth it because other people build on our publications and these errors are progressed across all the um, phylogeny of, of, of papers. And there's, there's been models in systems biology that were first published in 1970 and people um, built hundreds of models on top of these, but then there was this initial error in the 1970 model um, and we wasted so much time. I, I'm just, I mean, the idea world looks differently, and we all don't don't have enough time to do sort of a review. But then, on the other hand, what is all the publishing worth when we don't even check for for errors in the in the code code and the data set? Yeah, I I definitely agree that it's important to try to, well to try to improve our best practice in this. Uh, I guess I also agree that there are some difficulties because very often, you know, it's like, okay, well, here I have a Docker container or something. I'm going to release some Docker containers that do a thing. And, you know, maybe this year you can do something with them. Maybe in five years' time you might be able to do something with them. I don't know, you know. Um, and it's that classic problem of, you know, releasing a complex digital object or a series of digital objects and hoping that there is some sense to be made of them. Um, but part of that, arguably, so, so as a bit of a cynic about containers, um, I guess I would argue that something that we sometimes make more difficult for ourselves um, is we try to release things in such a way to facilitate convenience, but in so doing, we abstract a certain amount. And so we end up producing kind of usable objects that are some distance away from the foundational you know, model or whatever that we wanted to release. So we're, you know, producing something that is essentially an API to the thing that we wanted to release. And then as time goes past, that stops perhaps being a benefit and potentially starts being a problem in its own right and something that you need to unpick. But I mean, you know, here I'm just kind of complaining about architectural conveniences, I guess. So perhaps I'm not being super fair. Um, but I'm sort of thinking that short-term best practice and long-term digital preservation best practice are maybe really different some of the time. 
Um, but that's just a personal response to some of the things that I've seen. Incidentally, I should have said, if anyone, you know, kind of is like, oh, no, I have questions or I have an opinion about this, please do speak. Because I just realized I never said that. You are totally allowed to have an opinion too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> other microphone that you want to pass around yeah to yeah that would be a good idea um exactly um so can, I guess, can you hear, can you hear me yeah we can hear you yeah and the online participants can you also hear this microphone i hear this microphone yes okay i didn't get the other comment from the other side of the room that's fine. There, was uh, there, there wasn't. I just realised that. <laughs> I just realised that I'd never said. Um, so I guess a question that came to mind. Obviously, um, I, I, I definitely take your point regarding the ref, um, and in, indeed about uh, Dagmar's point about getting um, you know senior leaders essentially in the university to support these ideas. Um, so one question I have in this area is who influences these things because you know the ref to me just sort of pops down from i don't know up there somewhere <laughs> and i really have no idea what the procedure is that produces it and similarly sort of, yeah oh yes we should probably yes go ahead <laughs> sure yes sorry i should have done that when i when i raised it so the ref is the research excellence framework um which happens god every no, no it's more than that like uh, four to six years i think in the uk um and the idea is that it's an exercise to try and uh, kind of rank uh, research outputs from uk universities uh, and those rankings are then used to um disperse funding so yeah it's it's a big deal for uk universities um but uh one of the sort of uh useful outcomes from it has been that the mandates around the kind of research outputs that can be submitted for a uh, ref uh, assessment uh, has meant that yeah we've now got a certain kind of base level of open access publishing and 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 so on so yeah it's it yeah a double edged sword but um but but yeah it is a useful uh it it is it was part of the last one but um the i think it was all kind of research outputs that weren't research articles were basically less than five and possibly less than three percent of the uh, outputs submitted to the last ref so the aim for the next one is to increase that um i guess it would also depend on how many um data publication is available for each field i know it's it is a growing thing and there are quite a lot of um there are some disciplines which are fully supported in that in that thing where there is a lot of repositories or not even publications. So you have to write a paper describing the data. They don't publish the data itself. The data has to be published um, elsewhere, uh, but you have to have a publication which is not a paper. It's a data descriptor. And so that is a another journal kind of another publication. And that's a um, um, an output that points to data that usually is held in institutional repositories. Um, so. Making sense of that publication, isn't it? Um, because a, a data publication in itself is quite hard to sometimes demonstrate impact on and so forth. And so the obvious way to do that is to bring it back to look, it's basically a journal article or something. <laughs> and so that just brings it back to the familiar, I think. Is what I mean, that's, that's, that's actually in terms of describing the data sets and that sort of thing, this, the, the role of the data publication, the data descriptor, because it will be uh, or should be probably um, subject specific, then they can answer more in-depth questions about where the data come from and how it's been gathered and so on and so forth, which is relevant for the actual data itself, as opposed to the institutional repositories, which sort of cannot be data specific, but then you get a chicken and egg problem where the institutional repository would need a data publication to describe the data and the data, the data descriptor needs a repository to actually have to publish the data. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Anyone on the floor sort of uh, have anything to say? 
if you've encountered any issues with publishing your data or um well, that's a good question <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, we included uh, our data set as part of the paper, but <laughs> well, but but of course, on our side, we feel it's valid. But of course, it wasn't validated. I'm not sure if it was validated, but yeah. But on our side, we kind of validated because before we even collect the data, we have to go through some of the uh, the things you you described yeah that's good <laughs> so which journal was it was was it a journal that sort of um, accepted the data as part of it or um okay well my previous i mean the professor and my colleagues yes they've done that uh -huh. my recent one but of course it's still under review yeah it's, and that's, and that's yeah. I, I was more trying to figure out the um the framework under which it went because usually publications will want a paper and they sometimes don't have a space to put some data. So what sort of, uh, of publication course. sort of accepted the fact that you actually had as well data with your paper? Uh, that's actually no, actually they, they, they asked us to link the data since it's ah, published yeah, on another okay, website. Yeah. So we had to, to link the, yeah. okay. the other website. So your website data was and, held yes. in the so institutional repository. Yes. That provided some sort of DOI of some sort, and then okay, fair enough. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe I can also talk yeah, a yeah. bit about it. So um, we, for example, had the problem that we were not sure if our data set or the data set we collected is legally allowed uh, um, allowed to publish, so to say, and. Um, for this, sometimes you just don't have the right contact to ask, or it takes a lot of time to um, to get an answer to this question. And it's like you, you have gathered the data, did some experiments, you have the results, maybe you have published them, you want to publish the data, but it just takes too much time to um, to get to get this kind of um, yeah the, to find out if, if it's if it's legal to publish it. So that's kind of a problem what we have faced um, during our work. And uh, yeah, that, that's, so the question is, is there a way to speed up that kind of process uh, from, from your experience? Or should we really just go with the data publication? No. <laughs> <laughs> or at least with the aspects which we think are not critical, or should we always ask uh, a person who is responsible or who has experience with that? What are your thoughts on this kind of issues? I'm just going to start off by saying I wrote in the paper <laughs> that, that, that went into this um, that Pretty often my answer kind of goes, if I were you, I would start from here, uh, which is a really unhelpful punchline to a joke. Um, but it's also kind of a lot of the predicaments that I think we find ourselves in are because of all of the things that you sort of mentioned in your keynote, um, where we perhaps didn't include our thinking on some of these things into, for example, the initial project planning or before we got the ethics. Um, and indeed, all of those, you know, documents that you would suggest as sort of standard templates and all of those explanations that would have been super helpful to us as researchers. Uh, and in fact, I'd go even further than that and say something I think would be really, really helpful between universities and also incidentally between countries, because I don't see why this shouldn't be something streamlined within a discipline rather than, you know, sort of locally. Um, is a sort of joint understanding of how you approach ethics, for example, in Internet of Things. Um, because on the one hand, ethics processes from one discipline can seem incredibly onerous to another. Um, and on the other hand, perhaps they don't tick all of the boxes that we do need to tick for the specific discipline we are working in, you know, which in particular, in my case, 
because it is often Internet of Things, is really, really surveillancey. I mean, you know, really very much what have you got in your sock drawer stuff. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I would really appreciate, and that's one reason why I thought it would be great to get you guys talking, and you and Dagmar talking, for example, um, sort of seeing whether there are things that we could do to try and build best practices that even include this sort of thing into the ethics process a little bit more and streamline systems so that you don't first approach this problem when you're stuck, but you first approach the problem when you're conceptualizing the project. And so by the time you get there, you're like, yeah, no, I know this. Yeah, <laughs> this is fine and familiar. Let me hand on. Sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, it, yeah, I, I'm very familiar with the uh, I would have done it differently from the start approach to the um, to answering that question um, because yeah that is unfortunately the position that a lot of our researchers find themselves in um, the kind of uh, sort of institutional assumption of risk is is one approach and and I do wonder whether that sort of approach could be kind of scaled up to a kind of you know uh, local national disciplinary level. Uh, uh, so that, you know, if you had a, uh, a better kind of, uh, uh, kind of generalized acceptance of, well, okay, we have this historical data, which was collected with, you know, slightly fudgy terms. Um, but given the value in this scenario, it's worth being able to do these sorts of uses with it. And so, you know, we, as a collective of, a specific discipline or you know within a specific university or or or, or, or nation would uh, agree that okay you can use, use this sort of data in this sort of context for this sort of purpose um even if it's not exactly what the people agreed to originally um and i think those sorts of decisions could be made um at that kind of slightly abstracted level if you put quite uh, strict guidelines around the kind of context and the purpose um, the risk comes when you try and, you know, abstract, generalize that too far. And then you end up with, yeah, the sorts of situations that we've got now where you're just getting huge amounts of data scraping being used for anything. Um, so, yeah, so I think those kinds of uh, disciplinary guidelines and uh, an acknowledgement of the underlying risk and the, you know, what that means for the research participants and potentially for kind of, uh, you know, future research, because I think the longer this goes on, the greater the risk is that some sort of very significant data breach is going to happen, which is going to throw a spanner in the works of an awful lot of, um, you know, nascent uh, AI and, and machine learning work. Um, so, yeah, so I think it is something that needs to be addressed um, with the understanding that we're already in this situation. So we can't go back to the beginning and, you know, uh, uh, in uh, proper consent for the data that we already have. It may be something we could do for data going forward, but we need to kind of address the, the situation that we have with um, the data that's already out there, basically. And funny enough, I think we've been here before anyway, in, in the first place. That's what the what was called the data management plan um, at some point and now called the data access framework is it's something that because project needed more and more data and it was irrelevant, it was not machine learning related, it's just a huge amount of data um that was created or generated or simulated or whatever um the data man the data management plan or DAF now um was something to help people figure out how much storage they needed for their research um and a lot of people at the time basically went well you know that's complicated can't we just put it on the computer on usb drive or whatever um <laughs> yeah you remember yes so have i um and usually two or three years later oh yes i've put that in the usb drive let's let's plug it in and go so and eventually the at least in uk but i don't know if elsewhere in um, um in europe the fa founders for project insisted that research project include a data management plan in it, uh, which at first was taken as a, oh, do we really have to? Um, and it's tick box exercise. 
but it became quite useful because then they started, okay, well, we'll need that amount of resources. We're going to generate it. Started the thinking process because the whole point of the data management plan or the data access framework is to actually ask yourself the, the right questions about what you're going to do before you do it. And extending that to machine learning is probably the best way. And the reason why it got taken up is because the founders and uh, if you submitted a project, people insisted on that being part of the research application. And I think that's one way of doing it. We've been there before. It's sort of, it's just, yeah, it's boring. It's annoying. Uh, but in the end, it's actually very useful. And if we present it that way, saying, just think about it, you know, ask yourself the right question from the beginning. Don't wait until, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do that later. Sort of, no, no, just ask yourself for it straight at the beginning because you're trying, you're already asking yourself the right questions in terms of you have a research, just extend it a bit further because, you know, you're not making everything up as you go along, I hope. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, granted, research can um, slightly deviate from the original plan, but still it's one of those, yeah, sort of, um, I think we need to ask ourselves the right questions very early on and not wait for the last minute. Oh, I'm kidding. Um. <laughs> so I have a question then for everybody, and actually Dagmar as well, is who's run out of resources midway through a project and which ones? Because <laughs> I'll stick my hand up to having come into a project which didn't have a lot of money left and someone saying, yes, I think we'll need about a petabyte of storage. So <laughs> I've definitely been this person. <laughs> I just wonder if anyone else has. No, you're all really sensible. You all provision <laughs> adequately. <laughs> um, because that is the most obvious of the risks, I think, for me. Um, just of a university, I think very often they sign up to projects. And then these projects develop a life of their own. and They develop requirements. And I'm sure that... I'm sure you guys have seen this, people sort of rocking up with, hey, we've done the thing that we told you we were going to do. What are you going to do with it? And you sort of looking at this great big lump of data or whatever and thinking, hmm. <laughs> so, I'm sort of curious as to, um, so in a technical sense, I think the university probably assumes those risks when it accepts the project. I just want to I want to kind of wrap up in the next sort of 10 minutes or so ish but I'd love to talk a little bit about those risks and where those responsibilities lie and whether you know we as a panel and indeed everybody else feels that this is something that research institutions could do more for um, or whether or not the provision is adequate and indeed with you know with whom this lies so if a researcher decides they want to do a thing and a university says, sure, you can submit that grant proposal or whatever, you know, where do those responsibilities lie afterwards, especially given that the researcher leaves the picture long before the research data finishes its operational lifespan? So that's that's to everybody, really. <laughs> um, I'm going to hand over to Dagmar. Yeah, maybe I can uh, comment on, on that question. And I also wanted to, to just... Um, um also agree on on the necess uh, necessity to plan your research data management early on so we're also trying to sell uh, data management plans and they are indeed requested for larger um, grant applications in germany so i i've just heard about the data access framework and that data management plans are out of fashion so i have to speak to gregory after the panel about that, um, so so we actually um, try to to uh, to enforce or motiv motivate people who want to submit grant applications to also discuss their res research data management plan with us, and um, specifically at the university clinics in Germany, the situation is um, is quite comfortable because we have established these data integration centers who are the um, standard, pro, standard um, core units to provide, to provide clinical data for research projects. And we're trying to establish a workflow where scientists who 
apply for grants and they need a signature from the dean always have to come to us to the data integration center at least once to discuss their plans and then we can discuss with them about storage capa capacities that they need server infrastructures ethical and legal requirements when they want to share data with other institutions um, we can um, design the study protocol with them that has to run through the ethics committee before they can get any data out of the data integration center for the project. And we're trying to, to have these meetings with people really early on in their planning phases for grant applications and uh, to develop this into some sort of best, best practice. And I think I can see a change in our institution at least. So people just know whenever they want to do a research um, project with clinical data, they have to talk to us. And um, on the national scale, Germany has this research, uh, National Research Data Infrastructure Program, NFDI, which um, is, uh, is a very nice initiative, I think, to bring together ex expertise and competencies in research data management across disciplines. And the NFDI has sub-projects for each research discipline. So there's one NFDI for health. And that's actually the place where I recommend people who work with health data to go and get uh, help with legal requirements. So uh, the question about how to how can we publish the data? Are we allowed to publish this data with our publication? Please go to the help desk of NFDI for Health and ask these questions. They have um, funding uh, to to really advise you in those kind of questions. And I think we have to to send them all our questions all the time so that they can report on the actual need uh, to the government because that's the next thing. Uh, somehow people think um, research data management is not a big thing. Everyone can somehow do it. And uh, we really have problems to get funding for these base services at the institutions. So whenever you have problems and questions regarding your data management, please post these questions visibly so that we can also show that there is a real need to get basic services at the institutions on the local uh, level, but also on the national and international levels. I think it's really important. And uh, last thing is to just thank the UK for being such a, a good example, actually. I think you've done a lot in the country and you've um, a lot of you've gained a lot of visibility for these topics and and have done uh, very many good and interesting developments concepts so um yeah that's cool germany can learn a lot from the <laughs> 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 yeah, thanks Dagmar. it's really helpful that um yeah, so interestingly, uh, one of the things that jumped to mind uh, 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 to my mind was that uh, I think the UK has, at least when it comes to the influence of funders, taken a bit of a step back recently, and we could stand to learn from the uh, European Funding Council uh, uh, and their model for uh, data management plan requirements. Um, because recently, uh, the UK has moved to a new uh, uh, grant application system it's meant to be like faster, easier, simpler, or something like that. It's you know faster, worse, um, and so on. In in, in my uh, opinion, but uh, one of the outcomes of, of of this shift has been to uh, dramatically reduce the amount of space in grant applications for data management plans. Um, so they used to be uh, they used to vary across the all the underlying funding councils. Um, uh, and each funding council had its kind of templates and requirements. Um, and now uh, it's apart from the Medical Research Council, uh, they basically have shrunk that space to describe the research plans for data management to about 500 words, which is not enough for uh, even a simple project, I would argue. And it's certainly not enough for any kind of uh, complex project that's using, uh, you know, large scale complex data and, uh, and producing, uh, you know, uh, machine learning outputs that may have, you know, complex issues around residual data in the model and so on and so forth, as um, as we were discussing earlier. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's a big problem. And I think the uh, the European uh, Council model of having an outline data management plan and then uh, more uh, and then an expanded data management plan, which is a 
project deliverable at different stages through the project lifecycle is a much more useful one um, because a it means that that data management plan is going to be uh, truly seen as an active living document and developed as the project project develops um, and also the fact that it's a deliverable means that you know it, people have to deliver it um, so uh, yeah so I think that that is a, a much more useful model I'm hoping that there's uh, going to be steps uh, towards changing that direction in the UK but you know we shall see um, and the other thing that I uh, wanted to kind of wrap up with is um, the kind of other place that I see being as a sort of driver for change is the kind of wider research culture so this idea that um, collectively we are all kind of uh, we need to put more emphasis on research outputs, um, you know, data and models as research outputs and value them more. And um, I think particularly that comes to uh, light when it comes to peer review. Um, I mean, I think peer review is a kind of massively undervalued part of a researcher's um, uh, life anyway. Um, and there should definitely be more kind of time and space and uh, uh, allowed to that and more kind of credit um, for, for, for taking on those sorts of activities. But I think peer review of complex outputs like data sets and, and, and models and code is a kind of a step beyond even you know, peer reviewing a paper and allowing researchers the time and the space and again, the credit for doing that sort of work is something that's I think going to be really critical to making sure that we do have that kind of good quality um, uh, data and metadata on, uh, on these kinds of research outputs in the future. I guess my very last question is um, what I what I don't immediately see, and I always find this a little confusing because these topics have been um, a sort of background discussion in arduous for years. Like every year, someone will come up and have a you know have a conversation about privacy, and someone will come up and have a conversation <laughs> about you know what to do with completed data sets or models, etc. Um, and what I'm not sure about is where in an interdisciplinary sense, you know, thinking about machine learning outcomes generally, uh, where this discussion should be, because like machine learning conferences don't seem to be an obvious place, if you ask me. Um, I, you know, historically I might have said all oh, librarianship and information management conferences, but if they're still a thing <laughs> Um, because I kind of lost track of that discipline a little bit. And so I'm just uh, really briefly, you know, if if there if there were a place to share this, what would it be, do you think? And do you know of any already? <laughs> Thank you. There may not be an answer. No, I think she she's I don't know. Yeah. No, I don't know. Um it's it's difficult. I, I think it needs discussion on, on every level. And uh, I can only speak for, um, for for the medical field and in Germany. And I see that you can only um, achieve change if you convince the leaders of the of the university clinic. That's the place. If they get interested in your problem, they will they will sort it out. <laughs> but, um, but it's difficult to get them interested, and I think it, part of the part of the problem is that you it's so hard to to put things in numbers. So what is the you know what is the financial benefit of a data management plan and a grant application? <laughs> yeah, putting um, it, but it's true, isn't it? <laughs> or what is the what is the benefit of of uh, like, what is the, the gain, financial gain of reusing a machine learning model versus redeveloping it? So, um, yeah, it's it's all very you know very soft arguments, and and the clinic is a very hard business. I don't know. I keep on talking and trying to raise attention, <laughs> and um, uh, but I don't have a, a good solution. So if, if there's any suggestions, I'm happy to take some. There may just not be an answer to this. At least it's a problem and a solution. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it is still a problem because it's a discussion we've had for many years now. It's. Uh, 
At least we're asking the right questions. <laughs> Perennial, they're like weeds, aren't they? Perennial <laughs> questions. Every time you go to the garden, they sprung up again. Yeah. Anyone on the floor? Um, just one short comment. <clears throat> yeah. Um, do you think that bigger international collaborations might be a reason for uh, fund givers to say, okay, it's a very good idea to have this kind of uh, data management infrastructure built and um, really using best practices for um, for um, for data documentation and um, also uh, data management at all. So I, in my opinion, bigger cooperations between universities might boost a bit the awareness. I think. So yeah. what do you think about it? I think here the issue you're going to hit is legal is the legal framework between countries. Um, I think that's quite interesting. So I could really see like a network or whatever. I don't know what they call them anymore. It used to be network of excellence, but goodness knows what they're called now. Um, but, you know, like having some different case studies from different countries, maybe including, you know, kind of a couple of like European countries or something, uh, American university or two, maybe something within this sort of Californian sphere of we're almost GDPR honest, and from something that's very, very different, uh, maybe, you know, someone from Canada or something. I think it would be really, really interesting um, if there were a sort of appropriate international funder and an appropriate kind of uh, organization to support that network. I think it I think it would be great because not only would you pick up on legal niceties, but I think you'd also pick up on um, kind of cultural similarities and dissimilarities and sort of broad areas of agreement. Um, so I think that I think that would be great. I just don't know if there exists such a funder or such a solution. Yeah. 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 Are you done? Um, yeah, I, so so if it's not only um, that, I, I just wanted to say that maybe not only collaborations between universities, but also between international companies, let's say, where um, one of one or more of the project partners are universities, because in the industry, I think they also have like similar problems with data management, maybe not on this level what universities have, but uh, this might also be a reason to or um, a way to raise awareness. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. <laughs> um, anyway, about the, the co collaboration, I think with my group, we've already done that. So, so far, the data we have, part of it is from Mongolia. There is part from the UK, yeah, Denmark and China. And then the recent one, the, the paper I submitted, still under review, we did one, in, we collected data from Uganda. Yeah, so in other words, we, we're putting it together, but it's more for students, so still not international companies, but different universities. And well, we're making a catalog for, well, this data will be available depending. So it's basically the owner, the school or the university that decides the own the data, but then since we have the resources to collect this data and clean it, now they decide either it's theirs or they can get it out. But I mean, it's cleaned, now it can be tracked, the person or the students can be tracked. Then one other thing is, uh, I think Gregory said it, understanding the data. Now I'm getting back to what well, the discussion before. <laughs> um. So in, in our group, we have a number of different students. Uh, there is a sociologist and he's in charge of our data collection. Now, the first time he came, I was wondering why a sociologist is in the computer science department. But then I got to know this because it's like, for us, computer science, we just collect the data. And I mean, we can create the tools and he, he literally knows exactly what to collect and is it really infringing on the privacy of the people and things like that. So he will help us understand the data and how to clean it. So the same should be with all of us. If we're collecting medical data, I mean, we need something like a NAS or, I mean, different disciplines coming together will help us, I mean, clean 
I, okay, I don't know how to put it, but I, I guess you understand it. It's like we shall all understand the data and so that we don't really step on, I mean, beyond the line. But the only thing is as res, uh, what we are doing as researchers, we are interested in the end result, not the process. <laughs> and before we know it, we are coming back to do the process after the end, which is a problem. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, that's very insightful, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Definitely agree with that. Um, so, one question that um, I think has often come up in the past, although it's not explicitly here at the moment, is, um, you know, who would you include in your team if you could build like a dream team, working in this sort of area? Um, and often people say things like anthropology or something like this, you know. Um, and it's really nice to see when you know when there is that recognition that these very interdisciplinary teams can bring in expertise that, um, that, that really helps you overall and, and to see how those things, how those groups of people should fit together. Um, and I, I also think that that's another area of expertise that could really usefully be brought in. Um, certainly, I know that sometimes in projects, it can be difficult to get those interdisciplinary collaborations the way we would like them. Um, because for example, if you're, you know, if you're a hardcore machine learner, you perhaps conceptualize yourself primarily as almost a mathematician or literally a mathematician. Um, and so it can be, you know, quite easy to say, well, I take a lot of distance from the data and even more distance from the people in the data. It doesn't have people anymore. <laughs> it's just numbers and it has a right answer. And I'm going to demonstrate how near to the right answer I can get, for example. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, finding ways to maintain that connection, even if it's just so that you can include that in the analytic part of your paper. So, you know, very often we're like quantitative analytics are the thing because that's what machine learning does most easily a lot of the time. Whereas a lot of the time explaining our results takes qualitative understanding as well. Um, at least that's you know, personal opinion. I happen to like doing hybrid papers that contain both when the option arises. Um, but yeah, um, this, this is also something I think universities find quite difficult at times. Um, yeah, I think let's, let me wrap up. Any closing comments from anybody else? I think I've, I've rambled myself to a stop. Um, right. <laughs> thank you, everybody, and thank you, Dagmar. It is much appreciated that you could join us. And I do hope that we'll be able to have further conversations because, really, you and Zosha should get to know each other. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm following you guys on LinkedIn now <laughs> as a starting point. So thank you for having me and have a nice um, meeting, workshop for the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Right, everybody, I think lunch started a little while ago, and I believe it finishes, is it in half an hour, is it? Uh, Tio, do you have the Sorry. another hour? Okay, so you've got an, yeah. a whole hour to go off and see if they've got any food left. Yes, and at, Good luck, everybody. at, at 14 o'clock, um, yeah, yeah. We, we should be back for the next paper session. So maybe we should start. <laughs> I've got some echo, echo, echo. <laughs> yeah, 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 we'll believe. <laughs> so the first paper, so I'm, uh, Christina is, you, is chairing this panel, but um, since she's queuing for the coffee, um, <laughs> So let's um, start with her. Um, so our first paper for this session is uh, presented by Sumaya, who is um, from the University of Greifswald, and uh, talking about assessing large language model for annotating data in dementia-related text. Hi, everyone. I hope you all can hear me right. Okay. So 
I'm Sumaya, working as a research assistant at the University of Greifswald. So as you can see the title, uh, my talk would be on assessing LLM for the data annotation task. I think I... <laughs> Okay, so the aim of this study was to evaluate the capability of LLM to annotate dementia related text and that would be compared with human annotations and why we conducted this kind of study. Uh, we aim to develop a dementia related corpus that can be used as trained data to train name entity recognition model that can identify name entities from the written document automatically. So here you can, see, in this block, you can see an overview of the name entity recognition system. So from here, we can identify automatically important information in the text based on the labels. So, for example, in this sentence, my mother is suffering from dementia. So mother, this word is identified based on the labels PWD from uh, by using any NER model. So PWD, I am meaning that person with dementia. So I am using as abbreviation. And why we are using NER system? Because we, at the end, our goal that identified entities from the NER system will be integrated in our developed publicly available EDM Connect ontology to extend the domain knowledge. So at the beginning of this year, we, uh, the, we, pub, we made the EDM Connect ontology publicly available so you all guys can look, uh, can see our ontology from the, uh, from the link. And so let's come to the corpus. So our focus to develop corpus, but generally for corpus cor uh, development, we mostly perform um, data annotation tasks, but nowadays data annotation is very time consuming and very expensive process. So we would like to employ LLM that can generate faster and most cost effective annotations, though we don't know about the accuracy of the annotations. So that's our study. We want to see whether they can produce correct, um, correct annotation or not. Okay, let's jump uh, into the presentation. So I'll talk about data annotation, then I'll talk about LLM annotation, and then we'll be seeing the results and it would be in their summary and future works. Okay, so to perform annotations, in 2022, we designed an annotation scheme who want to uh, per perform name entity annotation, which data annotators and LLM will follow for annotating the data. And for human data annotation, we employ two raters who, who annotated name entity annotations. And due to time constraint, in this study only focused on name entity annotations. So LLM and our human annotator, they only annotated name entity annotations. And here you can see the labels which we use for our annotation task. So we use family care person with dementia, types of agitation, behavior, and cause. So these would be the labels which we would like to annotate. So yeah, and here this is an overview of our textual data, how our textual data look like. So we are working on this, we are dealing with this kind of textual data. So um, for this study, we collected around 45,000 sentences from online dementia forum. And due to time constraint, in this study, we have only selected 15 files with 1,534 1, sentences. So our human annotators and LLM both use exactly the same files, exactly 15 files. And as our data, contains personal information. So before performing annotation, we anonymize personal information with the tags because of the data privacy. So here you can see that my dad was put in an institution there 
the name of the institution was mentioned, so we just anonymize with the tags. Okay, so uh, first of all, to perform data annotation, we need to select labels, which labels we want to use. So we uh, here we selected label from the most frequent concepts of our EDM Connect ontology. Uh, so here you can see a very a small overview of our EDM Connect ontology. So here, for example, person with dementia, family carer, this um, this concept we are using as labels, and we are using as annotation code book for the data annotation task. And in the right side, you can see how our annotation look like. So in the first sentence, you can see aunt who may have dementia. So aunt is the this word aunt is being annotated using the label PWD. Okay, so now I'm jumping into the LLM annotations. <laughs> so <laughs> at first we need LLM. So we are using GPT-40 model, which is developed by OpenAI. And uh, this is study only conducted by using prompt tuning, prompt engineering without fine tuning the model. So in the prompt, we at first we fed contextual information. So in the contextual information, we fed our annotation scheme. And then we fed task description where the name of the labels and other tagging um, included. And then we, dev we mentioned about few short examples. So here we employ it. Uh, few short learning based prompt technique and we conduct, uh, conducted iterative experiments based on the prompt schema to determine the optimal LLM prompts. And after providing few short examples to the prompt at the end, we provided text charm which need to be annotated. And after feeding contextual information, task description and text charms, we are asking prompt to annotate this text charm using the few short examples and also using the label, which we already fed to the prompt before. And after uh, running the prompt, output generation, uh, output annotation are being generated from the prompt as we want to use annotation for the NER system at the end. So we are converting annotated output in the NER format. So um, the prompt schema incorporates IOB tagging, uh, tagging system, which is the general format for the NER system where the B prefix indicates the beginning of a chunk and the I prefix uh, indicates a token inside a chunk and O tag denotes a, tongue, uh, a token doesn't belong to any entity. So for example, in the right side, you can see uh, when we are getting output from the LLM is being converted in any other format. So for example, she is annotated by PWD with B with B tag. And in this way, screaming is annotated as verbal aggressive with B tag. B tag means beginning of the chunk. So here you can see the uh, two examples of the generated, out, uh, generated annotated output by LLM in the dementia related text. For example, in the left side, example one, the sentence is, I am dealing with my mother who has dementia. So LLM was able to identify I as family carer with the B tag and mother uh, they identified as person with dementia with B tag and who has dementia, this word doesn't belong to any entity. So they tag as O. Yeah, so now I'm jumping into the results. So here is a histogram, which is about the number of name entity annotation produced by the uh, human annotators and the LLMs for each, anno 
for each entity type, like which we used as labels. And what we found that LLM produced around 2,400 name entity annotations, where our annotator produced only around 1,200 annotations. So it seems that LLM produced twice annotation than the human annotator. So it comes to the accuracy that how they produce so uh, twice number of annotations. So we reviewed those annotations, LLM annotations, and we saw that in many places, LLM um, annotated, uh, in it, LLM produce wrong output. For example, um, for uh, PWD, LLM produce 846 annotations where human annotator produce around 500 annotations. And we saw that LLM incorrectly classified possessive pronouns as pro PWD. So possessive pronouns means him, her, them, they annotated. But human annotator only annotate he, she, and we also mentioned in the annotation scheme that we only want to annotate those informations like name of the person or he, she, they, but not him, her, them. But LLM also identified those things. So this is why we got higher number of annotations. And same trend we saw also family carer here, uh, FC denotes family carer. So same trend we see for the, for the FC annotations. And um, I can see about 80, 80 means agitations. So um, you will see um, human annotator only identified on around um, 20, 25 agitation uh, annotations, but whereas LLM produce, I think more than 300 annotations. And we saw LLM mistakenly annotated few words as agitation like hallucinations. But hallucination is not, uh, uh, we, we, we are not defining hallucination as agitations. In our annotation scheme, we, are defi we define hallucination could be the cause of agitations. So uh, if LLM could identify accurately, they could um, um, annotate hallucination as cause instead of agitations. So this kind of discrepancy we have seen. On the other hand, uh, for the uh, physical non-aggressive, this one and verbal non-aggressive, human annotator produce more output than the LLM. Uh, for example, my uh, if you look in this sentence, my father stopped talking to me and refused to communicate with others. So here, stop talking and refuse to communicate should be annotated as verbal non-aggressive behavior. But LLM couldn't able to identify this uh, annotate uh, these uh, these words. So we can. Mm, say that LLM really struggles to identify context in context dependent information. They ca we can use LLM for uh, like near to annotate name of the persons or something, but they, they struggles with uh, identifying complex and confusing text. So let's uh, talk about the statistical text. So here uh, we use Cohen's Kappa score and F1 score as a statistical matrix to calculate the interweighter reliability agreements between uh, human annotations and LLM annotations. Uh, for each files, for each files means for 15 files from F1 to F15. And we saw that the Cohen's Kappa score in average for 15 files was 0 0.48, which is not good enough. And highest level of the agreement we have observed for file 2 and file 10. However, neither the LLM generated prompts or the expert tracer reach a perfect uh, inter-annotator agreement. So we can say that relying on LLM for the annotation task is 
partially feasible, but uh, we cannot rely on LLM for entirely for this kind of annotation task. So what we are proposing, what we, uh, we can conclude that uh, we can assign, we can refine LLM annotators by the experienced annotator, which could, mm, which would help minimize the discrepancies, discrepancies between the rater and LLM generated name entity annotations. And as we will be refining LLM annotations, it might make the process faster than the completely relying on human annotations. So I'm just uh, talk, I will just talk about the future work. So in future, we would like to analyze, we would like to fine tune the LLM models to identify name entities and relationship in the dementia domain. So this study only focused on name entity annotations. Now we would like to see how LLM can annotate relationship annotations. And we also conduct, we would like to conduct our time loss analysis between the LLM and the rater for the annotation task to measure the LLM's time efficiency as it claims that it would be faster, but we don't have exact data how faster it would be. So we'd like to see this. Yeah. So that's the references, acknowledgements, and thank you for your attention. Does anyone have any questions quickly? <laughs> I was just wondering, um, there was one example you gave where you, uh, where it says, you know, my aunt might have dementia. And so that aunt then classified as person with dementia. Um, this is a little tangential because it depends, of course, on how you define person with dementia. Um, but it made me wonder, um, whether an LLM can meaningfully give a confidence ranking in, uh, you know, if it says, oh, I, I think this tag might apply, can an LLM meaningfully give a confidence ranking in the way that some um, predictive systems can, or is it not really capable of doing that? We haven't met such kind of study, but I'm feeling like that it will not able to put that kind of confidence by LLM. Because, as you say, is that even it was very uh, we struggle a lot because I worked as uh, for as an annotator, me and we Theo, we both worked for the annotation test, and it was very hard for us to conceptualize the model. Uh, and also, we had other annotators; both were confused in that part. In some, when we go through the textual data, there are phases where we got confused whether he is. Like who has dementia and who doesn't have dementia? Because we cannot, if someone forgets things, we cannot claim that he or she has dementia. So it's a very, I feel like tricky domain. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you end up with person with dyslexia, person with dyslexia. Yeah. So I've got a question. You mentioned cost. What do you mean, including the cost? Because LLM are very expensive. It's not. The... A cost means I'm talking about. Uh... I think your microphone is off. <laughs> there you go. I am talking about time cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you want to know about the price. So, for example, if we, I feel like if, if you assign human annotators for six months mm -hmm. and uh, using LLM, by, uh, for example, by taking subscription, I feel like in this case, maybe LLM would be cheaper. Like if we want to think only about the value we invest. Okay. Um, does, but that doesn't include the amount of money spent on training the model. So, yeah. So, um, my next question was do you run your own model or are you using a um, service online? Because you, you should be able to actually download and run the model yourself. Because if you feed all that information out, yeah, you might be leaking some private information. Some private, yeah, private yeah, information. Yeah. So this is why what I, I didn't use any publicly available GPT model. Okay. 
so because of the privacy thing because we we cannot use like we, we everyone can access public mm -hmm. one we cannot use but in, in later on in future as our guys fall our university has their they develop their own api mm -hmm. for the llm so we have planned to use that llm and check whether Good. they yeah. are working on or not All right. thank you very much okay thank you next talk is here which is already on um the screen. So still Stoev from again the University of Greifswald talking about variability and annotation over time. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, nice. Yes, so um as Greg mentioned, I'm going to talk about variability of annotations over time. And um I'm going to also give some provide you with some results on a short study we conducted. Um which resulted in a short paper, which we submitted to our deals. Um, yeah. So basically, let's start with the general annotation workflow. So I already mentioned uh, some of those, but I include them in the presentation anyway. So at the beginning, we have we usually have the um, the data set. Then we develop the annotation guidelines, um, which might be. Um, the, the the first iteration is always like uh, hard to 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 define the what exactly should be annotated and so on then we um choose the annotators um sometimes we we rely on experience so we choose based on if, if people have experience if they have interest and so on in the topic and um then they conduct the annotation with the um with tools which are suitable suitable for the annotation task at hand and uh, then we measure how good are the annotations. And this whole process is being um, is being refined and refined in an iterative manner, and it can take a very long time. Uh, the question is, however, uh, how do we measure what so the goodness of the annotations? And usually, we talk about uh, reliability of the annotations, and um, that's next thing. So, what what is the main definition of reliability? And I, I have here one definition, which is the extent to which an experiment, test, or any measuring procedure uh, yields the same uh, result on repeated trials. And we have also um, one station from Krippendorf, um, which is which is that agreement is what we measure, but reliability is what we wish to infer from it. So that means that reliability in the context of data annotation. Um, uh, can be understood as calculating the level of agreement on on the same data set with with given same instructions and same procedure and and same annotation workflow and um we also have um according to Krippendorf again three different types or three different uh, bigger aspects of uh, reliability the first one is called stability um which is the agreement between repeated annotations performed uh, by the same annotator on the same data set, but at two different pots, points at time, uh, which we also call um, intra-annotator agreement, or uh, in some other domains, uh, it's called um, in another way, like for for example, intra-rater agreement, or in intra-annotator reliability. So there are different um, definitions in the literature how we call that. Uh, uh, how we how we exactly describe stability, and we also have um, the other aspect is reproducibility, and uh, it's the agreement between several annotators on the same data independently. This is very important, uh, and following again the same annotation an, an annotation instructions and procedure. And this is what, uh, something what we usually call inter annotate an agreement in the domain of data annotation, and we also have the accuracy, um, which is we compare the the uh, the the outcomes of the annotation with some given standard or uh, with some expected uh, with some expected outcomes of the uh, of, of the use case or um, or um, or the domain. So, and um, now comes the question, of course, how do we measure measure the agreement? And usually, as uh, Sumaya already mentioned in her talk. We can take uh, F-score, which is harmonic mean of precision and recall, but we also can use some statistic-based measurements, like, for example, the coins kappa uh, score, 
which I provided here, like observed agreement minus expected agreement by chance uh, divided by one minus the expected agreement by chance. So this is kind of, um, we take in, in these statistics, we also take into consideration the um, this agreement by chance. And for the interpretation of the coins couple, we have also many different, uh, we have several different ways to interpret it. And I have provided here one of them. So basically we might have, uh, there are different level, levels of agreement given the score. We might have no agreement if the, if the, if the score is between minus one and uh, 0 0.2, then we have minimal, weak, moderate, strong, or almost perfect agreement. And of course, after the annotation, if, if everything goes well, we hope to have uh, a value of kappa of above uh, 0 0.9, which we can discuss if that's possible. <laughs> Um, and yeah, one question is, of course, why do we care about re um, reliability? And if we look at, if we look at some um, traditional machine learning pipeline, we get annotated data, then we have some feature engineering and create the, the ML model and uh, we get the evaluation and we see that, for example, the, um, the, the annotated data plays a, um, the, the most important role in the evaluation and the development of the moment uh, of the model. And uh, that's why when we have reliable uh, annotation, that means that we have a reliable um, machine learning model and it does what it is supposed to do in the domain it has to, um, to perform. And also we have reliable evaluation. Um, what we, turns out to be, in, in our opinion, one of the main limitations of most um, data set publications see that um, the reliability or the agreement uh, is measured, measured only during, uh, for example, the, the development of the initial annotations. And uh, it's, it's not well studied how this, or, or at least in the studies, the authors usually don't mention how this reliability can, um, can vary, it can change, it can change uh, over time. Of, of, uh, and especially longer periods of time. So we found some studies which, um, where they measure, uh, for example, the, how, how it changes over s several weeks, but not over um, years. Uh, but of course, annotations might evolve over time. And uh, for that reason, they also might have some effect on um, the understanding of the domain and also the resulted models which we train on the annotated data. So in our work, we co conducted a short study with a period of one, one year between, with, between two annotation rounds and measured uh, the variability in the annotations. And uh, we measured the intra and inter annotator agreement and how it, how it changed. And it's again, the domain of named entity recognition, basically what uh, Sumaya presented in the previous presentation. Um, so we had, um, here is a, a, a screenshot of the of the um, of our annota an annotation manual or the gui guidelines, and it's um, in the domain of dementia patients and dementia behavior. And it includes short introduction to the annotation project, some definitions, example, and also special cases to consider. So basically, the standard uh, what people would expect from a annotation guideline gu guidelines, and. For example, we have definition of family uh, family care and um, and the other um, and all other entities which need to be annotated. Exactly. Um, so, so I already talked about the data set. It's the same, basically a subset of this data set what we use for this study. And um, in total, we got eight entities, seven types of relationships, and we used. 11 files, which were respectively threads from, um, from uh, an online dementia forum. And um, overall, we had over a, a bit more than uh, 1,000 sentences and, and um, above uh, 15,000 words. So what, what were our, our results from, from this study? We, we calculated these scores. And as you can see on this graph, if you look at the, for example, um, the intra annotator annot annotation of the first person and the intra, -annot um, intra annotator agreement of the of the second person, which are um, 
here in blue and, um, and yellow. Uh, we can see that, for example, um, the, 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 the score measured as Kappa score is much better than um, is much better than um, for, for the named entities than from for the relationships and we also see that the first annotator achieves better stability in most of the cases so uh, the consist the um, one of the uh, the reasons is the experience of the of the annotator even even after one year uh, so we see that this that there is um, a big difference and uh, the second, the second thing, we, uh, the the second uh, um, factor we measured was the inter annotator agreement. And here we saw that um, the, the present scores or the the annotation, the inter uh, rate agreement in the second in the second run are are much better um, than than in the previous run, but they are still very very low. So um, basically, we see the improvement. Although both of the, uh, although not bo both annotators worked in this domain, which is uh, which is kind of, which was kind of interesting, and we also saw this um, in the um, not only for the not only for the uh, for the named entities, but also we saw the same effect in the uh, relationship extraction that we have more agreement between the annotators. And now the question is, okay, so let, let us see so how the annotations vary in terms of numbers of, of so uh, numbers of found entities by annotator one and annotator two. We noticed, we, sorry, what was also pretty interesting that the first annotator and the second annotator, they both found more entities and, um, and, 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 and more relationships altogether. In, in 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 the in the second annotation round, um, and we also measured the significant the significance in terms of uh, in terms of um, by by applying uh, a statistical test, and it turned out that uh, in um, for example there there was some statistical significant difference in the previous and pre present annotations of annotator two for three of the named entities. And uh, and and also for three relationship types, and overall it was uh, statistically different. And um, what we also found out that um, such uh, such significant difference was found also between the two annotators uh, in the, in the first run. So what is what are our conclusions from from uh, this experiment? Um, is that first we can we might have some statistical significant differences in the in the in, in the discovery of different types of named entities and relationships over time. Um, we have also a strong evidence that even after a longer period, which in our case was one year, but we we still haven't chance uh, haven't had the chance to conduct it in a let's say in a period of two years, but we would like to if we have the resources and we see that there is some. Um, that we can get better inter-rata or inter-agreement results, at least for the named entity, uh, for this named entity recognition task, which is in a domain that we consider to be um, to be complicated. And of course, very low intra-rater agreement. Um, it 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 indicates some. Some problems with the initial guide with the with the developed guidelines, so that means that, in our opinion, the best way um, to to see to, in, to 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 see these problems earlier would be, of course, to um, to calculate to calculate many iterations in the pre annotation phase. The question is, of course, how costly would such kind of uh, iterative process be at the end? And also, there is uh, the other effect that, of course, high variability might indicate that one or more annotators do not understand the task. And um, we saw some relevant uh, that in source, um, that in some relevant literature, there was the case that the authors came to the conclusion that that uh, the participants in the in, in the annotation phase were uh, totally distracted from the task 
So uh, such experiments, even in the long term, might, might show that if if um, if such uh, bias is caused by uh, distraction or uh, people not being interested in the domain, uh, might be um, when we conduct it in, a, in the long term, we might we might learn how to cope with such kind of discrepancies and let's say change the annotators. And of course, uh, another another conclusion is that we we saw that there was a very big difference in the number of entities and number of relationships which our um, which our annotators found over uh, after one year, and this might of course negatively um, affect the generalization of a of an ML model of a machine learning model, which is then trained consequently with uh, this annotated data. Yeah, so that was from my son. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, and um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you, dear. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, I do. It's just, it's it, it's not old habit or anything. It's just that I always do have questions. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, when you started this, are there sort of foundational resources that you picked up on that said, "Here is how you should do annotation validation" type thing? And would you update those guidelines? Uh, yes, we were considering annotating the the definitely the guidelines because we found out that. When we repeatedly read, the, so after after this period of time, after we read the guidelines once again, then we found out that there are different. There is actually some problems with them, which we couldn't, or we which we haven't thought about one year ago. So, uh, um, yes, we we tried to use uh, during the the first annotation round. We tried to use the um, we tried to apply some best practices iteratively. Um, working on the guidelines as well and um, annotating different uh, anno uh, files which were considered for the annotation and then compare and then sit together and discuss the differences. But it turns out that when the time passes, then our view of, of the guidelines and maybe of the domain changes. And especially if one of the annotators, let's say, uh, continues working on the domain, might have that has the indirect effect that uh, the annotations, um, at least the intra annotator um, agreement, might improve, might be improved, so unconsciously. What I mean, like um, for anybody else starting a new project with a similar type of annotation task, but not on the exact same guidelines, if you publish best practices, would they? differ a lot from the best practices that you picked up on when you started this and mm -hmm. would you consider writing a best practices document yeah like that? so so basically what um what i found on in the literature was yes do this iterative process but it wasn't mentioned for example for how long and if you want to you can invest like many years of time but for me this long term study showed that we should uh, take at least several months and do some uh, do the annotation uh, over of periods of let's say uh, one month and then one month later and so on so uh, intervals of, of month wise in intervals or yeah and of course um, one question which might uh, occur is how do we reflect these changes in the initial guidelines and if we have trained a model on them how do we what what should we do then? Should we then re retrain the model? Uh, and these are questions maybe for uh, general discussion in in this domain. So I hope I answered the question. Okay. So in Thank other you. words, basically, you need more time, some more funding. Uh, <laughs> yes, and that's the way. That, that's that's actually one of the reasons why um, Sumaya now presented also the LLM study. Uh -huh. Because we were hoping that, for example, uh, LLM-based annotation, yes, it might not be the best uh, case, but it might at least give you some baseline for what should be the what should be the uh, the what could be the um, the the reliability. Mm. 
So and and after and when you see that, let's say the the LLM model doesn't understand the instructions, <laughs> you might know that you might know that um, there are some problems with the guidelines. I know that that might sound a bit like. Uh, yeah, but then again, you're actually yeah. sort of tar targeting guidelines towards human, targeting guidelines towards a machine yeah. that has no concept yeah. of anything may not be that useful in that sense. Uh, you, you're spending quite a lot of time trying to understand what the machine yes. is trying to understand in a yeah. sense. Uh, it is a testable hypothesis, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right, I think it's panel time. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Christina, that chairs. <laughs> and do we have? Yep. And do we have people online for that? Um... <laughs> <laughs> Do you need the table as well? Because we had the table earlier, which was quite. <laughs> Put the coffees on. You know. <laughs> so bad. No, 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 no. It's just. Um, it does, it does feel weird sitting out there with the table, doesn't it? I know. You're just super organized. Uh, no, you are not. <laughs> With a photo of what it should look yes. like, yes. 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 We've all been those. I've seen those messages around Bristol. This is what it looks like. There's not enough at all chairs or anything from the photo compared to what it should. It is in there, but yeah. Whereas you should try and actually set up the thing. You have one, uh, no, two meeting rooms in one central square, which have kind of a computer in a cage and a screen that's not actually attached to the computer 99% of the time. And none of it does anything wrong. Like, can you not laminate a board and write out what the right solution is to get it all working? And just, like, just laminate a thing and say, plug this into here. And I'm like, that'd be quite simple. <laughs> and there's no point in being plugged in because you do talk to computer scientists all the time. And you still get some stuff, but you truly they will. Then you must know how to put it together. Um, so, am I being chair or anything around like stopping Christina from feeling? Yeah, and I'll wander around the place with the microphone if people okay, need to. That sounds, that sounds good. I see we've got people online. We've, I see yeah, Fernando. People online. Uh, um, hello. No, hang on. Hello. That way. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk to see if we can hear you? Uh, hello. Yep. Everyone? Hello, Fernando. Okay. Hi, everyone. Anyone else want to, want to, take, to check their microphones? Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hi, also from my side. Yep. Oh, Laden. So that was uh, Max. Um, so I'll keep the microphone if people want to talk in the. Um... Uh, so, uh, Christopher Ryan is not. No, he, he's not joining because um, Clash. And Fernando oh, is Fernando taking his place. Oh, well, his place. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, but that's uh, we were okay. about to do it. That's why. My apologies. No. Um, I don't know in which direction should I uh, look uh, for yeah, the people. The <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for, the, for the people who are online, do you hear us? Yes. Okay. Very well. So. Um, should I make the introductions and everything? Okay, very well. So uh, thank you for joining us for the uh, second panel session. This time we will be talking uh, on 
slightly different but related topic so the two panels sound a bit similar but not exactly so we will be talking about research data management from the ai perspective or basically about capturing data and annotation processing validation maintenance and preservation in real world applications and um as panelists this time we will have uh me and Emma here um, in person. And then we have, uh, let's see, how are you organized there? So uh, I, uh, so we have uh, Frank Kruger from the um, University of Applied Sciences, uh, Visma. Then we have uh, Max Schroeder from the University Library uh, of Rostock. We have uh, Fernando Moya Rueda from Motion Miners. And uh, do we have anybody else there? No, I think that's us. <laughs> so uh, maybe um, we can start with a short introduction session, basically introducing ourselves. And uh, after that, we can continue with uh, some questions that we have collected before the session and of course other questions that maybe uh, you have. So um, maybe I can start. So I'm Kristina Jordanova. I, uh, I'm head of the Institute of Data Science at the University of Greifswald. Um, I have um, long-standing experience with developing hybrid uh, artificial intelligence systems. That these are systems that combine symbolic or context knowledge with machine learning methods. And uh, I have also uh, a really long experience with uh, data annotation. Uh, I was one of the uh, people who started the Arduous workshop um, series and uh, Annotation has been very, very important for us over the years because, of course, we from uh, based on annotation, we also depend on the annotation that we develop, also the uh, tools that we develop depend. And uh, over the years, we have developed different types of annotation tools or machine learning tools or other artificial intelligence tools that are somehow dependent on the data. So uh, there is always the question how exactly we maintain these tools, what happens in the data that we are using in these tools. Do these tools uh, die after a prototype is developed or do we continue to use them? Is there a community for them and so on? And uh, this also uh, fits uh, the topic that we have in this panel discussion. Oh, um, <laughs> as primarily a sort of voice activated microphone stand here, um, I will admit to having created a few tools now and then, um, and also to having seen a fair number of them go away. Um, my experience of academic um, tool generation is that they uh, they tend to come along and continue for as long as they are a useful demonstrator or explainer or et cetera, et cetera. But it is reasonably rare for things to enter um, a production workflow, I'd say. Um, so, yeah, um, my background is pretty much of someone who's seen a few tools come and go. I think I'd put it like that. Um, so um, how about you, Fernando? So, uh, um, hello everyone. I'm Fernando Moya from Motion Miners. Um, I have been working also quite closely to annotation and development of co um, high quality data in the last years. Um, I am a PhD, or oh, well, I'm a doctor from the um, University of Dortmund. Um, working uh, long in human activity recognition and data with uh, sequential data for uh, activity recognition and normally applied in logistics. And right now, I'm head of research of motion miners and the company does optimization of manual processing logistics. And in this case, what we do is like we use models in machine learning for uh, predicting activities in, in uh, yeah, in a warehouse scenario in warehouses or in intralogistics. And 
Um, then kind of like lately and working strongly on how to get high quality data for industry application, because this is something that is very disconnected from what the researchers do in the communities and what the companies do because of lack of uh, annotation tools, lack of annotators, not guidance from annotations and uh, poor quality revisions, let's say in the industry. And also money, no, this costs money. And then something that at least in the last years I have been addressing this, uh, this issue. And yeah, kind of like co-working in the last years with uh, Christina and also Emma, also discussing on annotation tools and annotation data sets and so on. Yeah, thank you, Fernando. Uh, so maybe we can continue with uh, Frank, Frank Kruger. Hey, so my name is Frank. I work with the group of data science and machine learning at uh, University of Applied Sciences in Wismar. And uh, my group, we work um, basically with uh, provenance uh, of uh, scientific processes. So, so we track information about, um, yeah, let's say the entire scientific process. So how is data collected? How is data processed? And uh, at the end, how is it uh, yeah, published, let's say? And I have a, an opinion on the statement that Emma just uh, uh, gave. So uh, I think one of the reasons why the tools uh, that were developed in academia are not used uh, for a really long time outside of demonstrations is that they are basically not findable. Nobody knows that you developed a tool and that we can download it. And um, this is at least one thing I would say. And another thing is uh, um, more deeply uh, from the way academia works, because uh, if you develop a tool and you want to tell somebody that you developed a tool, what you do is you publish a paper about this. Uh, and if you now uh, uh, see this tool out there and want to use it and have to decide if you develop your own tool or if you, do, uh, if you use it, uh, you will never get a paper published about contributing to another living software. And um, that's the, that, that is one of the problems why uh, everybody it, um, implements their own software on the same problem. And I would say, if we at some point get to the, um, get to the point that uh, all the contributors to open source software and to scientific software uh, get some kind of impact or whatever, some, some kind of an entry in their uh, academic CVs, then this would change. I believe it, at least. <laughs> Very good point. I think round of applause for on that one from everyone here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Frank. So, uh, Max, Max Schroeder? Yeah, so uh, to not interrupt the discussion, I, I would uh, add also something to f that what Frank said. I will keep it short. So I'm working at the Rostock University Library and also have a background in uh, human activity recognition assistance system, uh, but now are very much engaged into the research data management um, yeah, community, so to say. And uh, yeah, uh, what I would like to add uh, towards that, what Frank said is that um, it is also sometimes not easily possible to reuse this software, which comes in addition. So, and sometimes, but uh, luckily this is uh, changing nowadays. People think they rather keep their software for themselves to have some uh, advantage uh, over some other working groups uh, because it's very competitive in science, we all know, and they think sometimes it uh, yeah, provides them an advantage. But luckily, this changes uh, recently and is keeping uh, on a change. Yes. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we have observed this over the years that some software stays in the research groups. And uh, of course, then there is the question, what is the impact of the software if it is used only in one research group instead of giving it to the community? Um, but also it's difficult to uh, convince to pe the people to make it open source. And uh, one um, argument 
always was here, but who is going to maintain this software when it is used from the community and no one wants to take over um, this responsibility. So uh, maybe this also uh, goes toward uh, the first question that I had, and this is how, what kind of development, but also maintenance processes we have um, for the tools that we are developing so that we can uh, use them, but also make them used, but by the community. Um, does anyone want, okay, Frank has an opinion. Yeah, so I would say uh, the point I just made is it. So if you get uh, something for your contribution uh, to open source software, then uh, it is more likely that you will contribute. Um, and uh, the other point of this thing is um, we can see this uh, in all open source projects uh, all around the world and not only in academia, that uh, all the projects are losing their maintainers. So the number of uh, contributors uh, is going down, the number of maintainers is going down. And I think um, we could prevent this in academia by just um, not being so uh, focused on um, paper publications, but also uh, software and other research artifacts. Yes, yes, this is a very good point, but I think this also requires changing at least in Germany the whole system how funding works and not only third party funding but also the internal funding of the institutions which is now based on how many publications you have basically and I don't think that a software is really uh, considered at all at least in the institutions that I have uh, Greg wants to say something yes um, basically and also the university at least in the UK have moved the sort of development to some different team called the RICs, um, which are not really associated with anything. They just write software and that's it. And they actually got created that way because the university didn't actually want to integrate them in the research side of things. So they actually created their own little group which is now really close knit as well because you can't get in if you don't do their thing. So they've created an another silo to actually to fight the silo that they were actually excluded from. Um, and I found that very sad because you know the academics and researchers and PhD students and whatever spend a lot of time trying to actually develop software for their own purposes. And I see in other institutions in Germany and so on and so forth, especially in the sort of climate area where they actually wrote the code and put it online and is used all over the place. Um, so it is feasible, it's doable and some people do it. It just takes a lot of time. And I think it's at an institution level, or even a research group level, wanting to actually sort of consider um, software analysis software because that's part of the research you know it's part of reproducibility if you develop software to analyze data you need to distribute that data so that you show that your analysis is valid um and so yes it's sort of putting that data online and so on and so forth and yes you've got the problem of maintaining it but if you if you're still using it inside your research group it auto it auto maintains itself because every single researchers will eventually use it if they get into the sort of process of okay i'm going to s yes i know sorry <laughs> you're cringe true some people would do and unless you've got one <laughs> one idiot who actually will take the task of actually fixing it for that for a year or two <laughs> so yeah but it is feasible it's just i think it is an institutional issue it is um Yes, there is a recognition problem, but it's there are examples where it actually works. So I think it it should work. Okay, so sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, just kind of jump off that. I think this. I think it's also a, a funding issue, a funding model issue, um, because it affects. Uh, it comes on uh, to into the data management, uh, data preservation side as well. Uh, in that the grant funding model is all about you have this block of money for this amount of time and you have to spend it at the end of that amount of time and 
the cost, long-term costs of maintaining that data set uh, or that software package are just going to be covered by the magic pixie fairies that work at the university. Um, and yeah, this sort of idea that, well, yes, you've got to create these incredibly value, valuable outputs and they'll just take care of themselves over the long run somehow, um, I think is the source of all of this pain, basically. <laughs> and yeah, some kind of like sectoral rebalancing or understanding that there needs to be more, uh, there needs to be some accounting for that kind of those long-term costs within grant budgets so that institutions can spread that over the long term and actually, you know, properly provide these things for the whole research community over the long term. Yes, yes, I totally agree. Uh, Max wants to say something, but maybe just very shortly. We have experienced this, at least in Germany, projects last for let's say three years and after the end of the project the funding is over the people working on the project are gone and the software is no longer used because there is no how there is no documentation and there is no funding for maintaining it so max yeah i also totally agree um but i think uh we have to we have to differentiate it a little so we know or well, what we already discussed is that of course it's important to search for existing software so reuse is a key requirement that is not yet uh, always done in that uh, yeah amount that it should be probably so of course we should check okay can we reuse some existing algorithms models data sets etc et and not always uh, start from okay we collect a new one and we develop a new model and so on and the other thing is uh, to be able to reuse it, of course, it has to be found, uh, which was already mentioned. So uh, fair principles are key to my mind. And um, we have to provide these and we have to provide them in yeah, good places where people from the community are able to find it. And a last thing um, towards, okay, if we are, yeah, so if we provide the data and the models in an open science, this is also something that is not yet always done. That is that would be great. And maintenance is the second part. I think that that, that takes a long time for it. So community building is um, yeah difficult, uh, as as Frank already said, also for for open source project and so on. So that that is the second part. But if we if we first achieve at least that the data and the models are open source and we also engage people to uh, yeah to search for existing things and try to reuse them maybe then uh, also the the maintenance and reuse becomes better uh, yes, I totally agree with you. And uh, but I have to say, from my personal experience, usually we first search for software, we find papers, but we don't find software, we don't find research artifacts. We uh, and at the end, uh, sometimes it works out to get it, but most often it doesn't work. And then we are faced with the really big challenge of doing everything ourselves once again. I think Emma wants to say something and then Fernando. Yeah, just really brief. Um, I've had the experience of trying to find ontologies sort of five years after a bunch of ontologies came out. Um, I was sort of doing literature review on ontologies at one point and um, the vast majority of them had disappeared off the internet. And it was because the funding sources at the time were associated to the domain names that people had purchased for the, for the, you know, for the project. And they'd put the stuff up at the time, you know, some of it had been picked up by archive.org. So I managed to rescue a few of them, but a lot of them had just disappeared forever into the electronic ether. So there were always papers, you know, oh yeah, yeah, we built this ontology of this and the other. Um, and it's exactly the same thing you're describing. So. Typically, when they start a new project with a student and they start with a literature review and they come to me and they say, but this has already been solved. Look, someone's written a paper that says they built one of these. And you go, great, go looking for it, you know, and chances are they won't find it. And if they do find it, chances are it won't run. And if it does run, chances are it doesn't do what they said. And that's really cynical. <laughs> and I don't want to be a horrible cynic about this. Um, but I do think that those are real problems. However, I would like to say that something universities could absolutely do is to reduce reliance on external systems 
for storing. So absolutely have your own domain name. Why not? But also make sure that you have an in-house copy of that thing for good and long term. Don't assume that the domain name, don't assume the researcher will manage their own data preservation because they cannot. Right. And similarly, don't assume that because it's on GitHub or whatever, that it will be there forever because it will not. Fernando? Yeah, it's also, yeah, probably everything is connected and part of uh, lack of funding or lack of uh, finding the code online. But I guess also there is uh, as, as th this, this annotation tools or this data creation comes in, into, let's say, limited projects. The, the, the people who are working in it, usually PhDs and HIVs, they do not have necessarily the time for all this process of documenting, having everything annotated on the in web pages, in the Git, sharing the code, commenting the code. And this is a lot of efforts. And literally everyone is, is thinking, okay, we document it with a paper, it's enough, or with a just a data set documentation. But everything about like how to use the tools, some instruction how to use the tool, instruction how to use the data set, this is barely put online. When we go into, at least in industries, also industries try to find, let's say, code online or data set that they can be used. It, there is there is only probably a code, code that is dead, but there is no file to to read. With what doesn't know where this data came from, how the code is working, even if the annotation tool is there, is barely like said how people should use it. And it sounds funny, but when people are industry and university, they want to use this, they need to have these instructions. No one cannot assume that people will know it directly. Oh, I can just open a tool, just click here, click there, and download my annotation data or work label in that. You need to have instructions. But this is hardly done. P PhDs or people in the university don't have the time for that. Like, it's barely uh, cons consider this as an effort when you create annotation tools. Yes, this is indeed a big problem, and uh, that's why it's called also <laughs> research, a research code. <laughs> but we all know the problem. Um, Frank? Yeah, so, so my thing now. So the first thing, um, what Fernando just said, is uh, there's no time to document your software. The question is, what's the value of the software if it's not documented? If there is no code documentation, if there is no user documentation. So uh, somebody has to do it. Otherwise, it's, it just makes no sense to, to publish it. The next thing is um, you said um, finding software is hard. And this is totally correct. Nobody, nobody knows about the software. And um, apart from uh, just searching for software, I, I think one of the issues is um, that software citations are not uh, mm. are not used that well. So I, I'm I'm a bit into software, so that's why I uh, I focus on on software. But I, I think it's true for for data also. So but for software citation, I know, uh, or, or so for software, um, I know that um, people are uploading their software to GitHub or, or Codeberg or GitLab or whatever, and then uh, it rots, right? Uh, but what 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 you can what you can do is uh, you can connect it uh, for instance to Synodo, uh, then uh, you you will get a some kind of a snapshot. Or uh, there are initiatives like uh, Software Heritage. They um, they copy the entire repository, uh, give you some some kind of a unique ID, and you can cite it forever. And uh, they at least propose to uh, save it forever. Let's see what what the future brings. Um, but the point I, I want uh, to make is there's this um, software citation file format. I, I, I don't know if you know it, but um, basically, if you use uh, GitHub for your software, you can you can add a, a citation.cff file to your repository. Uh, you can um, uh, provide some way to cite the software, and uh, GitHub gives you um, an easy way to cite the thing because uh, there uh, magically a button appears uh, cite this repository you can click this and you get your bibtech or whatever entry you want and you can uh, pick uh, put it into your uh, paper and i would say uh, um, apart from funding and all the things that were mentioned uh, the researchers themselves should add 
the software they used for uh, the scientific investigations to the paper. And now there's one question I cannot answer. Where's the, where's the border between uh, software you installed and software that was installed automatically? What, what do you have to mention? But um, what we do is um, we at least document or cite the software we intentionally import it to, to our uh, environment. And then we, we, uh, we started creating some, some kind of a, a paragraph uh, at the end of the paper, software used or something like this. And then we describe all the software and try to, uh, try to use informal citations where we just name the software and the version and the developer and also try formal citations where we try to find a paper or fi find a reliable source to cite. Okay, that's it. I totally agree with you. I mean, it's also in the nature of the researcher, I would say that we would look for something that's citable instead of searching for software. Um, but yeah, I also think that it's the first thing it's important to publish it and then to cite it or to put it somewhere so that people can find it because uh, just putting it uh, at some repository is often not enough. Okay, Max wants to say something. Yeah, thank you. I would like to hook up this, uh, the, this aspect and think also that publishing, the, the question is, where do you publish? I think that is that is one crucial thing because what we recommend typically is to look for some domain specific and especially trusted repositories because these trusted repositories prevent uh, things like oh in five years the uh, data set is no longer available and so on so there are certificates such as core trusts here that um, at least um, yeah, what, what they they show that pe that the uh, infrastructure is uh, somehow thinking about what happens if we can no longer afford it or something like that. So um, it's it's it gives some level of trustiness. And another thing that I would like to mention also because we discussed something like impact and uh, it should be. Um, yeah, so data and software should be evaluated as one outcome of science. It also is yeah part of of all of us. So we are also in uh, yeah some some um, uh, yeah review uh, review uh, reviews involved and so on. And we might also look and highlight such things. So of course we are part of the community and might also sli slowly change the mindset and highlight such aspects. Yes, yes, I totally agree with you. I don't know uh, what kind of impact we could do, but uh, we can at least uh, try to do our part. And um, my personal feeling is, so uh, I don't have any empirical evidence, that in the recent, recent years it's getting better in getting access to research artifacts and research artifacts being published than several years ago. Um, but as I said, it's just my personal feeling. Uh, Greg? Yeah, I'm going to ask a question to the panel. Um, how many of you actually teach software engineering? not programming, software engineering, because looking at, oh yes, where well, we need to comment the code and so on and so forth, that's something that you can be used to doing um, and saying, oh yes, I don't have the time. I mean, when I was teaching some um, undergrads and postdocs, I was saying always code for somebody else, even if that somebody else is you in a month time or after holidays. And always people look at me funny like that, but they actually, it makes, when they came back from holidays and completely forgot what their code was doing, it kind of actually made sense. So that's what you meant. And yeah, it's, it's not, you know, the actual um, processes of, you know, loops and so on and so forth, but how to organize your code. And this is also important. And if you, if you write code like that from day one, it actually helps documenting it because you're already doing the work. You're already thinking when you're doing that, when you write your code. And therefore, I don't know, it's... So 
I think there are antithetical mindsets that exist between what we know is best practice and what we know is sufficient to get through one paper publication, um, honestly. And so that is to say that I think we very often teach that it is best practice to do all of these things correctly. And we know in our, you know, in our heads, in our heart of hearts, that these are the things that we should be doing. Um, and yet, very commonly, when people find themselves with a Monday deadline and it's Friday night, um, everything from I will have a look at the University of Stack Overflow um, through to, <laughs> you know, um, I'll just kind of hack something together real quick and solve the problem so that I've got a graph comes out and there isn't always the time. So I, I realize this sounds incredibly cynical and probably it is unpardonable, but um, I do recognize that people have very real limitations on their time. Um, and so I, I do think that part of this is down to pressures that we should apply that are more positive, where we sort of say to staff, you know, great that you got this, you know, this version in great now, you know, you should spend some time tidying it up, you should make sure you deposit it and we should have a place to put that, which is, you know, nice and safe and present in university systems and not lost and won't disappear when they stop being a student or whatever, you know. Um, and so that is, I think, something senior management can support, but something that very often isn't seen, again, you know, for, the PI, very often the paper was the deliverable and the all of the good outcomes that go alongside it are, you know, something you assume must have happened. But, yeah, possibly too cynical, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to agree with you. So um, I am trying, I have been trying to uh, a bit force my people to do some, at least some, um, software engineering when developing a code, but it's very difficult because there is always the time constraints. Uh, but I know for a fact, if I'm not wrong, that Frank is teaching software engineering. <laughs> so maybe he has a different uh, experience. Um, so I'm, I'm teaching software engineering, and uh, but it's in the second semester of the bachelor. So it's... Uh, really early uh, early students and I try to teach them to to document everything and, and cre create good documentation and so on and so on. But what I experienced um, when it comes to PhD based software is um, that if you give the time to the to the PhD uh, students, uh, they are able to create maintainable software. They are able to uh, create documentation and also uh, what we experienced is uh, that if you cite the software and if you publish the software uh, together with the paper, for instance, uh, people will ask you for, for reusing the software. And uh, of course, it is not reusable uh, for the first, uh, when, when the first question comes, but then you can, you can work on it, you can improve it. And we did it multiple times where we, where we improved the software, uh, where we improved the description, the documentation, and uh, and then people really reused it. And uh, this resulted in, of course, citations to the software, but also citations to the paper we did. And uh, of course, you're right, it's all about time. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, probably not only about time, because uh, you're also right that if there is some kind of positive output or reward for the uh, 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 doctoral researchers or whoever is developing the software, then they are also somehow uh, happy um, to uh, go along and uh, do the documentation and make everything much more readable, understandable, uh, and so on. Um, we have one question at the back. And then uh, Fernando, sorry, Fernando. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you. So uh, my name is Patrick Brunner. I'm from the Fitz Karlsruhe, and I'm also associated with the NFDI Across CS Consortium. And I just wanted to mention that this regard of software documentation, software publication, is really something that the consortium focuses around. Like it is one of the main goals of the uh, consortium to make research software artifacts 
uh, reusable according with the FAIR principles and um, using um, persistent identifiers, um, uh, establishing metadata standards for the computer science community um, and also with involvement of the computer science um, community. So in this regard, I think it would it, it may be helpful to um, come together and and uh, work together. Um, uh, I'm from a legal background, just to say that I have a legal background, so I'm no computer scientist, um, but um, it, it might be helpful to come together and, and uh, discuss these topics um, in, in cooperation. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, anyway, um, I'll go back to what Emma said that, you know, at times you develop something and you have a deadline. I mean, so once it works, you want to push it in. I, most of my time I've been developing software and to tell the truth, I don't like documenting. <laughs> That's a fact. You know, my professor, my professor is fighting with me to make a document, but truthfully, it's kind of boring. Okay, I'm not sure. But, you know, I get lost in my own code, but then, and the thing is, once it works, you want to leave it, yes, it has worked. And <laughs> there is that thing, once it works, leave it, don't tamper. <laughs> you know, you put your comment on, it's a bug. So, I don't know, maybe, you know, but this is the truth. So, like... Uh, there is something about the developer and the document that is a bit, <laughs> you know, and you see, you have to really uh, close this gap, but it's a bit hard. Okay, from my experience, documentation, we are not friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about others. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the research reality. <laughs> I, I solved the problem myself by actually writing the documentation in LaTeX. So even even the, writing the documentation is code. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fernando, yeah, I wanted to add regarding this work that Christina was doing, and probably that we have to incentivize and to, to the PhDs or to people, the developers of the of the code or of the data set to, uh, yeah, to give them something or to re reward them somehow in somehow. Uh, now I have seen many conferences that after, like beside the main track, after you get accepted your paper, your your uh, your results or your journal, they also starting to push tracks for fair principles, and they want to have like kind of like stamps that add to your paper would get published and say like we check the code so you have to send the paper you have to send the code you have to send the data and some results are compared they compare it and then they add it and this is after the the main track was accepted or after the camera ready so you have some time for to clean it up and i think it's like quite nice that some conferences they start doing that they understand that it's a factor of deadline for your main paper, but then you have some months, some 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 time for clean it up, and they put it and they add it before the conference. They add this stamp, and this is something that probably might incentivate and say, okay, you know, we have to clean it up, we have to put this reliable uh, code. It gotta be repeatable. Someone can use it, and not only me in my university, in my groups, but someone that check it and give me some something in regard. And I think that's quite interesting that I have seen in some conferences, at least lately. Yes, yes. So that's really nice. I also like it, but I have to admit, I'm in the uh, program committee of uh, Percom. They are doing this uh, artifact uh, thing and they check the software and they check the data sets and the scripts and everything. And then you get the batch and you get the citation uh, with your artifact uh, abstract. But we have also been discussing that very few people are ready to participate because it's uh, additional um, time and effort that you have to invest. And often the researchers are just don't have the time and the effort, don't want to put the effort, unfortunately. So uh, that's what at least in Percom have been observed, that there are uh, always fewer and fewer people that put effort into doing this, uh, uh, getting the batch that your software and the artifact is certified. But I don't know if it is only in this conference, maybe in other uh, conferences, they have other experiences. Uh, Max? 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to hook up the, the advice for the NFTI for computer science. There's also NFTI for uh, data science that are also uh, bothering with these topics. And I think it's really worth to check out um, their services and also their, their development and maybe actively participate in this discussion because they are domain specific and provide exactly these solutions towards reproducibility. That was the first point. And uh, I want to also uh, highlight two other things that were mentioned. So with respect to the uh, effort that has to be taken into account, I think nowadays the effort might also not be that high if you start from the right beginning. So uh, as an easy example, instead of uh, installing uh, your R uh, packages on your local machine, you can just use one command and start a Docker container where everything is in place and start your R analysis within that. And that's what I typically do. And then you are already two steps further towards a reproducible da data analysis. Of course, real reproducibility, we already heard that, is, is hard to achieve uh, in some cases, but it's, it's two steps that don't cost me so much in the beginning and pro uh, make the reuse much, much easier. And another thing is uh, use literate programming. So use uh, Quarto documents or Jupyter notebooks or something like that. They uh, often help also for data analysis uh, um, and just type in some documentation and not only source code. Of course, if we really talk about um, yeah, software products, uh, some, some very difficult uh, frameworks or something like that, that's a different thing. But for uh, yeah, analyzer scripts, I really recommend these things. Yes. Uh, so Greg wants to say something. Yeah, well, I was going to mention um, uh, Docker con containers because from the sort of um, HPC environment, more and more we actually sort of because installing software and maintaining software on an HPC environment is actually quite a lot of work. We have multiple versions of multiple everything, architecture dependent, and so on and so forth. And, so more and more now on national facilities, they don't install anything. They just have singularity uh, because we don't use uh, Docker because that really requires root access. Um, so they use singularity and basically the person come with their container, run the container and that's it and comes off. The problem with that now is to me from with a different hat in terms of reusability, now we, we're looking at containers as a black box the same way binaries were just a black box and we tend not it's a lot harder now to actually sort of inspect the code from a container point of view because oh yeah just run this it's fine and so we end up with the same problem we used to have with oh just run this executable it's fine we don't need the source anymore um, just to say that i think this is about understanding your build in this case, or more broadly, your sort of pipelines in general terms. And I agree that up to a certain point, having kind of pre, well, let's say pre-designed recipes is super helpful. And then beyond a certain point, the ability to decompose them becomes more convenient. So in an ideal world, we'd deposit the lot and we'd have the ability to reconstruct and then we'd have a very good understanding of what was going on under the hood at, at the time that we would choose to need it, which is never going to be never. Um, but that does require a lot of continuity. So it requires someone to deposit these things. Uh, it requires the ability to discover them later. Indeed, I agree with you. Uh, Fernando? You have raised your hand? No, that was a previous one. But <laughs> okay, then Max? Yeah, maybe to respond directly to this uh, argument with Docker, it's a black box. So what we typically do is uh, we provide a repository where there's all source code uh, in and where there's a Docker file if needed um, that describes what software is installed. And we only encapsulate the software inside the Docker container. So that's just... Uh, a mechanism to avoid 
people having to install 30 bunch of different software from a hundred of repositories. Um, and the source code is in the repository, which is just mounted into the container. So you have everything available, readable, uh, you can inspect whatever you want. And if you think that's fine, then you just run it. So that's the idea. Uh, and that, of course, does not solve all problems, but um, from our point of view, it makes uh, reuse a lot, lot easier. Mm, that's good. Yes, yes, totally agree with you. Um, okay, so uh, I don't know how much time we have because now it's uh, half past uh, three. We are, uh, wait, we are coming into coffee break or? Um, uh, exactly. So maybe uh, it's interesting, maybe as a conclusion, just to discuss first what kind of um, resources there are for recommending to the community, but maybe also roadmaps or processes that you are following. And finally, of course, what kind of communities or organizations are there that can also support uh, uh, this uh, type of uh, tools, maintenance, developing, publishing, and so on. Um, uh, we already discussed uh, two NFDI initiatives, but maybe there are other initiatives or organizations that we are not aware about. Uh, so Frank? The, the, yes, and just quickly, the OSI yeah. um, is trying to write something about open sourcing models. Um, and so they are writing drafts and I can share a link at some point because that's something that um, one of my colleagues at Oxford um, is heavily involved. Um, so that is probably something that is has an international scope, uh -huh. um, which might not answer all the questions, but might, might provide some um, good starting point. Yeah. And it's, it's it's an open area, so we, we they're actively seeking participation from stakeholders. Who I hate that word. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, Frank. So I also would provide some starting points. I think one of the best starting points for all those issues uh, are the NFDI consortia at the moment. So there are, I, I, I'm, I don't know the exact number, but I guess uh, about 20 different um, domain specific consortia and every um, consortium is um, focusing on the very same issues, but in other domains and um, uh, they provide uh, common services like uh, software.nfdi, which is supposed to be a software repository and a software database where you can discover software and so on. Apart from this, uh, there is the RSE, the Research Software Engineering uh, Engineers Group. Uh, there are some, there's a German chapter, I think, and uh, also there is this German Reproducibility Network. And I think it's also, uh, worth to, to look at it. Uh, when it comes to my personal uh, way of working, um, I al always start uh, data analysis and machine learning things with, uh, as Max said, with some kind of Jupyter notebooks. And once it is somehow running, I transfer everything to, to runnable scripts because running the analysis in the notebook is, is a bit uh, yeah, not 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 that easy because uh, it takes some some days or weeks and so on. So I, I I put everything into scripts. At the moment, I know it works, and this is the point where we start document uh, documenting the things. Um, and one last last point from my side, um, I learned to be reproducible um, uh, in the hard way because I uh, once had a student. Uh, that uh, created impressive results. It was really, really cool. And the paper was finished and I was just before submission and I wanted to check if I can reproduce the things, if I'm able to get the same results. And of course I was not, I never submitted the paper <laughs> and I changed my topic entirely. But, uh, and uh, this, this was the moment where I started uh, really uh, teaching my students uh, when, when you have a master's thesis, I want your code documented. Otherwise, I will not accept. Yes, yes, I totally <laughs> agree with you. So uh, I have to admit, <laughs> I have learned from Frank quite a lot about 
<laughs> reproducibility and writing scripts that check also what you are doing and you can reproduce your results so that you are not surprised at the end. So I totally agree with you. I'm also trying uh, to explain this to my PhD students that it's important to have scripts and that you can always rerun whatever you are doing and uh, you can get the same results. Um, Fernando? Um, also probably for, for, for at least for the closing their perspective on the industry and in the other side of the spectrum where the, like, there is a little bit more on resources and reproducibility is part of the product or something that has to be delivered or has to be sent is, uh, let's say, all the tools on Docker, all the tools on scripts, all the tools of um, replicating code, at least in the industry, there is a group. And there is, uh, there is a group that there is always revising code. There will be all, usually in perspective to create a tool for users that are not computer scientists. So this is somehow is forced to have documentation because we know that the user will be someone who just want to just click download and just click the tool, click the user, download the data, see the data, also see the data, like the people who are never used to to play with other formats. So there will be usually Excel files, the Word files, images, or videos. So the, the, that pipeline has to be documented. And it's because there is an intention that someone who is not computer scientist got to use the tool or got to use the data set. And this is something that probably as researchers in the universities and research, that we need to also keep in focus that we need we need to understand that probably will be application in other domains, not necessarily played with by computer scientists. And then we need to make tools or trying to make the tool from the very beginning for the conceptual part of the, or the designing of the tool or the data set that could be used by someone else that is not us, that is not a close group. That is, there will be other users. And this might help us, guiding us in through documentation and proper yeah, uh -huh. creation yeah. of data center tools. This is a very good point because uh, from an industry perspective, things work completely differently than uh, what we do <laughs> in research. Um, Max? Maybe uh, just the last idea of where you might learn how to improve your reproducibility is um, there are events that are called repro hacks. So where you can try to uh, reproduce another paper's um, yeah, analysis. And uh, not only that you give feedback to the original authors, you also learn yourself uh, a lot uh, on what is good and what, what where are missing information and so on, and you can adopt it. Yeah, thank you, Frank, for providing the uh, link. So we, we already had several events uh, here uh, at our uh, site and uh, they were always very good for learning new things or like some small changes just to make, okay, yeah, I'm missing this information. Okay, so I have to provide this also for my analysis. Okay, that's a really good point. So uh, I think I will contact everyone after uh, the workshop and maybe we can put a document together where we also I think there was making notes, but anyway, where we can uh, put our um, recommendations and thoughts together. And I think with that, I will be closing the session because it's already, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, after, uh, thank you very much also for all of you that joined us uh, remotely. If you are interested, stay with us after the coffee break because we have uh, Patrick Bruning who will be talking about uh, the AI Act and how it influences us, the people who are also developing uh, machine learning methods. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this is now, now the, the last keynote for today, the second keynote, and it will be presented by um, Mr. Patrick Bruno from the Leibniz Institute for Information Infrastructure, Karlsruhe, and uh, he's going to talk about navigating the EU AI Act. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for the introduction. So before we start, I want to um, uh, give, give a few um, um, 
give a few introductory notes. So what you will now hear is um, partly um, the AI Act in its, um, in its true form, but it is also partly my interpretation of the law. And as some of you might have heard, if you ask three lawyers of an opinion, you will get three opinions. Now that is true, and this is AI Act is very new. There's no, uh, there's no court rulings. There's no, um, uh, there's no very practical implementation as regarding the law. So I will try to give you my understanding of the law. It doesn't mean that it is um, that is set in stone, especially not set in stone. So you should take everything with a, I'd say, a grain of salt. <laughs> um, then also I will try to get you uh, give you an over uh, overview of the AI Act. I will address the regulatory approach, not the uh, technology approach, the technical approach. You are much more suited, much better suited in any way to address these. So please don't um, don't uh, try to to um, try to get me on this side because this will um, um, this would be a problem pr uh, for me. I, this is not my um, my my expertise. And also, if you have any questions, um, you can um, contact me um, after the lecture and also via email, especially for the people that join um, from distance. So now that we start about the AI Act, I want to talk about the agenda first. So I will give you a short introduction of the AI Act, and then I will talk about uh, the scope. Um, afterwards, I will talk about how the AI Act classifies AI systems and models, and then coming to obligations of providers and deployers of AI systems. I will not talk about models as much. I will focus on AI system in this regard. Um, lastly, I will talk about penalty, penalties introduced by the AI Act, and also um, remedies for persons affected and liability. So. Hmm. Doesn't work. Ah. Ah. <laughs> All right. So yeah. So now you've seen the agenda. Um, a short. So first, I want to talk about regulating AI. Um, what's all the fuss about? <laughs> um, so we have some some AI use that was very, very negative and had very negative impact on society so far. Um, quite a few, there's lots of examples. I will just give you a few of them. For example, in 2019, the use of a discriminatory AI algorithm by the D Dutch administration was uncovered, which led to thousands of parents um, being wrongfully accused of child care benefit fraud. Um, from 2017 onwards, a US-based company scraped facial images of people from across the internet to create a searchable database in relation to its facial recognition system without the people knowing about it. Um, in 2023, an AI-generated deepfake of an explosion near the Pentagon went viral on a social media platform, causing markets to briefly dip also, also in 2023, the, um, it was reported that workers of a renowned tech company revealed uh, confidential information by using a prominent AI tool uh, to help fix problems with their source code. Uh, in 2021, the BBC reported the testing of an AI facial recognition um, system intended to reveal the of emotion on the Uyghur mi ethnic minority in Xinjiang. In 2024, the New York Times reported the use of AI facial recognition program by the Israel military for mass surveillance of Palestinians in Gaza. So you can see the topic is very sensitive and it is certainly uh, worthwhile um, addressing it and it needs regulating. So now we come, we come to the next part, to the introduction of the AI Act. So I first want to talk a little bit about the legislative procedure because I think it is important to understand how this all came together. And to, to start off with that, I will um, talk about the first the ordinary legislative procedure of the EU, which um, goes as follows. So the European Commission is responsible for planning, preparing and proposing new re uh, European regulation. 
Then the Council of the EU and the European Parliament are the legislators. This means that for the proposal of the EU Commission to be adopted, adopted as legislative act, it needs the agreement from both the Council and the Parliament. Council and Parliament may make their own amendments uh, to the legislation, which then needs approval of the respective other. If both the Council and the Parliament agree to the amended legislative proposal, it is adopted as legislative act, in this case the AI Act. Legislative acts adopted under the ordinary legislative procedure must be signed by the President of the Council and the Parliament. Thereafter, the legislative acts will be published in the official journal of the European Union and enter into force on the date specified in the legislative act or if no specification given um, on the 20th day following um, that of their publication. So with regard to the timeline of the EU AI Act and the legislative procedure, what does that mean? In 2021, the EU Commission proposed the AI Act, which entails um, a, technology uh, um, a technology definition of AI systems and a set of rules tailored to a risk-based approach in relation to AI systems. In 2023, the EU Parliament and the Council of the EU reached a provisional agreement on the proposed AI Act, making several amendments to the version previously proposed by the Commission. In 2024, the, de um, the decision by the EU Commission was made to establish the so-called EU AI Office, which is part of the, as part of the um, AI Innovation Package, which should support AI startups and AI innovation and small and mid-sized enterprises. The AI office as um, for the commission will supervise the implementation and the enforcement of the AI. Also in 2024, the EU parliament formally adopted the amended version of the proposed EU AI Act. And then in, uh, in May 2024, the council of the EU also formally adopted the AI Act. The EU AI Act was published in the official journal of the European Union on the 12th of July 2024. It entered into force, as I specified before, 20 days after its publication. The application of the provisions of the AI Act will, however, be timely staged, which I will talk about later. So, with regard to the AI Act, what is the subject? Entschuldigung, yeah. wir haben kurz ein technisches Problem mit dem Livestream. Das Problem ist damit, dass die anderen die Folien nicht sehen. Nur eine Minute bitte. Entschuldigung für den. No, ask. Yes. I mean, yeah, sure. So you said like the uh, AI came and within 20 days it was kind of like official. Yeah. Question is like how do you make sure, like how do we check that it's implemented? Uh, so, yeah, yeah. So the implementation, as I said, the application of the AI, it entered into force. That does not mean that it is applied right away. But the application is timely staged. I will come into this, uh, come come to this um, in a second. And with regard to an enforcement and uh, implementation, as I talked about, there's the EU AI office, and then on the nationals. So for the member states, um, market surveillance authorities must be established, and also uh, with regard to assessments, which um, I will talk about later as well, there needs to be notified um, authorities and then notified bodies. I will not go into detail with the government system because it is uh, it is a little bit difficult to assess, and it would take a lot of time. And I'm already trying to cut it down, so it will hopefully fit my time frame maybe not uh, exactly um, but yeah all right perfect so um coming back to the um ai act so we want to talk about the purpose of the regulation and the purpose is to improve the functioning of the internal market promote the uptake of human-centric and trustworthy artificial intelligence while ensuring a high level of protection of health 
safety, fundamental rights enshrined in the Charter, including democracy, the rule of law and environmental protection against the harmful effects of AI systems in the Union and also supporting innovation. So what does this mean? Um, so what we will focus here for on the subject matter is the left side. So the EU AI Act regulates AI in the following ways. It, um, it has rules, um, harmonized product rules for placing on the market, putting into service, and the use of AI systems in the union. It gives prohibitions for certain AI practices. It gives specific requirements for high-risk AI systems and obligations for operators of such systems, and also harmonized transparency rule for, rules for certain AI systems, which we will focus about. The right side will not uh, focus in this presentation just for time reasons, um, but could be subject of another lecture so with regard so with regard to the definition of an ai system um, as i said before the ai act is following a technology neutral definition of ai systems um, other than the proposal of the commission um, the regulatory objects of the ai act are systems and models um, and an ai model is understood as a component of an ai system in, in the regulatory approach. However, there were, during the legislative procedure, there were many amendments to the definition of the regulatory object of the AI Act. So the initial um, proposal of the Commission from 2021 followed this definition. Artificial intelligence systems means software that is developed with one or more of the techniques and approaches listed in Annex 1 and can, for a given set of human-defined objectives, generate outputs such as content, predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing the environments they interact with. The Commission explains in the recital of its proposal that the AI system needs a clear definition for legal certainty, while also pro providing flexibility for future changes with regard to the technical development of AI. The definition uses a set of techniques and approaches to limits in, uh, limit its application. The, the techniques and approaches are mentioned in Annex 1. in Annex 1. So the Article 4 of the uh, proposal provided uh, then the Commission with the necessary authority to amend the lists, the listed techniques and approaches. In this regard, it should therefore be noted that this was a um, technology, uh, a techn technic specified approach. So with regard to the legislative uh, procedure, many amendments of um, many amendments were made to the to this to the proposal by the commission where i can i cannot get into all the details i will give you some opinions which will um, hopefully give you some idea of why the definition changed so the european economic and uh, social committee provided in its opinion in 2021 that multiple examples of AI techniques within the proposal were actually not considered AI by scientists and that the annex one in the proposal provided no added value. It therefore suggested an amended definition of AI, which would not pertain certain techniques, but rather focuses on the characteristics which human society assigns to AI systems. In 2023, the European Parliament made the following amendment, leaving specific techniques and approaches outside um, uh, this is, yeah. outside um, the scope of the definition for AI systems and instead introduced the requirement of a machine-based system. So, there were also opinions which would leave the technical approach uh, within the definition of AI, but amend it to a certain extent. 
The trilog ended in a compromise text between the European Parliament and the Council for the EU on the AI Act. This text was then published together with a corresponding analysis um, by the Council of the EU on 2nd February of 2024. It, it featured the following definition. Somehow this, yeah. It featured the following definition of AI systems. AI system means a machine-based system that is designed to operate with varying levels of autonomy and that may exhibit adaptiveness after deployment and that for explicit or implicit objectives infers from the input it receives how to generate outputs such as predictions, content recommendations or decisions that can influence physical or virtual environments. Now, um, as you can see, there's no specific techniques mentioned in this, um, in this approved and this amended um, definition for AI systems. Um, with this regard, however, it should be, um, it has to be further defined what, what this definition means. And therefore, I will give you some some um, key characteristics of AI systems, which is included in the definition, I will specify these uh, characteristics and explain them. Um, so, in this regard, it should be noted um, that the notion of a machine-based system refers to the fact that AI systems run on machines. I think that is obvious. Um, the notion of decide to operate with varying levels of autonomy means that an AI system has some degree of independence of human involvement and of capabilities to operate without human intervention. The notion that uh, they may exhibit adaptiveness after deployment refers to self-learning capabilities, allowing the system to change after its deployment, so while in use. The notion of explicit or implicit object means that AI systems can operate according to predefined explicit objectives or to implicit objectives. The notion of inferring from the input it receives how to generate op outputs refers to the process of obtaining the outputs, which can influence physical or in virtual environments and to a capability of AI systems to derive models or algorithms or both from inputs or data. The outputs reflect different functions uh, performed by AI systems and include predictions, content, recommendations, or decisions. The environment should be understood to be the context in which AI systems can be used on a stand alone, uh, can be used, can be operated. From the explanation from the EU legislator, it is understood that AI systems can be used as a, on a standalone basis or as a component of a product, uh, whether or not that component is embedded into the product or not. So it is of no importance in this regard. So another thing I want to um, I want to explain is the notion of general purpose AI models, even though I will not go into much more further details. But the general purpose AI model means an AI model, including where such an AI model is trained with a large amount of data using self-supervision at scale that displays significant generality and is capable of competently performing a wide range of distinct tasks, regardless of the way the model is placed on the market. And that can be integrated into a variety of down stream systems or applications, except AI models that are used for research development or prototyping activities before they are placed on the market. Um, so this covers, so the general purpose AI models covers models according to the recitals with at least a billion parameters and trained with a large amount of data using self-supervision at scale, which um, should then be considered to display significant generality and to competently perform a wide range of distinct tasks. These models can be placed on the market through libraries, application programming interfaces, um, or as direct download, for example. So I think we can step, skip this. Next one. So now I want to talk about the scope of the AI Act, which was already asked about. 
So the scope of the AI Act is firstly, with, uh, with regard to its applicable scope, the AI Act focuses on certain roles that can be fulfilled um, by, by persons. For example, and, and these are the two roles that I will mainly focus on, um, providers and deployers. Um, a provider, providers when they're placing or putting, um, placing AI systems or on the market or putting them into service or also GPI models and also providers um, where the output produced by the AI system is used in the union. With regard to deployers, which I will um, specify in a moment, um, the AI Act applies to those um, persons who have their place of establishment um, or are located within the union or where their output produced by the AI system is used in the union by them. So, so to give you an to give you um, a, a notion of what these um, what these uh, roles uh, refer to. The definition of provider by the AI Act means a natural or legal person, public authority, agency, or other body that develops an AI system or a GPAI model, or that has an AI system or model uh, developed and places it on the market or puts the AI system into service under their own name or trademark, whether for payment or free of charge. So, as you can see, with regard to the phases in the AI lifecycle, we have here the development, the conformity assessment, if necessary, and market activity, which I, um, which is is a term that I use um, for placing on the market or putting into service. With regard to deployers, the notion is the notion um, of deployer. Um, means any natural or legal person, including a public authority, agency, or other body using an AI system under its authority, except where the AI system is used in the course of a personal, non-professional activity. Depending um, of the AI system, the use of the system may, however, affect um, other persons other than the employer, which then should be constru construed as, as, non, as non purely prof uh, um, purely personal. A natural or legal person, and this is important to understand, can hold multiple roles. So they can be a provider if they develop the system and place it on the market, and then they use it. They're also the deployer. So, as you can see, there's these different phases in the AI life, uh, life, life cycle where these roles apply. So, then I want to talk about some exceptions of the scope, which I just uh, talked about. I will not cover all of these exceptions, but there are certain exceptions that are important within research, I think. Um, so, for example, one of these exceptions is where, um, where the AI system is released under free and open source licenses unless they are placed on the market or put in service as an AI system that is specifically regulated by the AI Act. I will talk about this also later. Another exception is where um, an AI system and model, including their output, um, are specifically developed and put into service for the sole purpose of scientific research and development. Another uh, important exception is research testing or development activity regarding AI systems and models prior to their place uh, being placed on the market or put into service and outside um, of testing under real world conditions. It should, however, be noted that in any case, research and development activity should be carried out with um, recognized ethical uh, and professional standards for scientific research and uh, must be conducted in, con uh, in accordance with applicable EU law and national law where applicable. Um, furthermore, um, without prejudice to the exclusion of AI systems specifically developed and put into service for the sole purpose of scientific research and development, any other AI system 
that may be used uh, to conduct research and development activity will remain subject to the provisions of the AI Act. So, as I said before, I want to talk a little bit about the placing on the market um, and the putting onto service. More about the placing on the market, because um, placing on the market means the first making available of an AI system or a GPAI model on the union market. The, there is a blue guide of the EU Commission on product rules, which um, also relates to AI systems as product. And with regard to the definition of the term commercial activity, um, this blue guide gives no explicit def definition, but it contours it implicitly. Uh, it states that a commercial activity is the provision of goods in a business-related context. So non-profit organizations may be considered as carrying out commercial activities if they operate in such a contest, context which must be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, taking into account the regularity of supplies, the characteristics of the product, um, the intentions of the supplier, and so on. However, also with regard to the requirements for national accreditation bodies in relation to product rules, the Commission um, implicitly refers to non-commercial commercial activity as a not-for-profit activity. The Court of Justice for the European Union, in a trademark-related judgment, however, in 2018, ruled that a commercial activity in opposition to a private matter is tied to economic advantages related to such an activity. The EU AI Act, and this is important, it does not define what falls under commercial activity. However, in recital 103, the EU legislator stated that AI components which are available under a free and open source software license should not benefit from the exception for these systems if they are monetized, which can, for example, also include support for um, ser uh, services or um, entry into a platform. So, with regard to the time application, which I said before, the AI Act, with regard to its application, is timely stage, staged. Um, the EU entered into force after, on the 20th day after its publication in the official journal of the EU, which is the um, uh, 1st of August 2024. So, this is the entry into force date. The application of the provisions is then staged in different stages with regard to the AI Act's um, content. Um, the provisions on prohibited AI Act practices apply from the um, 2nd of February 2025 onwards. The governance and enforcement provisions apply from the 2nd of, uh, 2nd of August 2025 onwards, as well as the provisions on notified bodies. The Provisions on GPAI models also apply from the 2nd of August uh, 2025 onwards. From the 2nd of August 2026 onwards, the AI Act and all its provisions are generally applicable with the exception of high-risk AI systems, which are safety components of products or are products themselves regulated by other uh, harmonization legislation listed in Annex 1 of the AI Act, such as machinery. So now coming to the classification of AI systems and models. So in this regard, I want to first talk about the so-called new legislative framework with regard um, to product rules. It's the EU, EU's latest comprehensive approach on harmonized product rules for the EU market. It follows the old approach and the new approach legislative technique, where the old approach for product regulation contained uh, detailed technical and administrative requirements introduced by national authorities for specific products. However, um, there is a court of justice for the European Union uh, judgment named uh, Cassis de Dijon, uh, where the court interpreted the, the law um, in, a, in a way saying, stating that um, Regulations limiting the free movement of goods within the community are acceptable only insofar as they are necessary in order to satisf satisfy mandatory requirements relating, inter uh, relating, amongst others, to public safety, protection of consumers, and fairness of commercial transactions. 
Following this uh, um, judgment, the new ap approach legislative technique uh, was developed, which limited a new regulation for products and a free movement between states in the community to essential requirements. Also newly introduced harmonized standards applied to specific products alongside the regulation, which then should lay down technical specifications with regard to essential requirements of products. Products that complied with the established technical standards benefited from a presumption of conformity with, uh, with the essential requirements laid down in the regulation. The application of harmonized standards is, however, voluntarily so that relevant economic operators, such as the provider or the deployer, may also apply other technical specifications to their products. But, in the, but then they have to prove that their implemented technical specification meet the essential requirements within the regulation. So the differentiation between um, essential requirements and technical spe specification makes it necessary to come up with a method of uh, measuring and regulating what is essential for products introduced and marketed inside the union. This has to be done outside of technical and therefore concrete specifications to the products. This is therefore then done by, evalu by evaluating a product on its associated risks. This approach towards essential requirements can, however, only be utilized in some areas where regulated products are sufficiently homogeneous for common essential requirements to apply and the relevant areas for products uses or of hazards are manageable through standardization. The new legislative framework then um, introduced some further amendments, among them, for example, the unified meaning of the C marking and uh, legal basis for accreditation um, and, um, and market surveillance. In this regard, it should be noted that whereas earlier product regulation focused mainly on the moment when the regulated product was placed on the market, the introduced market surveillance focuses on the whole life cycle of the respective product. So now coming to the so-called risk-based approach by the AI Act. So the risk-based approach for classifying AI systems under the EU AI Act features a four-level permit with certain AI practices being prohibited because they can contradict with EU values. Other AI systems are, or AI systems, which are considered high, may, may be considered high risk because they could have an adverse impact on the, as we talked about, health, safety, and fundamental rights of persons, and must therefore be regulated with more detail to ensure these systems are safe and used accordingly. Certain AI systems may pose specific uh, risks to persons if the AI system's operation or its output is not transparent to the affected persons. Therefore, the development and use of such AI systems is subject to specific transparency obligations. It should be understood that an AI system may be qualified as high risk and also fall under the application for certain um, AI acts with regard to transparency. Providers of general purpose AI models must comply also with certain transparency obligations since these models may form the basis of a subsequent AI system which necessitates understanding the model both to integrate it into another product and to fulfill the obligations associated with it. They must also put in a uh, policy to comply with EU law on copyright and related rights. General purpose AI models um, may also pose a, a systemic risk, which means a risk that is specific to the general purpose AI model and its high impact capabilities. For example, because of actual or reasonable, reasonably foreseeable negative effects on public health, safety, public sec uh, security, and, um, and so on. These risks may then arise through the entire life cycle of the model and are influenced by various factor, factors such as the conditions of misuse, model reliability, uh, model fairness. In identified risks involve, for example, the lowering of entry barriers with regard to weapon development and cyber vulnerabilities to the entry level. Additional obligations for providers of general purpose AI models with systemic risks are aimed at continuously identifying and mitigating such risks associated with the model in, 
and in securing an adequate level of cyber protection, where nevertheless serious incidents occur, reporting obligations apply. As I said before, I will now focus on AI systems, leaving general purpose AI models possibly for another lecture. So with regard to classifying AI systems, there um, I've created a table where you can see on the left prohibited AI practices, in the middle high-risk AI systems, and on the right certain AI systems to which transparency obligations apply. So with regard to prohibited AI practices, these include, amongst others, AI systems that deploy subliminal techniques beyond a person's consciousness or purposefully manipulative or deceptive te techniques, materially distorting a person's behavior by impairing their ability to make an informed decision, thereby causing them to take a decision that they would not have taken otherwise in a way that is reasonably likely to cause significant harm to them or others. While the placing on the markers and putting into service of manipulative AI systems necessitates intent, there's no intent needed with the, with, uh, um, in, in reference to the causing of significant harm. Another uh, prohibited AI uh, practice is AI systems used for social scoring, meaning the evaluation or classification of natural persons or groups of persons over a certain time period based on their social behavior or known, inferred or predicted personal or personality characteristics that lead to unfavorable and unrelated, unjustified or disproportionate treatment of certain natural persons or groups of persons. I would now go to the high-risk AI system. And a high-risk AI system is qualified as such um, for once if the AI system is a safety component of a product or is the product itself which is covered by union harmonization legislation listed in Annex 1 of the AI Act. And also, the respective product is required to undergo a third-party conformity assessment pursuant to union harmonization legislation also listed uh, in Annex to the AI Act. The union harmonization legislation listed in the annex covers safety rules for certain products such as machinery, children toys, cableway installations and others. With regard to the next um, part, AI systems that with regard to their intended purpose um, have a, um, may, ha may pose a high risk because of uh, harm to health and safety or the fundamental rights of persons and which are usual, uh, and which are specifically predefined in areas listed in Annex 3 of the AI Act are also considered. Um, these areas listed in Annex 3 include, for example, biometrics, um, critical infrastructure such as road or traffic or energy supply, as well as education, for example, when an AI system is intended to be used um, to assess the appropriate level of education that a natural person will receive or will be able to ac access, or for evaluation of learning outcomes um, by natural persons. And also another area, employment, for example, when an AI system is used for the recruitment um, or selection of natural persons to analyze and filter job applications and to evaluate job candidates. Another um, area that I want to specify is AI systems in law enforcement, which are also um, um, considered high risk um, and um, may only be used as so far as permitted by union law. So with regard to AI systems carrying transparency obligations, these are systems um, that directly interact with natural persons or um, that generate synthetic audio image video or text content and also emotion recognition or biometrics uh, categorization AI systems and so far as they are not prohibited anyway. Um, or AI systems that generate or manipulate image, audio or video content which constitutes a deep fake. So with regard to high risk AI systems, I would like then to talk about exemptions from the classification of high risk AI systems because there are some. So an AI system which is intended to be used in an area such as um, education or employment in Annex 3 of the AI Act is not considered a high-risk AI system if it does not pose a high risk of harm to health, safety or fundamental rights of natural persons, including by not materially influencing the outcome of the decision-making. 
Um, this applies where one of the exhaustive exhaustive conditions listed in Article 3, paragraph uh, in Article 6, paragraph 3 um, of the AI Act is fulfilled. These conditions are then the intended performance of a narrow procedural task by the AI system. In this context, the risk of an AI system qualified as high risk through Annex 3 is reduced because such a task in its narrow and limited um, nature poses only then a limited risk, which is not increased through the use of an AI system. That is the legislator's approach. Um, another, another exemption would be the intended improvement of results, which were previously, previously completed through human um, activity and which may be relevant for the purposes of the high-risk um, areas listed in Annex 3, again, as such, um, for example, employment and education. In this context, context, the activity of the AI system only adds towards the completed human activity, therefore lowering, lowering the associated risks. However, the problem is, how do you de determine when there is a human task which is completed and thereafter, an AI system comes into use. This must be assessed with regard by, by the courts. Um, another exemption would be the intended detect, uh, detection of decision-making patterns or deviations from such prior patterns without replacing or influencing the previously completed human assessment. Again, having um, human assessment as the major um, um, influence. In this context, the risk is lowered because the AI system activity follows a previous human activity which it does not replace or influence without proper re review. Last, there's also the intended performance of a preparatory task to an assessment relevant for purposes of AI systems listed in Annex 3 of the AI, um, AI Act. This makes the possible impact of the AI system output very low regarding the, high, the risk it poses for the following um, assessment. However, again, we have a problem with differentiating between the performance of a preparatory task and performing the main assessment. I will um, talk about this also later. If a provider of an AI system intended to be used in areas listed by Annex 3 considers the AI system not to be high risk, the provider must document its assessment before placing the uh, system on the market or putting it into service. The provider must also comply with certain registration obligations um, set out by the AI Act and with regard to an EU uh, database for AI systems. So now coming, now I want to talk about the obligations of providers and deployers with regard to AI systems. So first of all, we should talk about a general obligation that applies to all um, providers and deployers of AI systems, no matter whether they are high risk, whether they transparency obligations apply, or whether no specific further requirements um, um, apply. With regard to the general obligation of AI literacy, the AI Act uh, specifically defines AI literacy as skills, knowledge, and understanding that allows providers, deployers, and affected persons taking into account their respective rights and obligations in the context of the AI Act to make an informed deployment of AI systems as well as to gain awareness about the opportunities and risks of AI and possible harm it can cause. The AI Act obligates all providers and deployers of AI systems to take measures to ensure AI literacy of staff and other persons dealing with the operation and use of AI systems on their behalf. However, this uh, obligation refers to a best effort approach. So with this regard, it should be noted that as a deployer, it could be a research institution, it could be a university, which is obliged to, um, uh, to provide AI literacy skills to their staff and personnel using AI systems. Informatory measures should, for example, include a conscious handling of AI-generated output. For example, while AI-generated output may in certain instances seem conclusive on the surface, especially with regard to um, explanations, it will not hold up to a more in-depth review. The danger of the so-called anchoring effect is that people without a decisive opinion and the necessary knowledge will trust the AI, put, AI output that on the surface seems conclusive without any challenge. 
So in this regard, AI literacy needs to provide the necessarily necessary skills for um, for the people using um, the AI output, using the AI system um, to understand that they may challenge and that there may be erroneous results with regard to the output. So with regard, so first of all, I want to talk about high-risk AI systems and in this regard to the obli um, obligations of providers. So one of the obligations is compliance with the requirements for high-risk AI systems, which I will further specify in a moment. Another is compliance with accessibility requirements. Another is the indication of the provider's name, registered trade name or registered trademark, as well as the contact address of the provider on, uh, on the high-risk AI system and um, on its packaging or accompanying doc documentation. Having a quality management um, system in place, which ensures compliance with the AI Act is also an obligation. Such a system includes written policies, procedures, and instructions for aspects such as setting up a post-market monitoring system and having procedures for record-keeping of all relevant documentation and information. Another um, obligation is keeping documentation on a high-risk AI system after it is placed on the market. Um, there's also an obligation of undergoing a uh, uh, conformity assessment, which is necessary for high-risk AI systems before the AI system is placed on the market or put into service. Another obligation is drawing up a machine-readable, physical or electronically signed EU declaration of conformity for each high-risk AI system and keep it at the disposal of the national competent authorities. Affixing the CE marking visibly, legibly, and indelibly for high-risk AI systems is another obligation. Where this is not possible, the marking must be affixed to the packaging or the accompanying uh, documentation. Through the CE marking, the provider indicates that an AI system is in conformity with the AI Act and other union harmonization le legislation, legislation which provides for its affi affixing. Before placing a high-risk AI system on the market or putting it into service, the system must be re registered either in the EU database for high-risk AI systems or on national level. This registration obligation also applies towards AI systems, which by exemption, as previously um, explained, um, are not considered high-risk. An AI provider um, which considers or has reason to consider that a high-risk AI system that they have placed on the market or put into service is not in conformity with the AI Act must immediately take the necessary corrective actions to bring that system into conformity, to withdraw it, to disable it, or to recall it. Providers must also establish and document a post-market monitoring system proportionate to the nature of the high-risk AI systems. This includes processing relevant data from deployers or from other sources on the performance of the high-risk AI system throughout its lifetime. So now I will talk about the requirements for high-risk AI systems, which is one of the obligations under the AI Act. So with Regard to the requirements for high risk AI systems, these are specified in Article 8 and for the following of the AI Act. Um, their compliance must be assessed before any market activity, so placing on the market or putting into service. Um, and these requirements are the establishment, implementation, documentation, and maintaining of a risk management system in relation to high risk AI systems the development of high-risk AI systems, which make use of techniques involving the training of AI models with data on the basis of training, validation, and testing data sets, which meet certain criteria, uh, criteria. the drawing up of a technical documentation of a high-risk AI system before it is placed on the market or put into service, as well as, as the keeping up to date of that documentation. Another um, requirement is the technical functionality of a high-risk AI system allowing for the automated um, recording of event logs over the lifetime of the system. The AI system must also be designed and developed uh, in a way as to ensure that their operation is sufficiently transparent to enable deployers to interpret a system's output and use it appropriately. The design and development of high-risk AI systems in a way so that they can be effectively overseen by natural persons during the period in which they are in use is another requirement. 
This human oversight shall prevent or minimize risk for health, safety, or fundamental rights when the AI system is used in accordance in accordance with its intended purpose or under conditions of reasonably foreseeable misuse. And, uh, um, and lastly, the design and development of high-risk AI systems. Another requirement is that they are um, achieve an appropriate level of accuracy, a robustness, and cybersecurity, and that they perform consistently in those respects throughout their life cycle. I will now talk a little bit about data and data governance requirement. So you see here a picture, and maybe this picture will tell you something. Maybe you will guess what the following picture is. Um, maybe someone of you has an answer just right now. There's, there's a saying. I will, I will um, have the first part, garbage in, garbage out. Exactly. Um, so what does that mean in relation to AI systems? Well, the quality of the output of an AI system is determined by the input of that system. This also applies for the training, validation, and testing data. An AI system that was trained on bad data will produce erroneous and even harmful outputs. For example, an AI system which was trained on past employment data that was not carefully scrutinized and filtered beforehand may show biases in its output based on gender or ethnicity, which were included in the, in the training data. So with regard to the data and data governance, the intended purpose of an AI system means the use for which an AI system is intended by its provider. This includes the conditions of use as well as the specific context. To the extent required by the intended purpose, the setting of the um, AI system must therefore be taken into account. The AI system affects the setting in which it is used through its output. However, the setting also affects the AI system with regard to the possible input through which uh, the AI system infers its output. In this relation, the setting consists of the specific geographical, contextual, behavioral, and functional elements and characteristics which pertain to the intended purpose of the high-risk AI system. To determine which data sets are appropriate for training, testing, and validating the AI system, the provider must take into account the intended purpose of the AI system, which therefore affects the selection of the data set. These data sets must be relevant, sufficiently representative, and to the best extent possible, free of errors and complete in view of the intended purpose of the system. The data sets must have the appropriate statistical properties in relation to the intended use of the system. So, but what does it, that mean for the development of a high-risk AI system which is trained on data? For example, let's take an AI system which is used to evaluate whether uh, secondary school graduates from non-EU countries gain access to higher education within a German state for example, to a university. Now, according to Article 6, Paragraph um, 2, together with Annex 3, Number 3A of the AI Act, an AI system intended to be used to determine access to educational institutions is to be considered a high-risk AI system. If no exceptions to the classification as provided for in Article 3, in Article 6, Paragraph 3, uh, 3 apply, for example, because the AI system is not only intended to improve the result of a previously completed human assessment, but rather to assess the, um, the graduate's skills firsthand, the AI system is categorized as high-risk AI system. As such, it must be compliant with the essential requirements for high-risk AI systems before it is placed on the market or put into service. These requirements include data sets for training, testing, and validation, which meet the requirements set forth by the AI Act. The data with which the AI system is trained must therefore be relevant, representative, free of errors, and complete with a view to the intended purpose. Here, the evaluation of secondary school graduates from non-EU countries. To evaluate the appropriateness of the respective data set, account must be taken of the particular settings in which the AI system is used. In this scenario, this would include, among other factors, the formal prerequisites for higher education in the specific state, the necessary language skills for communication in German, and other elements or characteristics. On the other hand, account must also be taken on the concrete impact which the AI system output has on the environment. So, for example, whether the output is, possi uh, is possibly the only decisive factor in assessing the credit, or whether it is used in combination with other assessment methods, providing indications or recommendations. So, therefore, um, 
the training and validation and testing data sets must be subject to data governance and management pro uh, practices, meaning policies and enforcement appropriate to the intended purpose of the high-risk AI system. These practices concern in particular data collection processes and the origin of data, and in the case of personal data, the original purpose of the collection, data preparation operations such as annotation, cleaning, and aggregation, assumptions about what the data is supposed to represent and measure, data availability also with regard to legal implications such as data protection and others. To detect and implement measures against possible biases, the AI Act allows providers of high-risk AI systems for the exceptional processing of special categories of personal data, meaning, for example, uh, personal data revealing political or religious beliefs or ethnic origin under certain speci spe specific conditions which have to be met. One of these conditions is that effective bias detection and correction cannot be fulfilled by processing other data, also with regard to anonymized or th synthetic data. In this regard, it should be noted that um, the AI Act offers an exception within the meaning of the GDPR with regard to the processing of special categories of uh, personal data. So now I want to talk about the obligations of deployers of high-risk AI systems. So deployers of high-risk AI systems must take the appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure they use the system in accordance with the accompanying instructions for use to comply with other obligations under union law and national law and to keep the logs automatically generated by this AI system which are under their control. For, uh, for a period appropriate to the intended purpose, but at least for six months. A concept for such measures should be construed with the help of the respective data protection officer of the um, institution um, and also the information security officer to have an overall coherent approach um, for deploying AI systems. The deployer must assign human oversight of the use of a high-risk AI system to persons having the necessary competence, training, and authority, as well as the necessary support. We're coming back to AI literacy skills, right? Um, this corresponds with, um, these, uh, with these AI literacy skills. The deployer must also ensure that the input data, um, to the extent that the deployer access control over it, is relevant and sufficiently representative in view of the intended purpose of the system. The deployer must monitor the operation of the high-risk AI system on the basis of the instructions of use and, where relevant, inform the system's provider in accordance with the post-market monitoring system established by the provider. If the deployer has reason to consider that the use of the high-risk AI system in accordance with the instructions of use may result in the high-risk AI system presenting a, high, a risk to the health or safety or to fundamental rights of persons, the deployer must, without undue uh, delay, inform the provider or distributor and the relevant market authority and suspend the use of the AI system. These information um, obligations also apply uh, whether the deployer has identified a serious incident. The deployer of a high-risk AI system also has to use the information obtained um, um, by the provider to comply with the likely obligation to carry out a data protection um, impact assessment under the GDPR. Deployers have to cooperate with the national competent authorities and their activities with regard to high-risk AI systems. Where high-risk AI systems in areas listed by Annex 3 of the AI Act make decisions or assist in making decisions related to natural persons, the deployer has to inform the natural persons that they are subject to the use of the high-risk AI system. There are further obligations for deployers, which are much more situational, which I will not get into detail at this moment with regard to the time. Um, so... Another thing I want to talk about is the uh, information transfer as provided for by the AI Act. Well, many of the aforementioned obligations will require deeper knowledge by the deployer on their high-risk AI system in use, the deployer being, for example, a research institution or a university. The deployer may obtain information from different sources, which, which are, um, I have depicted here. With regard to a specific high-risk 
AI system intended to be used, the deployer um, should check beforehand whether such a system is affixed with the so-called CE marking. With the CE marking, as specified before, the provider indicates that the high-risk AI system is in conformity with the requirements for high-risk AI systems and with other union harmonization legislation, which, which provides for the affixing of the marking. If the conformity assessment for the high-risk AI system um, is carried out with involvement of a, a national notified body in accordance with the AI, the CE marking is also followed by the identification number of that notified body. The instructions of use are part of the essential requirements for high-risk AI system, and in this regard, must accompany any supply of such a system. The instructions of use contain relevant information for the target deployers taken into account their needs and foreseeable knowledge with regard to the high-risk AI system. This includes at least the information which is specified by Article 13, uh, Paragraph 3 of the AI Act. For example, the contact information of the prior provider, but also information about the specific um, high-risk AI system, including its intended purpose, which, as we've saw, seen before with data and data governance, plays a very significant role. In cases where the provider of a high-risk AI system has reason to consider that the high-risk AI system is not in conformity with the AI Act, they must take the necessary corrective measures. Where, an appropriate, uh, where appropriate, they must also inform the deployers of the high-risk AI system and other operators. <clears throat> Providers of high-risk AI uh, systems must register in an EU database established under the AI Act for these systems. This obligation also applies for AI systems for which the provider has concluded that the system is not high-risk according to, ex to the exceptions from the AI Act um, uh, for high-risk AI systems. The type of information for this uh, registration is also listed by, annex, um, by an annex of the AI Act and includes especially contact information of the provider and the registered high-risk AI system. In the case of an AI system exempted from the high-risk qualification, the registered information also addresses the grounds on which the exemption was concluded. There are also certain deployers which must register themselves and their selection and use of high-risk AI systems. These deployers are, high, are public authorities, EU entities, or persons acting on their behalf. The information contained in the EU database through registrations is, in general, accessible and publicly available. Certain areas within which high-risk AI systems may operate it are exempted from public disclosure, with only the Commission and national authorities having access to the registered information. These areas um, are law enforcement, migration, asylum, and border control management. So now I want to talk about a very important topic, and that is the assignment and changing roles. I will not talk about the assignment with regard to manufacturers of product, but the changing roles. Um, after, and this is after a high-risk AI system has been placed on the market or put into service. So while it is in use, in the, uh, during this time, the deployer, among other operators, will then be considered the provider of the high-risk AI system, keeping in mind all their obligations. Um, if they make a substantial modification to the high-risk AI system, which is already on the market in such a way that the system remains high-risk. The deployer will also be considered a provider of a high-risk AI system if they modify the intended purpose of the system that is already on the market in such a way uh, that, it's, that its status changes from non-high-risk to a high-risk AI system. It should be noted that in these cases, the new provider of the high-risk AI system has to comply with all the obligations for the provider of that system, which are massive, as we've seen. Um, the initial provider is then no longer considered the provider of the AI system. The initial provider, however, has to cooperate with the new provider and make accessible necessary information with regard um, uh, to the obligations. However, the initial provider is exempted from handing over such documentation for uh, AI systems if they clearly specified um, that their AI system is not to be changed into a high-risk AI system. So now moving on from high-risk AI systems to certain AI systems which carry transparency obligations. That transparency obligations mentions uh, do not affect the obligation and requirements for high-risk AI systems uh, talked about before, meaning that where an AI system poses a high risk and also falls under these transparency obligations, both 
um, the obligations and requirements for high-risk AI systems and the transparency obligations for these specific systems have to be fulfilled by the respective operator. So with regard to the AI systems and, and their use where transparency obligations apply, these are, uh, for example, AI systems which are intended to interact with natural persons um, and they have to be designed and developed by providers in such a way that the natural person concerned are informed that they are inter interacting with an AI system unless that interaction is obvious from the point of a natural person or uh, taking into account the circumstances and the context of use. There are certain exceptions towards this transparency obligation within the area of law enforcement. Providers of AI systems generating synthetic audio, image, video, or text contest content must ensure that the outputs of the AI system are marked in a machine-readable format and detectable as artificially ge generated. Ex exceptions are made for ex AI systems that only perform an assistive function for standard editing or do not substantially alter the input data provided by the deployer or the semantics thereof or in areas of law enforcement. The deployer of an emotion recognition system or a biometric categorization system has to inform the natural persons exposed thereto um, of the operation of the system. Again, exceptions are made in the area of law enforcement. The deployer of an AI system that generates or manipulates image, audio, or video content constituting a deep fake has to disclose that the content has been artificially generated. All the information obligations must be fulfilled in a clear and distinguishable manner and at the latest at the time of the first interaction with the affected natural persons or the exposure to the AI system in question and its output. So, moving on, I want to talk about um, protection of the status quo. That is relevant. We talked about the applicable scope, but with regard to certain AI systems which have been placed on the market or used um, before a specific date, they, um, they, uh, they are somewhat privileged. So the AI systems, which are components of large-scale IT systems, which were established by legal acts listed again in an annex to the AI Act, such as the Schengen Information System, and which have been placed on the market or put into service before the 2nd of August 2027, must be brought into compliance with the AI Act by the 31st of um, December 2030. The AI Act um, applies to operators of high-risk AI systems other than com um, components of the before-mentioned large-scale IT systems, which have been placed on the market or put into service before 2nd of August 2026, only if such uh, systems from the aforementioned date onwards are subject to significant changes in their design. Providers and deployers of high-risk AI systems intended to be used by public authorities must comply with the EU AI Act at the latest by 2nd August 2030. So as you can see, high-risk AI systems, which have been uh, placed on the market or in use before the 2nd of August 2026, must not comply with the AI Act if no significant changes are made to the system. This may be used by providers and deployers trying to speed up development and bring their systems on the market or into use before the 2nd of August 2026. So. With regard to the last part, I want to talk about penalties, remedies, and liability. So, talking about penalties first, the member states have to lay down, as specified by the AI Act, rules on penalties and other enforcement measures, which may also include warnings and non-monetary measures, which apply to infringements of the AI Act by operators, such as providers and deployers. And they shall take all necessary measures to implement and those uh, rules uh, taking into account also guidelines provided by the Commission. When it comes to monetary measures, the member states may impose administrative fines for infringement with the provisions of the AI through competent national courts or other bodies subject to appropriate procedural safeguards in accordance with EU and national law, including effective judicial remedies. So what are the monetary um, um, fines? What are the administrative fines? So for non-compliance with the prohibited AI practices, practices, administrative fines of up to 35 million euro, or if the offender is an undertaking 7% of its total worldwide annual turnover for the preceding financial year may be imposed. For non-compliance with obligations for high-risk AI systems um, and for AI systems, the possible 
Administrative fines go up to 15 million euro or 3% of the total worldwide annual turnover for the preceding financial year. For the supply of incorrect, incomplete or misleading information to notified bodies or national competent authorities in reply to a request, the administrative fines may go up to 7.5 million euro or 1% of total worldwide annual turnover for the preceding financial year. When deciding whether to impose an administrative fine and on the amount of that fine, all relevant circumstances of the specific situation must be taken into account. Certain aspects surrounding the situation must be regarded, such as, for example, the nature, gravity, and duration of the infringement and of its consequences, taking into account the purpose of the AI system and, where appropriate, the number of affected persons and the level of, dam of damage suffered them. In selecting whether fining a certain amount or a percentage of the annual turnover, the maximum fine is defined by whichever is higher. However, for small and mid-sized enterprises, the maximum fine is instead defined by whichever is lower, the amount or the percentage. Member, member states also have to lay down rules on to what extent administrative fines may be imposed on public authorities and bodies um, in, in their state. Administrative fines for EU entities under the AI Act may be imposed by the European Data Protection Supervisor. For infringements with provisions on general purpose AI models, the Commission may impose administrative fines. Oh. I should have... I should have... Uh, I should have showed you this before. Maybe you can take a picture. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I made this table to, for explanatory purposes. So we will now move on to remedies. And now, I, yeah, I have the remedies. So there are two remedies um, that the AI Act provides. The first remedy um, is the right to lodge a complaint with the relevant market authority. Article 85, paragraph 1 of the AI Act states that any natural or legal person having grounds to consider that there has been an infringement of the provisions of the AI Act may submit complaints to the relevant market surveillance authority. In this regard, it should first be noted that this remedy applies not only to a person who is affected by an infringement, but to any person that has grounds to consider the existence of such an infringement. The, comply, the complaint must be submitted to the relevant market surveillance authority. The AI Act obliges the member states to designate at least one market surveillance authority uh, for the purpose of the AI Act. For Germany, this could be the respective data protection uh, supervisory authorities or, for example, the Bundesnetz Agentur. For EU entities, the European Data Protection Supervisor acts as market surveillance authority, except in relation to the Court of Justice of the EU acting its, in its judicial capacity. Submitted complaints have to be handled in line with a dedicated procedures established, therefore, by the market surveillance authority and shall be taken into account for the purpose of conducting market surveillance activities. The second remedy is the right to an explanation of individual decision making. Article 86, paragraph 1 of the AI Act stipulates that any affected person subject to a decision which is taken by the deployer on the basis of the output from a high risk AI system listed in Annex 3. Um, with the exception of critical infrastructure, and which produces legal effects or similarly significantly affects that person in a way that they consider to have an adverse impact on their health, safety, or fundamental rights, has the right to obtain from the deployer clear and meaningful explanations of the role of the AI system in the decision-making procedure and the main elements of the decision taken. This right... Um, does not apply to the use of AI systems for which exceptions from or restrictions to the aforementioned explanation obligation of the deployer follow from union or national law that complies um, uh, with union law. It is important to, dif to differentiate between the two remedies since the entitlement to a right under, AT other, under Article 86 AI Act only applies for persons that are subject to such a decision. With regard to data protection law, the Court of Justice for the European Union ruled in its so-called Schufa judgment that preparatory acts can be interpreted as automated individual decisions to which affected persons are subject, where the preparatory act plays a determining role in the decision taken towards the affected person. With regard to the overlapping issue of automated decisions and the similar wording used within the GDPR and the AI Act, it should be presumed that Article 86 AI Act will be interpreted similarly with regard um, uh, to the Schufa judgment by the Court of Justice. 
So now, lastly, I want to talk about AI liability. Well, the AI Act does not address liability in relation to the use of AI systems. In relation to data and content used um, in relation to an AI system, for example, liability provisions may apply from copyright law. The AI Act, however, constitutes specific obligations in relation to the use of AI system, for example, transparency obligations by deployers of AI systems, generating or manipulating texts which are published with the purpose of informing the public on matters of public interest. In cases where such artificially generated or manipulated texts causes damage because its artificial provenance is insufficiently disclosed, uh, victims may seek damages from the deployer, referencing their transparency obligation under the AI Act and accusing the deployer of negligent behavior. The same may apply, for example, where a high-risk AI system is not used in accordance with, is, with its instructions for use or um, used in spite of identified risks. The obvious problem, however, within tort law is the burden of proof, which generally lies with the claimant. On the other hand, documentation on automatically generated logs as provided for in the AI Act on the use of AI systems may provide further insights and help with the proof, assuming that the operator of the AI system is obliged by the respective court to bring forth such evidence. Non-compliance with the obligations and requirements of the AI Act may also alleviate the burden of proof for the claimant seeking damages in relation to the use of an AI system. In 2022, the Commission proposed a directive on adapting non-contractual civil liability rules to artificial intelligence. The Commission sees um, the proposed directive and the AI Act as complementing each other. While the AI Act is aimed at reducing AI-associated risks and make AI products safe, these risks may, uh, may not be entirely eliminated. Where those risks materialize, the AI li liability directive applies with regard to suffered damages because of these risks. In this regard, the purpose of the proposed directive is to harmonize certain national non-contractual non fault-based liability rules with the aim that persons seeking compensation for damages suffered from the use of AI systems are protected equally to persons seeking compensation for damages suffered without the use of AI systems. For this objective, the directive lays down common rules on the disclosure of evidence on high-risk artificial intelligence systems to enable a claimant to substantiate a non-contractual um, fault-based civil law claim for damage, damages and also common rules on the burden of proof in the case of non-contractual fault-based civil law claims brought before national courts for, courts for damages caused by an AI system. With regard to the liability for defective products proposed, um, amend, uh, the Commission proposed amendments to the Product Liability Directive, um, which shall therefore also include AI systems as software within its scope. This directive covers uh, no fault liability for defective products, meaning that liability does not depend on the fault of the manufacturer of the product or other economic operator liable, liable for the defectiveness. With this, I will end my lecture on the um, AI Act. And I know this was a lot of input. I tried to keep it short, but as you can see, keeping it short is not actually, actually short. And I hope uh, you got some insights, maybe an overview. If you have further questions, you can come to me. You can also um, contact me via, via email. You can see there. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you for this talk. Um, it was pretty interesting how much, how many definitions this uh, EU Act contains and so on. Um, any questions from the audience? I'm sorry. <laughs> so, this is kind of something that's been going through my mind for some time, which is just about how um, the very different perspectives of the sort of engineer and the legal professional in, or the legal researcher indeed in this sort of area and how difficult it sometimes is to know how to translate from one field to the other. And if you don't mind me using kind of current events as a source material, um, 
I imagine what it must be like to have been working at the University of Washington a few years ago um, on a project for a little known company called OceanGate, um, who were looking for an acoustic monitoring system to trial on hulls. And to suddenly realize that your, you know, sweet little machine learning system that is designed to give some kind of, oh, I don't know, theoretical numbers with regards to, you know, um, how safe a system is, um, is actually being sold as a real thing that is definitely keeping people safe. And to suddenly realize that you might have a level of liability implied, <laughs> if you like, in involvement in that. Um, and the reason why I mention this is because I was thinking about the, that, that particular scenario, that Titan scenario, as you were going through these definitions and thinking what's quite interesting to me is it's not quite clear to me how that would fit in risk terms, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. What I mean? And uh, whether or not the AI Act even has any relevance to that example. Okay, um, so... Uh, could, I mean, obviously not because it's American, but imagine. <laughs> sorry, I, 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 for the example, could you repeat that? I did not so, get... Sorry, get the uh, just... example is from current affairs. There is currently a US Coast Guard um, investigation into the Titan, which was that little submersible that went down and imploded last year. Okay. And the Titan had a um, carbon fiber hull. And uh, okay. the interesting thing about carbon fiber, uh, sorry, carbon fiber hulls is nobody does them because they're a terrible idea uh, when you put people in them anyway, okay. <laughs> um, parenthetically. Um, and uh, the way they justified doing this was they said, we have, in effect, a machine learning system in there that is listening to the hull that will tell you if it ever starts becoming dangerous, at which point we'll stop using it. Yeah. You see what I mean? And uh, the interesting thing is that because it's a very small number of people, in the vessel, arguably you can argue numbers of individuals, but obviously uh, it was you know a vital interest to get this right. Yeah. yeah. So so first of all, you have to um, you have to think about exceptions in regard to national security and and, and military purposes. These oh, are this was tourism. This was tourism. Believe it or not. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yeah. So with regard to tourism, you then have to think about, well, um, I do think that in the in the uh, uh, with regard to to um, these kind of products, they fall under um, certain union harmonization le legislation, which then because they are very uh, they carry a very risk, a very high risk to the involved natural persons. Um, they have to go and uh, undergo and 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 conform the assessment under this um, um, union harmonization legislation. Meaning that where an AI system is used as a safety component of such a product, the AI system is considered high risk. Now you you've seen all these obligations that come along with high risk AI systems. Now they are uh, intended to make the AI system. Um, uh, safe. So, for example, the uh, a requirement for a quality management system also, um, also with a view to the risk management sy system. So, with regard to such an AI system, where you said, well, it is absolutely known that uh, these ki uh, kind of products, they're not safe. Yes. Um, this risk would have, should have been addressed beforehand. If that. If that really, with regard to the impl um, application and, and the, the uh, implementation of these rules, if this will be um, carried out um, um, accordingly, we have to see. But um, I do think, uh, especially with regard to other products um, that carry a high risk that have been previously regulated, there are already um, certain procedures um, covering uh, safety safety obligations, right? Um, in this in this scenario, the issue was that there was a high risk, uh, or that there was an AI system used, and um, they trusted this AI system, yeah. which I think it may not even have been in reality an AI system. To be quite honest with you, I think it might have been a fairly simple system okay. masquerading as an AI system. Okay. But this is beside the point. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just this. Um, it's fascinating to me that there's a lot of definitions in the AI Act, if you like, um, which I think can make it difficult at times to sort of see forests and trees, where I think a much more pragmatic approach in some ways would be to say, 
that blatantly it's high risk someone could die. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean that's certainly the case, and I do think that is. Um, I mean, we we have with regard to the uh, uh, classification of high risk AI systems, um, we have these um, risks to the health, health, safety, and fundamental rights, including obviously uh, uh, the 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 aspect of living, um, yes, and. Um, and in this regard, I think the problem is that with with the law, you need legal certainty. So you want you want to be able to ascertain well this AI system falls under these obligations, and this AI system doesn't, right? And if I now say well, um, I keep that on a very low threshold without any definitions, without any classifications and such like this, the risk is that you will have a very high legal uncertainty. And that has implications on the market. I mean, if you don't know, um, am I am I acting according to the uh, legal obligation? And you've seen the penalties, right? Um, right, with regard to prohibited pre AI practices, uh, 35 million or 7% of annual worldwide turnover. Um, this this would be um, sort of like um, 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 an effect keep, or this I I would assume would keep. Um, uh, economic operators from even developing or using AI systems, and that is not something we want. So when we make, so when law is established, um, you want legal certainty as much as possible for uh, for the um, regulated persons um, and institutions to um, uh, uh, to be clear in their obligations. Nevertheless, I do think. Um, I've covered a lot of obligations here, but mainly these obligations um, should be addressed at an institutional level. So not, not at a personal level, also personal, act, um, personal activity, as you've seen in the exceptions, um, purely personal uh, activity is accepted, right? So if you use it for purely personal activity, but professional activity should be um, addressed and must be addressed at an institutional level and at a, a company level, as I said before, um, in cooperation with the um, uh, data protection officer, the information security officer, you have to come together and bring in um, procedures, you have to write up policies, because if you don't do that, you run the risk of um, contradicting these rules, and then you run the risk of, well, getting uh, penalties that are very, very, um, well, that are very, very high and, and uh, yeah. So I guess the one thing that comes to mind is I think we might be a few roles short of completely covering the space that is required to do a good job of this in institutions. So I, I appreciate, you know, um, for example, data protection officers. Um, mm. But I have already realized that uh, your sort of privacy champion role uh, is very commonly unavailable, if that makes sense. So even in terms of like privacy, um, best practice maintenance alone, we probably find that very difficult because we have someone saying maybe no, but we don't have someone saying, let's maybe do it like this, or, you know, these things are needed, let's do this positive thing, transparency, et cetera, et cetera. And I wonder whether AI regulation is another one of those areas where there's a champion, if you like, institutionally or possibly, you know, cross-institutionally, like, you know, similarly to the ICO in the UK, if you like, um, where, you know, there, there needs to be a, a convenient place to go. So one thing, I, I've not addressed this here, but um, what the AI provides for is um, a lot of guidance. So the AI provides, for example, for um, implementing acts by the um, by the uh, by the commission through the AI office um, by guidelines, um, uh, codes of practice, you know, this kind that will help um, also templates uh, with a certain um, for certain aspects, which must be um, provided for by the commission, um, which then works together with stakeholders. And um, in this regard, the AI Act, I think, should, that is um, the objective, should be more conveniently implemented. I also think, so I've talked about, for example, these administrative fines, and you talked about, well, there's already a problem with privacy obligations, and uh, certainly 
quite uh, a lot of um, um, sometimes privacy obligations are not met. Well, um, these fines are obviously the maximum. So with regard to research institutions providing common good, right, um, and and usually hopefully providing common good, <laughs> and like um, and um, and usually. Um, not affecting too many persons. I mean, research is, uh, you might take um, personal data or, or data from participants, but you, don't, but you do not use it in, directly in relation to them, right? So with regard to defiance, I think, first of all, defiance would not be as high. We've seen that also in data protection, that most fines range in the thousands and not in the, uh, in the millions, right? In, in, uh, in, in what it could be. But... Um, but but uh, still, um, as it is, and also with regard to AI, I think the difference between data protection and AI is um, personal data is involved everywhere. You cannot you cannot uh, you cannot go around it. You will always have employees, right? So you have personal data of your of your employees obligations there. You, um, when you do research, I think AI is more. Maybe I'm mistaken there, but that is a technical part. Could be more targeted, so you could you could be much more conscious about the use of an AI system. You can also be conscious about uh, the use of personal data, but you cannot you cannot evade it. If that makes sense. Um, we do not evade. We do not want to evade the use of AI systems, but you know when you do, and um, in this regard, it, 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 you can probably address it more consciously, maybe. But this is just my. Uh, n n um, uh, uh, mindset at this moment. I guess it's a sorry. I will. I will move. But it's it's really interesting to me because on the one hand, as a research institution, um, I think what, uh, that there is probably a fairly widespread understanding that there are ethical concerns. For example, when one applies, you know, AI methods to participants' personal data, but very often there is not a widespread understanding that, for example, buying products with the words, you know, with the letters AI in and putting um, employees' personal data into there also has um, implications. So very often um, I am less interested in how an organisation would take its ethical concerns to its participants and more interested in how it as an enterprise treats its own employees. Yeah. Which is a completely separate problem and more one of employment law, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't want to waste too much of everyone's time on this, but it's, um, I think they, it's, it's unavoidable because AI is the cool term right now. So everybody buys things with AI written in it. Um, but obviously, understanding the implications of that in terms of the data subjects involved. Yeah. No, but um, as I said, I, I have not talked about the governments um, that is governance that is introduced by the um, by the AI Act. Um, but there is obviously for the member states, as I said, they must designate the designate market surveillance uh, authorities, which have to or which should um, look into where there's, especially if there's um, um, very uh, harmful infringements, right? Uh, also with regard to employ employers. But yeah, obviously that's super super helpful. Anyone else got any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, you mentioned that, for example, the high-risk AI systems, they need to meet some um, certain accuracy criteria, as far as I understood. Certain, uh, excuse me. I, I... <clears throat> accuracy criteria. Oh, yeah. So is this accuracy defined somewhere in the EU uh, Act, or it is individually I think, defined for a specific use case? I think this is something where guidelines um, by the Commission and, and these implementing acts, right, um, will help with regard to um, um, how, wh what does accuracy specifically means with regard to development of an a a AI system. So mm -hmm. in this regard, I think um, um, the, the regulation provides the abstract um, uh, normative um, normative um, rule you will have uh, or you should have then um, um, further further um, further uh, specifications that help you with uh, assessing the accuracy okay. 
situation where we yeah, yeah. did things. You know, how inaccurate would you like to be with regards to Ruth Wayne's old words versus how inaccurate would you like to be with regards to a favorite flavor of ice cream for us? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although if we talk about high risk, oh, then, true, true, then... True. very few people have died in the last year. Oh, okay, well done. Um, I was just thinking, well, actually, no, because there's all those allergies and such a lot of Okay, fair enough. Uh, sorry, very common story in these days. People die and then die from those allergies. Um, right, I guess we should probably, Christine did at one point want to give a few closing remarks, I think. Shall we just sort of like do it? Or... Yeah, I'm so sorry, sorry that I... I just uh... want to say thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, for your talk and accepting our invitation. Yeah, I know it was a little bit on the on the paper, but it is so much information. It's just uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's all right. Um, can you can you maybe um, just tell us so if we have some kind of um, legal um, issues? So what's the what was the name of the NFI? Um, NFDI, which is uh, NFDI across CS. So NFDI um, X C S. Okay, okay. Because that I think is a nice, uh, would be a nice uh, way to ask yeah. experts to have access to experts. Yeah, and I think um, that is something that the infrastructure also has to provide, like general, not not um, specific um, uh, legal help for a specific case, but general um, knowledge about um, what certain provisions in uh, for for AI and also data protection and copyright law, what these mean, so that you can that you are enabled as as researcher and also as institution to comply, mm -hmm. right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Very well. Yeah. Thank you also from my side. I will be watching <laughs> the video afterwards because Alex didn't agree with me. Um, okay. So we are coming to our end today. Uh, I think we haven't planned anything really big for the closing words. I mean, we had some ideas, but we don't have the time for that this time about the roadmap. So this will be something for next time, maybe. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much for the very interesting workshop this time. I'm really happy with how it went. I hope that um, you're also happy. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so we have been thinking a bit about where we go from here, if we should stay in the form of a workshop with contributions or if it should maybe um, go in the direction of a working group where we meet once a year and discuss things that are relevant for us. I don't know if anyone has an opinion on this topic right now or what is the feeling um i don't know does anyone want to say something or is it also something for post-workshop discussion no one wants to discuss this okay so uh, maybe if you uh, have any opinion on the topic you can write us an email and uh, yeah we see where we go from here but uh I personally am very, very happy with the way the workshop was organized and went this year at Informatic. And yeah, I think it was a really good decision. So thank you very much to all of you for participating and maybe see you next year again. Thank you.